Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I call Mr. the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as shown on the dynamic red. And I believe we have private senator's bills. I call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day number 30, Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023, resumption of second reading debate. And I'm calling Senator Cox. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Um, yes, sorry. Um, Senator McDonald. Thank you. And I have to begin my comments uh, regarding the Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023 by reflecting on the huge body of work that's been done uh, by my colleague, uh, Senator Nampajinka Price. The work that she has done in consulting broadly and deeply within the Northern Territory community is a perfect example of what it is to be a member of this place to take the responsibilities and actions of being in government. Uh, and as outlined uh, by Senator Price, uh, she has taken a huge amount of time to consult uh, with a range of different people, uh, with her colleagues, and, uh, and of course has been forced to take action on this matter uh, by the lack of action by the Albanese government. Because when a government's action or inaction results in harm, then it is a moral imperative to stop that harm. Uh, there is no moral high ground by demonising and then rejecting alcohol restrictions in the Northern Territory, uh, and it was the height of misplaced paternalism, paternalistic inaction. Furthermore, defending this harmful st stance in the face of extraordinary and alarming evidence was beyond the pale and had to be rectified. Now, it was, it was uh, in July of last year that we had a sunset on the previous legislation. Um, and so what, uh, after three months of being in government with all the incoming ministerial briefs and uh, others that would have been provided to the incoming government, uh, when that legislation lapsed, somehow this lack of, in, lack of action became the problem for the coalition. And yet it was clearly, clearly understood by the community that action needed to be taken. Uh, this bill would allow for greater federal oversight of bans in the Northern Territory. It would have been similar to the powers granted to the Commonwealth by those expired intervention laws. The Northern Territory Government, with federal funding, has recently again prohibited takeaway alcohol in town camps, but more importantly, across the entire community, because this, is not, uh, this, this legislation is designed uh, to go across all vulnerable communities. Anyone who is uh, subject to um, uh, harm from additional alcohol in the community. So new restrictions on the sale of alcohol came into effect at the end of January. 
following a flying visit from the FIFO Prime Minister to the town. Takeaway alcohol-free days were introduced on Monday and Tuesday. Bottle shops were restricted to 3 p.m. Um, and to 7 p.m. on other days, and a limit of one transaction per person per day was implemented. Now, this was this took months. This took months to be enacted by finally the territory government after complete inaction by the federal government, because there had been a massive spike in home invasions, in robberies, in domestic violence and assaults, and which many people have clearly attributed to the end of the alcohol restrictions uh, in July. Now, we know that this was a direct correlation because of the new data that has come out uh, following the introduction of that, uh, those uh, new measures from the Territory government. It is uh, reported uh, in the Daily Telegraph that youth disturbances declined by 36.36 per cent in February compared to January. Uh, there, the 235 unlawful entries across Alice Springs between January 2 and January 30, which dropped 45.96 per cent to 127 incidents in the following month. Alcohol as a factor in domestic violence was down 27.7 per cent over the month. Uh, and in the first week of January, when crime was at a crisis level, alcohol was deemed a factor in 76 per cent of the 167 domestic violence incidents. By the week of the uh, 20th of February, alcohol had decreased to being a factor in 47 per cent of the 92 domestic violence incidents. This is a clear correlation between the lifting of alcohol restrictions uh, and then the reintroduction of those restrictions uh, in January after crime spiralled out of control. What is not reported in that data is the number of uh, affected other family members, older children being forced to care for younger siblings. Siblings, uh, young people being forced out on the streets uh, because of alcohol abuse at home. Uh, care is often at the expense of the young people's own studies or jobs, and a cycle continues. This is repeated right across northern Australia, and it destroys lives and futures. And Northern Territory lives are all of our responsibility, as is the need for kids particularly going to school, being able to sleep soundly at night with full tummies and no fear of violence and abuse. We know that Alice Springs businesses had been impacted. People were afraid to go out at night. Children roaming the streets and the police couldn't keep up. And we see similar effects in Catherine, in Tennant Creek, uh, where, uh, in Western Australia, where people have been displaced from remote communities because of flooding have ended up in town. And unless there are alcohol restrictions in those places, alcohol-related related crime soars there too. Uh, we see the same issues in Mount Isa. Alcohol abuse is the enemy of advancement for vulnerable people, and restricting access is a circuit breaker to multi-generational dysfunction where violence, abuse and hopelessness are all that those people have to see each day. We have had uh, significant uh, research and studies of alcohol management plans, like the study of the Cape York uh, Alcohol Management Plan conducted in 2018. And that saw a greater reduction in violence against women in the community that entered prohibition compared with the communities that did not. A decrease in assault injury presentations, especially those linked with alcohol. A decrease in female victims of a police charge of violence against the person and a perceived reduction in violence against women reported by community members. Now, there is a moral imperative at play that overrides political philosophy, something that Labor shamefully ignored when allowing these laws to lapse and then 
and then taking no action, instead it being left to those local communities uh, to demand to demand change. And again, Senator, Nam Senator Nampajinka Price and her colleagues, her Labor colleagues in the Northern Territory, were only too aware of the devastating impacts that the restriction, the lifting of restrictions on alcohol was having in those communities. The Prime Minister promised to be a Prime Minister of action, uh, and he has been on lots of planes overseas. He spent four hours in Alice Springs and couldn't get out fast enough. He, he uh, was carefully uh, shown the clean and tidy streets, but he didn't. He didn't listen to those community members who were desperate, desperate for protection. Why is it that this must be the most important thing that a government can do? is protect its people, protect the most vulnerable in our communities. I don't know that there is any other task we have that is more important, whether it's economically, uh, whether it's border protection, but in this very clear case, the restriction of alcohol to protect harm to vulnerable people uh, could not have been more urgent, and yet we watched as the harm in those communities continued, whether it be uh, crime against individuals and assaults, domestic violence, uh, whether it be a attacks on businesses. Uh, but the ones that really uh, keep me awake at night are those children and vulnerable women who were left unprotected. I think that it, is, it was extraordinary to see uh, that we are left waiting for a private senator's bill like this one to be able to provide the tools to extend a policy that was in place, that was working well. And of course now we have documented evidence of the impact of the lifting of alcohol restrictions and the impact that it's had on people's lives, on people's property uh, and on their future. I, I reflect on the many, uh, the many people who were left without protection and I encourage this federal government to once again turn its mind to supporting this legislation, because these are issues that are seen not just in the Northern Territory. This is a Northern Australia issue. Alcohol abuse is something that we struggle with in so many communities. Uh, I've touched on Catherine, I've t uh, but outside of the Northern Territory, uh, in, in Mount Isa, in my own communities, where we see people coming across the border coming to places that don't have alcohol restrictions and the subsequent impact that that's having on those communities, but worse, on those, on those uh, people who are vulnerable to alcohol. It is a terrible scourge. and We have rules around uh, other prohibited drugs. Uh, we have rules around, um, around putting uh, safety notices on uh, food, depending on its health uh, level. We try to alert people to, uh, to uh, impacts on them from imbibing something which is going to be bad, but for alcohol we don't have that sort of restrictions and alerts. I think that this is a, a terrible oversight um, from, from all levels of government, but to have seen it in Alice Springs, to have seen the impact of the lifting of restrictions immediately, to have seen the damage and the terror. Uh, from people living in those communities, I think that this was a, a shocking, wasted uh, months of inaction from this government. We saw in December that they were happy to walk into, this, uh, into the parliament and introduce legislation for what they saw as an urgent need to intervene in the gas and the coal markets. They did that with very little notice, and we saw the legislation uh, uh, only hours before we came into this place to debate it, but they were, have not been willing to take the same sort of urgent intervention when there are children as young as five who were walking around on the streets unprotected because they were not safe at home, when we saw a spike in assaults and crimes, when we saw young people who should have been preparing for school the next day unable to be safe in their own homes, when we saw elderly people being assaulted. This is 
and was a national emergency, and yet this government did nothing. And it wasn't because they didn't know. They were alerted to this by Senator Nampajenka Price. They would have heard the same things from the members of parliament from the Northern Territory as well as the other senator from the Northern Territory. Uh, this is a shocking, a shocking indictment on what the Albanese government talks about as a necessary requirement for a voice, and yet they do not listen to voices in regional Australia and on the ground. I commend this, uh, this legislation. I think that it was incredibly brave and well-researched and thought through, uh, and I think that uh, the, the efforts of individual senators and members to recognise urgent uh, and important issues in their community is something that we must never lose sight of. Uh, the, the more that we are a long way away in Canberra, and not remembering the impact of legislation or the, or the sunsetting of legislation in places like the Northern Territory, uh, then, then we have failed. We have failed the people who rely on us to protect and preserve their way of life. And uh, I think that it has been a, a shocking missed opportunity from this government to have done absolutely nothing. Uh, so I'm very proud of uh, this private senator's bill from Senator Nampajinka Price, I support it in every way, uh, and I hope that the government will consider supporting it uh, to provide them with some tools to continue uh, the protection and oversight of communities for the most vulnerable people who have been affected by alcohol violence, by alcohol abuse, uh, and I commend this legislation to this place. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, what is unfolding in Alice, Alice Springs is devastating. I would like to acknowledge Senator Nabajipa Price for her ongoing work and advocacy on raising issues in Alice Springs and elsewhere in the Northern Territory. I am new to this place and what I have seen in the news and read about this issue uh, over time is, is largely from when I was not a politician. It, it seems to me we have a long history of the federal government intervening in times of, of crisis. This has been happening for decades now, where the federal government politicians in, in, in this place are imposing things on communities across the country. And as Senator Macdonald pointed out, alcohol abuse is a huge issue. Uh, this is something that we should be facing up to as a country, and as she rightly pointed out, it's, it's not just in Alice Springs, it's elsewhere in the country that this is a, a drug causing a, a lot of harm, but we have to remember that alcohol abuse is a complex, multifaceted issue. As experts have pointed out, substance abuse, wherever we see it, is people's way of coping. For those people, this is a solution to their problems. Uh, this is their way of, of coping with things that feel uh, out of control. And it takes an understanding of the underlying problems uh, and finding ways to empower people to deal with them over the long term to, to, to actually deal with this issue. This issue. Yes, Band-aids are necessary at times, but we must be looking at the underlying issues. In a report by the Central Australia Regional Controller, uh, Darrell Anderson, she pointed out in her report to the NT and the Australian government that all of these issues are, and to quote, closely related to the disproportionate disadvantage that Aboriginal people face at every level in our society and are visible on essentially every social index. Clearly, what we've been doing uh, for a long time now is, is not working. Uh, communities affected know about the issues that they are facing. They are living them. And with uh, support and the right resources, they will develop solutions better than anyone in this building. Uh, we need communities to be 
deeply consulted if we are actually going to come up with long-term solutions and move beyond this constant cycle of, of interventions. Uh, this, this is why I believe it's so important that Australia moves forward and implements a voice to parliament. Uh, it is for this reason that I accept the generous offer um, in the Uluru Statement, Uluru Statement from the Heart to rethink and, and change the way that decisions are made that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. A process where community voices are heard, where Australia's First Peoples are advising on what is best for their communities. First Nations people advising what they need to improve health and well-being. And then we can listen and respond. We've seen so many of these interventions by the federal government responding in crisis, but these crises don't happen overnight. There, there's often a slow build-up, and we need a structure like The Voice to allow these issues to be raised before they become a crisis, where, where we're, we have private senate bills wanting to impose intervention-like legislation on communities. As well as recognition of uh, First Nations people and the longest continuing cultures in the world, something that we ce rightly celebrate and should recognise in our constitution, the voice could facilitate this level of consultation. And to uh, politicians who are uh, criticising the voice and uh, the level of detail, I say that you know, Parliament will design what that looks like, and it looks like, and I hope improve it over time. If it's not working, there is there is a way to improve it. I really don't think it, it's a radical proposition to recognise a land's first peoples in the constitution that now governs that land and to set up a formal process that allows consultation and voices from across the country to be heard. Uh, I applaud uh, Senator Thorpe and Senator Dodson and many others for pushing the implementation of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Only a fraction of the 339 recommendations uh, released in 1991 have been implemented. This is a, a national disgrace and there is no excuse for it. Uh, within these recommendations, 188 to 204 speak to the path to self-determination and call for deeper consultation and to consider constituting a body. Uh, to quote from 188, that the governments negotiate with appropriate Aboriginal organisations and communities to determine guidelines as to the procedures and processes which, would, which should be followed to ensure that the self-determination principles is applied in the design and impl implementation of any policy or program or the substantial modification of any policy or program which will particularly affect Aboriginal people. The final recommendation is for the process of reconciliation, and, and that reads that all political leaders and their parties recognise that reconciliation between the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities in Australia must be achieved if community division, discord and injustice to Aboriginal people are to be avoided. To this end, the Commission recommends that political leaders use their best endeavours to ensure bipartisan public support for the process of reconciliation and that the urgency and necessity of the process be acknowledged. Despite this from a report that was commissioned before I was born, we're still seeing deaths in custody and we're still seeing calls for interventions. Uh, in 2023, we have many Australians concerned and dismayed that an offer to the Australian people 
not an offer to politicians, is being obstructed by politicians. We have an opportunity to ensure that Aboriginal and, and Torres Strait Islander people have a voice. People who live in remote communities across the country, people who we talk about a lot but know little about, we have an opportunity to ensure that these communities have input and can be consulted on legislation that affects them. I have real concerns with this bill uh, when it comes to territory rights, uh, federal government overriding local laws rather than working with territory governments to solve these complex issues is something that I don't agree with. And as someone from the ACT, I um, really believe that people need to be putting pressure on their local uh, parliament to, uh, to deal with these issues. And, and I res respectfully disagree that the way to avoid having an ad hoc approach is through legislation like this that overrides the territories. Uh, it's my understanding that the NT is, is dealing with this in a similar way through their Legislative Assembly. And there has been much commentary about whether this has happened uh, fast enough. Um, it clearly seems to be something that, that should have been dealt with early, but my understanding is that the Legislative Assembly is now dealing with it. Uh, for me, this clearly points to the need for structural change in the way that we make decisions. Uh, we need to embrace a new way of making decisions that affect First Nations people and deal with the root causes of problems in communities. We've seen decades and decades of band-aids. We need to start dealing with, with, with root causes. That takes more time. It's not as uh, politically sexy where you can sell a program that's going to solve something in, in a few years. This is long hard work that we all need to be committed to. And to return to the voice to finish, I'd, I'd like to finish by quoting two powerful women who've been pushing for this change uh, for many years now. Uh, Professor Megan Davis has put it. You need to suspend your disbelief that the nation can't change. You need to suspend your disbelief that Australia won't, un won't understand what we're trying to say. And we need you to imagine that the world can be a better place. Uh, Arnie Pat Anderson, AO, adds, Imagine an Australia without these ugly fights about Aboriginal affairs. Why are we the football in politics? Far too often with no result. This is why we need the voice, to take the politics out of good policy design. Uh, again, whilst I acknowledge Senator Namjibu Price's passion for this issue and her continued uh, advocacy, uh, I will not be supporting this bill. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, we should support this bill because it's clear that uh, the removal of alcohol restrictions was a com massive, massive error and mistake over the past. Uh, couple of years and, uh, and they should be reintroduced uh, in full uh, as per uh, Senator Price's proposal here. Uh, we see today very clear evidence uh, uh, that uh, alcohol restrictions uh, do work and, and, and had been a factor in leading to the complete breakdown of social order uh, in Alice Springs over the past few months. It's been shocking to watch on our nation's TV to see other fellow Australians have to cower in their own homes and businesses, uh, not be able to just go about their day on the streets because of our shocking, uh, shocking loss of control of law and order uh, in a major uh, Australian town, the centre of Australia. Uh, the, uh, the alcohol restrictions have been uh, reintroduced over the past month, or at least some of them, and today uh, in the Daily Telegraph reports that uh, data from Northern Territory Police shows a substantial reduction uh, in crime in just one month immediately after uh, the removal of the alcohol restrictions. Uh, so going through that, the uh, massive reductions in crime. Uh, there is a 50 per cent reduction in unlawful entries, or I should say a 46 per cent, so a halving of unlawful entries uh, following the 
uh, reintroduction of alcohol restrictions, a 36 per cent reduction in youth disturbances in Alice Springs, apparently over the month of February uh, because of the reintroduction of alcohol restrictions, and, and a um, not as big a reduction but perhaps a more personally touching reduction, a 28 per cent reduction in uh, alcohol contributing to domestic violence uh, in Alice Springs as well. And, uh, we should not forget that when law and order does break down, uh, it is not just those uh, businesses, those uh, people directly affected by crime. It's often in the homes and as well, uh, and the mums and wives and children of, of unruly uh, uh, criminals uh, who are subject to increasing uh, amounts of violence if we do not maintain law and order. Uh, and that, that, we've just got to focus on things that work. Well, that's what we should do. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the voice and a uh, statement from the heart. Uh, it is heartless not to just simply focus on things that work. You may not like them. Uh, they may be uh, a little bit heavy-handed or seem heavy-handed at times, but we have to focus on pragmatic ways of making people's lives better. And clearly, alcohol restrictions in the Northern Territory, in communities, in Alice Springs, uh, what is needed to make li people's lives better in the Northern Territory. Now, it did not have to be this way. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a failure of, uh, uh, of uh, this parliament, of uh, uh, certainly the Northern Territory government, uh, of us all, if you like, because we were, uh, we were uh, deaf uh, to the Aboriginal voices that warned us of the removal of alcohol restrictions that warned us of the removal of the cashless debit card over the past couple of years. And, and, and I'm not making a partisan point here that the, the former coalition government uh, uh, accepted the request of the Northern Territory government at the time to end the Stronger Futures uh, legislation. Of course, the incoming Labor government removed cashless, the cashless debit card in mid last year as well. And, and those, those changes were made despite the Aboriginal voices from Alice Springs warning that that shouldn't happen, that that shouldn't happen. Uh, uh, so we like to talk a lot in theory about establishing an Aboriginal voice in this town, but we do very little in practice to listen to the existing Aboriginal voices that are here elected in this parliament. Elected in this parliament. They're here. They're elected representatives. There are two members of parliament across our chamber and the other chamber uh, from Alice Springs. Uh, Alice Springs is a town of 30,000 people, uh, a, a, uh, an emblematic town of our nation, something that is really the heart of our country. Uh, it's a town of 30,000 people. It has two representatives here in the federal parliament. It's probably, it probably the, it's up there with the most represented town in this parliament of any in the country. Uh, it has uh, a representative for each 15,000 uh, individuals uh, uh, in Alice Springs, whereas most or federal electorates are roughly 100,000 people, and they might have the odd senator here and there. But Alice Springs has a, has a federal member of parliament for every 15,000 people. Now, both of those members of parliament, uh, one of them being Senator Price here, who is uh, the mover of this bill, and I congratulate her for the work she's done to put this together, as, uh, as a very new senator too. She's done an excellent uh, work. Um, the, the, other, the other member of parliament, uh, Ms. Melandiri McCarthy, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, um, Ms. Marion Scridgemore, keep getting my Northern Territory parliamentarians confused, Ms. Marion Scridgemore, uh, both from Alice Springs, uh, one from the, the coalition side here, from uh, the country Liberal Party, the other from the Labor Party. Both of those members of parliament were warning about the removal of alcohol restrictions mid last year. Both of them were saying this will be a, a tragedy, uh, we should not do it, uh, we need to pause here, this is going to lead to, uh, lead to, to increased crime, domestic violence and, and, and terrible outcomes for people. Their voices were ignored, completely ignored. Uh, they were the Aboriginal voices of Alice Springs and we didn't listen to them. We didn't listen to them. Uh, and then, in, so instead of rectifying that gross error uh, that's led to terrible consequences, instead of rectifying that and now supporting this bill, supporting the Aboriginal voice in this parliament from Alice Springs, uh, those on the other side are going to oppose this bill and, and then have the temerity say, oh, no, 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 we want a voice to parliament. We don't need to actually listen. We just want more voices so we can ignore even more people uh, from around the country 
I mean, if we're serious about a voice, we have to be serious about listening. <laughs> we have to be serious about actually using uh, our two ears in proportion to our one mouth and listening to those voices that are already here. They're already here. They're from Alice Springs. We've got a mini little voice from Alice Springs in this parliament. And, and they want alcohol restrictions reintroduced. So why aren't we supporting this bill? Why aren't we supporting this bill? What is the voice about? What is it about? Is it, is it, is it just so people can speak and talk? Are we actually going to act on anything that is said? Because we're not right now. We're not right now. We're showing complete and utter. Well, we are, we are now. I must say, as I said, I'm not being partisan. We've made a mistake about removing the Stronger Futures legislation. Well, the best thing to do in life when you make a mistake and you realise it is to turn your decisions around. And that's what we've done here by listening to Senator Price, who has joined us as part of our team uh, less than a year ago. And she has convinced us that we need to have this back in. We're listening to that, to her voice. We're listening to her community and reintroducing, or seeking to, trying to reintroduce the things that worked. Now, I, I do hear from people that uh, uh, that uh, we we don't need to do this because uh, the Northern Territory government has acted in the past month uh, and reintroduced uh, some alcohol restrictions. And I mentioned those earlier, and they've already having a. Uh, an enormously positive uh, uh, um, effect. Uh, and some would say, well, it's already done, so we don't need to do anything. Well, I, I do disagree with that because the, the Northern Territory government obviously hasn't got things right over the past few years. Uh, there is a risk that I'm very concerned that once the media heat and attention is turned away from this issue, as it will be, particularly if crime uh, does reduce, uh, I have no faith in the Chief Minister Files, no faith at all uh, that she will maintain the things that work. Uh, she was clearly a reluctant, uh, uh, a reluctant um, con con convert uh, to the need for alcohol restrictions. It, uh, her press conference with the Prime Minister uh, a few months ago looked like a hostage video. She clearly didn't want to be there in some dingy little room. They couldn't go out on the streets, of course, uh, to do this press conference. And, uh, at the time, uh, and, and, uh, and she, she, she did not uh, give me any confidence that she has this under control or that she's the kind of strong willed individual that will restore law, to, law and order for so many law abiding citizens uh, in the Alice Springs. As I said, we should focus on what works in this place. And clearly, the Stronger Futures legislation that was in place before it was removed at the request of the Northern Territory Government did work. It worked. To do at least to keep at least some level uh, of of law and order uh, within Northern Territory communities. Now it's not the whole solution. There's a whole lot of other issues that need to be tackled, of course, to deal with Indigenous disadvantage. But clearly, the removal of the Stronger Futures legislation was a massive error. And as I said before, when you make a mistake, you should rectify it. You should realise that you've done it. Not try and just you should eat some humble pie, uh, put aside your pride. Uh, and accept that you've done the wrong thing and, and reintroduce it. And that is what this legislation sensibly does here, sensibly puts in place back a framework that did work and gives confidence to Northern Territory residents that they will have a safe place uh, to reside in and a future. Because right now it's not so much a, uh, whether there is a stronger future or a weaker future for Alice Springs and many other towns. It's, it's a question of whether they have a future at all uh, because of the, the massive hit uh, that their town has suffered because of this publicity. My fear right now is that with these declining crime statistics, the attention of the nation will turn off or turn away uh, from Alice Springs, uh, and they and the people there that own homes and businesses uh, that, have, that have built their lives in this wonderful town uh, will we'll be left to pick up the pieces with very little help from others. Uh, there is a, a, a huge issue now for Alice Springs in its, uh, uh, for its future because its reputation has been tarnished. We, we, can't, we, we have to recognise that. It's not the fault of uh, the people of Alice Springs. As I said that we want to hand our culpability. It's certainly the elected officials that must, uh, must take the lion's share of that. But its economy, the Alice Springs economy, I've had, been, had the wonderful opportunity to visit many times as Minister for Northern Australia, as Minister for Resources, a uh, wonderful place. Uh, its economy is very much contingent, and a big part of it at least, contingent on tourism. Uh, it's a wonderful place uh, when, when the streets are actually under control, beautiful place to visit, lovely climate. Uh, 
uh, lots of things to explore in and around the Alice Springs region for people. Uh, but I, I, I read last month that, uh, uh, of course, almost certainly as a result of this publicity that Qantas has slashed flights uh, to Alice Springs, uh, clearly because fewer Australians are obviously deciding to go for a holiday in Alice Springs after they, what they see on TV. And the reintroduction of alcohol restrictions is not immediately going to turn that, that knob back on. E even with this good news today of declining crime, uh, the, the, the impact on, on people's perception of Alice Springs and whether or not they should uh, take a holiday in the top end uh, will have had damage for some, will be damaged for some time. Uh, it will take time for people to feel like it is safe and, and right to, to get back there. So I, I think an added reason why we need to put this framework back in place is so that we give people in Alice Springs and Central Australia confidence that there is a future, that, that there is now going to be the re-establishment of a legislative framework which doesn't allow us to fall back into the errors we clearly made over the past year. Because, as I said, there's, there's no doubt that the elements of the Northern Territory Labor Party, the left-wing elements that have seized control of their government uh, post the Michael Gunner government, uh, they don't want these things. Right? <laughs> they definitely do not want to put alcohol restrictions in, uh, and they will look at any opportunity to bring them back. And if we do not put this framework in place, what confidence can people have in the Northern Territory that they, they will, in six months and 12 months and 18 months' time, still have the kind of measures in place required to uh, guarantee uh, law and order in their town and their community? So we should get behind this legislation to give confidence to the people of Alice Springs, because I think, it, given the mistakes that have been made here in Canberra, I mean, I think there were more, more blame does need to go to the Labor government in Darwin, but, I'll, I'll, but we have a responsibility here too. Uh, because of that, because of the culpability, there needs to actually be a level of uh, reparations paid from this parliament and the Northern Territory Parliament to the people of Alice Springs. This, this bill does part of that. Would, would be an act of good faith uh, for the people of the Northern Territory to, to rectify some of our mistakes. But we also need to be there time and time again over the years to come to help them to invest in their town and community and to rebuild that shattered confidence uh, that, has, uh, that, that has happened because of the complete breakdown in law and order. It took the Prime Minister far too long to go to Alice Springs. He only went after uh, he was effectively dragged there kicking and screaming by, from the Leader of the Opposition away from the tennis in Melbourne to go to Alice Springs. And he didn't want to be there either. He was, he was uh, Johnny Depp to uh, uh, Natasha Files's um, I've forgotten Johnny Depp's partner's name, but her partner's name it was Amber Heard. Thank you very much, Senator Cadell. Uh, Miss Heard, uh, that was a hostage video. They, they, they didn't want to be there, but I know they don't want to be there. But they got to go back. They, they got to go back. All right? they, they have to keep turning up here in the months ahead to give the people of Alice Springs their due, to give them confidence in their future. I think we should support this legislation to help in that regard. But th this cannot be something we forget. We, we have to remember the people that have been hurt uh, in Central Australia. It's a great place of our country. Uh, they should not be forgotten. Uh, and I give credit to Senator Price for making sure they're not through this bill. Senator Scar. I thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased to rise to speak in favour of this bill, which has been introduced by my colleague and my friend, Senator Nampa Jimpa Price. I want to make some preliminary points. And the first is that I think Senator Nampa Jimpa Price has been subjected to some of the most vile abuse, personal abuse, that I've seen in politics since I've been involved in politics at the age of 17. And I think Senator Nampa Jimpa Price should really be congratulated for the courage she has demonstrated throughout her time in this place. And those who have attacked her on a personal basis, as opposed to raising legitimate issues in, terms of, in the context of a civil debate about policy issues where genuine people acting in good faith can have differences of opinion, Senator Nampa Jimpa Price has been attacked on a very, very personal basis. And that is unacceptable. That is unacceptable in our Australian democracy, 
And as we progress with a number of debates, including in relation to the voice, I say to those who are engaging in personal, vile, vitriolic personal attacks, you are doing your own arguments great harm. You are doing your own arguments great harm. It is the refuge of the scoundrel to resort to ad hominem attacks, and you are simply dem demonstrating the weakness of your arguments when you engage in personal, vile attacks. And I've been profoundly disappointed in relation to some of the comments made by a number of individuals in that regard, which I think are just beyond the pale. So in that context, I pay tribute to Senator Nampajimpa Price. I think she is a gift to this place, an ornament to this place, and, and more power to her, more power to Senator Nampajimpa Price, as she stands up with great courage to voice her views and articulate her concerns, regardless of the disgraceful, vile comments that are directed her way. So I compliment Senator Nampajimpa Price. And on that theme, as I was considering what I wanted to say in relation to this debate, I was, had cause to reflect on one of my great heroes, Senator Neville Bonner, who represented my state of Queensland in this place, the first Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander to serve in the Australian Parliament, and one of my boyhood heroes. One of my boyhood heroes. And in fact, uh, as I've said in this place before, I was one of those who orchestrated a campaign with the Australian Electoral Commission to have a federal seat named after the great Senator Neville Bonner. And we had that seat in Queensland, the seat of Bonner. And uh, that is a true reflection of the greatness of Senator Neville Bonner, who had, I had the honour of meeting a number of times. And I wanted to give a quote from Senator Neville Bonner's speech at the Constitutional Convention in 1998, which I think is, should be seen as an exhortation to all of us in terms of how we conduct these debates and any debates in this respect. And I quote, from the bottom of my heart, I pray you stop this senseless division. Let us work together on the real issues. Let us solve those problems which haunt my people, the problems of land, of health, of unemployment, of the despair and hopelessness which leads even to suicide. Let us unite this country, not divide it ever. Not divide it ever." End quote. And those are the words of the great Senator, the Honourable Neville Bonner, AO. And just reflect, just reflect for a moment on a man who was subjected to the most horrendous discrimination as he was growing up, but who, near the end of his life, when he made those words, he made that comment, was able to be so full of grace, so full of forgiveness, and so passionate about dividing this country and focusing on the real issues of substance as opposed to dividing us. Just reflect on his background. Just reflect on his background. When he was a small boy growing up in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales, he and his sister had an opportunity to go to school for the first time. For the first time. And he was so excited. He was a young boy, so excited about the opportunity to go to school for the first time. And when he and his sister turned up at that school, by lunchtime, by lunchtime of that day, every other parent had pulled their kids out of school. Every other parent had pulled their children out of that school because an Aboriginal child had turned up at that school. Just imagine I, uh, the impact that would have on someone. Here is, a, here is a man who, when he was a boy, his mother was given some oats or bought some oats at the local shop and they were full of weevils but they were given these oats and so she was determined that her son Neville would have porridge. And he went to the farmer who lived near where they lived and asked for some milk. And that farmer said, 
Neville, I've got pigs I need to feed. Why would I give milk to a little Aboriginal boy? That's what he was told. And notwithstanding that, over 50 years later, when he was presented a doctorate, an honorary doctorate at Griffith University, and he recounted that episode more than 50 years later, it still, it still stayed with him, within him. He said, without an ounce of aggression or anger, that in a way he asked himself, well, the farmer was doing it tough. The farmer was doing it tough. So even, even after being subjected to that horrendous incident, which I can't imagine what it would be like, he was still, he was still being empathetic and trying to put himself in the position of other people, standing in other people's shoes. And in that context, I'll repeat those words again. Near the end of his life at the Constitutional Convention, he said, from the bottom of my heart, I pray you, stop this senseless division. Let us work together on the real issues. Let us solve those problems which haunt my people, the problems of land, of health, of unemployment, of the despair and hopelessness which leads even to suicide. Let us unite this country. Let us unite this country, not divide it ever." End quote. I now want to give a quote from a speech which Senator Nampajimpa Price gave in, the, in this place on Wednesday 8 February 2023. And it has resonances of that speech which the great Neville Bonner gave. And I, I could see that connection between the two. And in a way, Senator Nampajimba Price is such a worthy successor, such a worthy successor to Senator Neville Bonner. And I quote from Senator Nampajimba Price. Senators, I plead with you to help me save the lives of those I love and those I'm democratically elected to represent and whose lives we are all responsible for. I seek your bipartisan support to make my hometown community and vulnerable communities throughout the Northern Territory safer. If we can save one woman from becoming the next domestic violence or homicide statistic, we are winning. If we can prevent one child from being sexually abused and left with a venereal disease or internal physical and psychological scarring for life, that is one child. But I know we can do better than this. End quote. And we should listen. We should listen very, very carefully to that exhortation from Senator Nampajimpa Price. And I think Senator Nampajimpa Price has clearly articulated why we should be supporting this bill. And as Senator Nampajimpa Price said in her second reading speech, I quote, When dealing with addiction, the first step to management and recovery is acknowledging there is a problem. And those that are subject to the effects of addiction in the Northern Territory, the whole community, have been crying out that we have a problem since the cessation of the measure and lifting of alcohol restrictions in the Northern Territory Strong, Stronger Futures Act." End quote. And I associate myself with the remarks of Senator Canavan. There were so many warnings, so many warnings given, from, given by Aboriginal people living, living in these communities before the cashless welfare debit card was abolished, before these alcohol restrictions that were previously in place came to an end, so many warnings. And many of us in this chamber, many of my colleagues in this chamber from different parties got up and said, we are going to cause a, a profoundly negative impact, a profound negative impact upon the people in these communities if we lift these restrictions. And those calls were ignored those practical calls were ignored on the basis of ideology. And such a, a profound disappointment we should all have, because we were warned, the Australian government was warned, the Northern Territory government was warned, but did not listen. Did not listen to the communities on the ground. And there's a lesson in that. There is a profound lesson in that. I note that Senator Nampajimpa's price, prices bill provides for consultation in relation to alcohol protection measures. It calls for a committee of experts to consider and support the development of each alcohol management plan. And it also provides the basis upon which 
this bill is introduced. And these figures, these figures are just astonishing. And again, we were warned. This government was warned that this was going to happen. And here are the figures. Alcohol-related assaults in Alice Springs alone rose from December 2021 to December 2022 by 54.6 per cent. 54.6 per cent. Now that's a statistic. That's a statistic. But that, in that statistic are women and children who have been assaulted, who would not have been assaulted, but for the fact, but for the fact that those alcohol restrictions were removed. And those communities warned this government, and this government just proceeded to remove those restrictions despite those warnings from the local community. And it's those communities that have to suffer the impact of the removal of these restrictions. And I've made the point in this place in relation to the cashless welfare debit card and its removal, and we're seeing increased crime and violence in the communities in Western Australia, in Sojourna in South Australia, in the Northern Territory. And I've made this point repeatedly because the government says it had a mandate to, re to remove the cashless welfare debit card. But those communities are in seats which are not held by the government. Each and every one of those places where the cashless welfare debit card was in place, the people did not vote for the election of an Albanese government. So the communities most impacted, the communities most impacted by the removal of the cashless welfare debit card did not vote for its removal. None of them, not a single one of them, not the communities in Western Australia, South Australia or in my home state of Queensland, not a single one of those communities voted for its removal. So the government does not have a mandate for, from the communities most impacted by the removal of the cashless welfare debit card. There are people maybe in Sydney and Melbourne who voted for the removal of the cashless welfare debit card, but they don't live in the communities who are most impacted. The people in the communities most impacted by the removal of the cashless welfare debit card voted for its retention, voted for it to continue. Absolutely no mandate Senators, with respect to. And, well, I'll take that interjection. I'll take that interjection. It is absolutely correct. Labor, Labor does not have a mandate to remove even with 33% of the primary vote across the whole of Australia. There's barely any mandate to do anything. But in this case, in relation to the cashless welfare debit card, not a single one of those communities where it was operating voted for its removal. So there was no mandate to remove the cashless welfare debit card provided by the communities most impacted by the communities most impacted. And I've said repeatedly in this place, I said at my first speech in this place, when I was talking about project approvals in the mining, oil and gas sector, the people who should be most deeply listened to and respected are the communities most impacted. Are the communities most impacted. So whether or not it's the cashless welfare debit card, whether or not it's a coal project, an oil and gas project, the views of those most impacted in the local communities are the views which should be most listened to, not those in other areas of Australia who aren't affected by the decision. And I commend, I commend this private bill to the Senate. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I too rise to speak on this bill. Uh, and I thank Senator Nampajimpa Price for her long advocacy for uh, the women and children um, of the territory. Uh, and our government is committed to bringing communities uh, and governments together um, because we know that the challenges in the territory are real uh, and that families and communities need support from all levels of government. Uh, and we know that one level of government just can't address this alone. What we need is partnership, not a top-down approach. Uh, and that is why I am speaking against this bill today. Um, I was honoured to be in the chamber in the last sitting week for the speech by Senator Ma Malandiri McCarthy uh, on this bill. Uh, and I know that she's not here with us this week because um, what she is doing uh, is an incredible job leading Australia's delegation to the United Nations Commission um, on the status of women in New York. 
Uh, and as always, she is a fierce advocate for the rights of women uh, and, importantly, the rights of First Nations women. Uh, and she's taking that to the global stage right now, uh, and I'm so proud to see her there. Um, Senator McCarthy's speech was personal um, and it was powerful. It addressed the challenges for Aboriginal women head on uh, and also full of heart. She told her own family's story and she did it with absolute uh, courage and with grace. It's always an honour to sit in this place and hear from Senator McCarthy um, and all First Nations senators on both sides of the chamber about not just their long-term advocacy for their communities, but also how they know the challenges um, personally all too well. This place is one of the most important places to hear these stories, stories that far too many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families have. And no one uh, should ever feel unsafe in their own home and no one should ever have to go through what these communities have suffered, not just in the last six months, but for decades. Senator McCarthy addressed how important it is for us to work together and the importance of consultation. She talked about disempowerment, um, and that is something that really stuck with me in her speech, because as Senator McCarthy said, we've got to always keep trying to get it right, to empower people at every level. She said that we need to allow local, state and territory and federal governments to work together. Uh, and this bill would make the Commonwealth Minister responsible for approving alcohol management plans that the community develop. Uh, and that would mean that the ultimate decision making for alcohol management plans for communities in the Territory would be made right here in Canberra. And that, to me, seems to go right to the heart of disempowerment. disempowerment. Senator McCarthy implored the Senate that there's a better way than the bill before us and I support her in that. We know that these are long-term problems. They require not just words, but long-term solutions and actions. We need to allow the Northern Territory government to take legislative action themselves, which they have done. But we also need to support them in long-term solutions and work with them in partnership. We are a government that focuses on outcomes, and alcohol restrictions are part of the solution, but they are only part of what is needed. We also need to work on the social and economic drivers of community unrest, and that's why we're investing $250 million into a plan for a better, safer future for Central Australia. Uh, and this funding will go towards addressing the fundamental underlying structural causes of disadvantage. The plan focuses on improved community safety and cohesion through more youth engagement and diversion programs. Job creation, particularly in the communities that surround Alice Springs, including urgent changes as part of replacing the completely failed community development program. Better services because by improving services in surrounding communities, particularly health services, there will be less pressure in Alice Springs uh, as a result. Preventing and addressing the issues caused by fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, including better responding through the health and the justice systems. Investing in families, including by better supporting elders and parents and boosting domestic violence services. And on-country learning improving school attendance and completion through caring for, cul for culture and country and providing accessible opportunities for children to get an education. This is in addition to the investment in community safety announced by the government in January this year. Um, and this funding is based off recommendations from the Central Australian Regional Controller, Darrell Anderson, uh, and it's investment that will be delivered in partnership with the local community, because again, we know that the most effective solutions come from the local community. We know that what is really needed comes back to two things, empowerment and consultation. Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory have been calling for self-determination for a very long time. The Stronger Futures legislation deliberately denied this, um, and as my colleague Senator Pat Dodson put it so well, were legislative means of structurally disempowering remote Abor Aboriginal communities in the NT. Senator Dodson notes that these policy 
regimes, in his words, destabilise, disempower and disorient Aboriginal communities, taking away community power and making them dependent on government for survival. The Joint Standing Committee on Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, of which Senator Pat Dodson uh, is chair, um, looked at all of these issues in February. Uh, and this Joint Standing Committee has membership from, from Labor, from the Coalition uh, and from the Crossbench and Independents as well. Their inquiry into community safety, support services and job opportunities in the Northern Territory found that top-down approaches like this bill fail. Witnesses to the inquiry emphasise that governments need to invest in and value community-led solutions. In discussing community safety and alcohol management, the report from the inquiry notes that through the Stronger Futures legislation, there was little investment in harm reduction. And witnesses noted that these problems are bigger than just alcohol and that long-term solutions will only come when governments also look at housing, meaningful employment, education, um, and as the Alice Springs Hospital put so very well in their submission to the inquiry, hope and despair. The report, led by Senator Dodson, specifically states, it is clear to the committee that the NT government has sufficient legislative means to manage alcohol-related harm within its jurisdiction where there is the will to do so. This has been demonstrated by its recent legislative amendments to the Liquor Act 2019. It is the view of the committee that this is the appropriate role of the NT government, informed by the views of community, rather than the Commonwealth. With the, um, all the work of witnesses um, sharing their stories in this inquiry, it is clear that what we should do is listen to those voices. And these voices are telling us that this work needs to be done in consultation, in partnership and without further disempowering local communities. There really is no place for a top-down approach when what is really needed is partnership and consultation. The problem of family violence that Senator Nampajimpa Price is so genuinely passionate about, along with so many senators in this place, um, is a national problem. Uh, and everywhere in our country, First Nations women are at the greatest risk, um, including in my home state of Victoria. On Friday, I had the opportunity, along with Senator Stewart, to bring the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rishworth, to Victoria um, to meet with some of our incredible family violence organisations and hear about the real challenges that they face on the ground and the amazing work that they're doing. Um, and this was a roundtable where several First Nations advocates gave up their time to talk with us about what is happening here in Victoria as well, in my home state, and the work that they've done over decades to prevent and respond to family violence. Um, and again, I can say that what came through unequivocally and clearly is the importance of ground-up solutions, of community empowerment, of listening and of partnership. Aboriginal controlled family violence services talked about the success of investment in self-determination allowing Aboriginal communities to partner with government to help end family violence. So rather than intervention or a top-down approach, a real partnership that is about consultation and working together is what I heard was needed. Um, I had the opportunity to hear from an amazing woman, Daphne Yarram, um, from Gippsland, who has dedicated her entire life to the safety of women and children in her community. It's 24 years she's been working to address family violence. And Daphne talked about the importance of community-led approaches. She talked about how we can only stop family violence at the start by working with community and ensuring that our family violence system is culturally safe and that it's trauma-informed. Antoinette Braybrook from JIRA and Muriel Bamblett from the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency highlighted um, really effective work that we can draw some lessons from in Victoria, such as the, Del uh, the DELC-JA partnership. And Muriel spoke about the increased risk Aboriginal Tor and Torres Strait Islander women face, um, and they noted that that is, of course, often at the hands of white people. And DELCJA is an Aboriginal-led agreement to address family violence. 
It's a partnership with the Victorian government and it reflects the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Victoria and it requires government to do the two most important things that government can do in this space, which is listen and act. Darren Lovett, um, who is from the Delta Action Group, um, was there to share how this works on the ground. Um, and I also want to note the personal contribution from Simon Flagg of um, Wartharong Aboriginal Cooperative, um, who told his story about family violence um, at the round table, again with real grace um, and real courage. And listening to these voices <coughs> and hearing their stories and respecting the work that they've done for many years, um, doing that really emphasised to me the importance of a community-led approach. These people that I met with are the real experts in their fields, um, and I wouldn't seek to tell them how things should work in their community or how to fix problems that they know about much better than I do. Um, I was there then on Friday, and I'm here today to listen and take the advice of First Nations communities. Senator to take Walsh, sorry to interrupt you, um, if you could just re resume your seat. The, the time for the debate has actually expired. You'll be able to continue your speech, so you'll be in continuation. Uh, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures Number 1 Bill, deferred votes to be taken on the second reading amendments. As a result of deferred votes, I'm going to put the question on second reading amendments. Uh, and this is relating to the Thera Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. All of those op that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. 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 The noes have it. Uh, there's only one voice. Uh, is a division required? A yeah. uh, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. So, Senator Pratt, on a point of order. I, I just want to draw to Senator Babette's attention that if he calls for them, that he has to vote with that side as well. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Senator Pratt.
lock, lock the doors. <clears throat> the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint Senator McKim for the ayes and Senator Scar for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 15, noes 23. The question is resolved in the negative. Uh, I'll put the other question, um, which is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Babette be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. We're, we're in. We're, we're, I, I, yeah. It's a, it's a catch-up morning in the Senate. Everybody's having a nice chat. So I'll, I'm just put the second question, which is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Babette be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. no. The noes have it. The division is required. Bring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Babet be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint uh, Senator Babet for the ayes and Senator Scar for the noes.
<laughs> Senators, the result of the division is ayes 2, noes 36. The questions resolved in the negative. Uh, would honourable senators and please remove, re resume their seats or leave the chamber and re remove, remove yourself from your seat? <clears throat> okay. The, the question is that the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. <clears throat> Lock the doors. 
The question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt for the ayes and Senator Babette for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 35, noes 3. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989 and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill and, if I can, uh, move uh, government amendments on sheet UD 159 by leave together. That's okay. So um, we'll just return to the procedure and check that it is the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole. There being no objection, it is so ordered. What do you want to speak? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I did get ahead of myself. Um, so I've tabled the explanatory um, memorandum to go with the government amendments, and if I can, I would like to move government amendments numbers one to three on sheet UD one five nine by leave together. If that's appropriate. There being no objection, um, the question is that the amendments be uh, Ruston. I, I just wanted to um, indicate uh, that the opposition will be supporting this amendment by the, the government, and I just wanted to thank the government uh, for working with us to resolve the concerns that had been expressed by many around the, the natural justice implications of the original bill with regard to the powers of the secretary to publish information outside of information that has public health and safety implications. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the, the constructive way that we work with the government to make sure that we uh, dealt with the concerns that were significant concerns raised by the sector. So uh, I thank the government for making this amendment. Minister. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. I just, if I can, and I acknowledge um, Senator Rustin's contribution there, but I, if I could just speak uh, quickly to the government amendments uh, that are before the uh, the chamber. Uh, the bill included a measure to clarify that the natural justice hearing rule is not required to be observed in relation to the release of therapeutic goods information. An obligation to observe the natural justice hearing rule prior to releasing information could directly prevent or delay the release of health and safety information to the public or relevant stakeholders, for example, state and territory health departments, which could risk the health and safety of patients, frontline healthcare workers and the public. The government amendments to this measure would limit the exclusion of the natural justice hearing rule in relation to the release of information to the public under section 615C of the Act to release of, to release of information that is in the interests of, the pu of public health or safety or where the information relates to the safety of one or more therapeutic goods. These amendments balance the provision of natural justice in relation to the release of information with the need to ensure the timely release of health and safety information to the public. If the amendments to this measure were to go further and only exclude natural justice hearing rule in relation to the release of critical or urgent safety information, this would pre present a risk to the safety of Australian patients, health professionals and the public as some safety information. Um, the release of this information is necessary to prevent harm and even potentially deaths would not be able to be released if it did. Uh, not meet this threshold or if its release was delayed through courts. In some instances, TGA safety information would need to be combined with information from other sources, for example, state and territory health departments, in order to uh, recognise that the information concerns to recognise that the information concerns health or safety issues. Overall, the release of therapeutic goods information under the Act is a critical element of Australia's regulatory framework for therapeutic goods as it underpins community and health care industry awareness of the safe use of therapeutic goods, compliance and enforcement activities and cooperation with international regulators to bring new treatments to Australia as quickly as possible. The question is that the amendments on sheet on, on amendments 1 to 3 on sheet UD 159 be moved by leave together. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Yes, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Steele, John. Leave to move amendments 1 to 11 uh, on sheet uh, 1806 uh, revised. Uh, by leave together. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave's granted. Senator Steele John. Thank you. Thank you very much. In moving these amendments today, I want to dedicate them to the 150,000 Australian women who receive surgically implanted transvaginal uh, mesh. Now, most commonly, uh, these procedures were undertaken, these devices were sought um, in relation to uh, the treatment of uh, pelvic prolapse um, or stress-related urinary, uh, urinary incontinence um, or, uh, additionally, complications resulting from childbirth. These were things which people sought to access, devices that they sought to, uh, to have implanted in order to treat um, conditions which were causing them great distress and having a profound impact on their lives. These devices were promoted to women um, as being safe, and they were not safe. And when women spoke up about the actual reality of what these devices were doing to them, the pain, the blood, the inability to engage in intimate relations with their partners, they were dismissed. They were ignored. For year after year, they were ignored, and women continued to suffer. Now, this medical scandal resulted in the largest class action, the largest women's-based health class action in Australian history. And rightly, rightly so, given that this was one of the most profound failures in medical regulation 
and one of the most dangerous devices ever allowed into human bodies since thalidomide. Australian women led the world in holding manufacturers and regulators to account. And Australian women, though they had experienced the most horrendous treatment at the hands of the manufacturers, at the hands of medical practitioners, at the hands of dismissive regulators, came forward to their parliament in 2018 and trusted their parliament, gave evidence to their parliament, went to their MPs and said, I am willing on the public record to talk about some of the most personal, some of the most intimate impacts of medical device failure in public and in the media. And I do this so that this may never happen again to anybody else. That's what they did. And four years ago, the Senate inquiry handed down its recommendations as a result of that evidence. Four years ago. And finally, a government has coughed up a response to some of those recommendations. Finally, it has. And yet, what we see here, what we see here today, is the half baked misimplementation of the first, the very first recommendation of that inquiry. The very first recommendation of that inquiry was a mandatory reporting system that covered health care practitioners so that if in the future such a device is in circulation causing pain and harm that the regulator is able to have the data to alert the community. And yet what the government has put forward is a mandatory reporting framework solely for hospitals, for healthcare facilities, missing in that entire process the vital role of ensuring that general practitioners also have to report because of the reality that when a device such as these malfunctions, and it relates particularly to gynecological issues, people are not going to go straight to their ED. People don't. They want to talk with somebody they have a relationship with because it's, it's, it's clouded in shame. And it's also uh, given in a context where women's pain is so often dismissed. So they want to go and talk to the person that they have a relationship with, that they have a built trust with. And that is often for people their GP. Now the Greens recognise the absolute urgency of listening to women's voices, listening to the experts that gave evidence to the inquiry and putting forward this comprehensive mandatory reporting regime. And that is exactly what this amendment does, in line with the recommendations of the Senate inquiry. We do recognise that there is a need to allow for a transition period. And so we have crafted an amendment that enables hospitals uh, to mandatorily report from the date of royal assent. And then in a year's time, after the completion of the TGA's review of its systems and processes, then GPs will have to mandatorily uh, report after the system has been reviewed in consultation with GPs. So we have made those allowances in this amendment, as we have also made allowances recognising uh, that in the rural and regional uh, uh, context there may be times uh, when uh, the 
injuries that people are presenting with, the devices that they've had implanted, sit outside the GP's scope of practice. And so we have made an allowance that, in such circumstances, the GP is not required to mandatorily report if they refer the patient to a specialist. These are reasonable exemptions. These are reasonable provisions that should enable a reasonable government that prides itself on centering women's voices to support this amendment to ensure that such medical harms are never again done to women. I urge the chamber, I urge the chamber to support these changes. Because in the absence of mandatory reporting, we are left with an inadequate voluntary reporting framework, which the inquiry heard over and over again was inadequate, because it too often places the onus on the patient that has been harmed to follow up with the regulator or to follow up with the practitioner to ensure that the report has been made. This is not acceptable. Finally, in closing, I would urge the Chamber to consider, and I, I make these comments as a cis man sitting in this place, right? to, to acknowledge the reality the, 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 to acknowledge the reality that misogyny and sexism has played in the fact that we are four years down the line and still have not implemented these recommendations. I say this with no uh, desire to create mock shock or outrage. If this had been a medical device that had affected uh, men in the same way, that have affected men's ability to engage in an intimacy with their partners, that it caused such profound pain to men, this would have been dealt with immediately. It would have been numero uno on the health minister's agenda. And yet, because it related to women's pain, it has for too long been put in the hard basket, and then today we see a bill that doesn't do the job. Please, I urge the government, join with the Greens in accepting this very reasonable amendment. The Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, the government won't be supporting uh, the amendment moved by uh, the Greens, and I'll just take a bit of. I'll take a few moments just to say why. Um, recommendation one, which Senator Steele John referred to, um, noted the vital role of adverse reporting in post market surveillance, and the committee recommends that the Australian Government, in consultation with states and territories and the Medical Board of Australia, review the current system of reporting adverse events to the TGA to implement mandatory reporting of adverse events by medical practitioners, provide guidance on what constitutes an adverse event for use by consumers, medical practitioners and device sponsors, improve awareness of the reporting system and examine options to simplify the reporting process. So that recommendation has been implemented uh, in the sense that the consultations referred to in recommendation have been undertaken. Um, the former government accepted that recommendation in principle. Um, but did note through that recommendation a number of policy and implementation constraints and the potential for administrative burden on healthcare professionals. And I think at the time the response was the government is aware of the heavy burden of care and reporting carried by some in the healthcare sector and is mindful to balance any proposed measures appropriately. Um, I should also say um, throughout this process, it was pointed out that TGA has no legal regulatory authority to mandate the reporting of medical practitioners. The Chief Medical Officer wrote to the AMA, the Medical Board of Australia, the uh, Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency and the Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare and respective professional colleges and societies to encourage reporting of adverse events to the TGA. 
and many healthcare professional bodies have adopted the Australian Consensus Framework for Ethical Collaboration, including the AMA, the RACS and the RACGP, which requires their members to demonstrate ethical behaviour, including reporting obligations. Um, so in terms of next step, the former and current governments, so our government and the previous government, has supported the TGA to work closely with healthcare facilities and state and territory health departments to implement rapid sharing about medical device safety and effectiveness. Um, an action plan for medical devices released in 2019 and public consultation papers in 2020 and 2021, seeking feedback on mandatory reporting focused on reporting by healthcare facilities. The TGA also reviewed its adverse event reporting forms and improved its internal systems. Um, so when we work through, I think it is important. Uh, some of the relevant information is that around the TGA's role, it does not regulate individual medical practitioners or healthcare professionals themselves. Therefore, compliance of mandatory reporting of in individuals would be difficult and potentially outside the legal powers of the TGA. Um, the approach of healthcare facilities reports, reporting aligns with their existing role that they have to report to health state departments and the role of the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare in being a standards and accreditation body for facilities rather than individual doctors. Um, just a couple of other points. Medical devices that are, will be proposed to be in scope of the mandatory reporting scheme by a facility are a device that is used in the facility has resulted in the death or serious deterioration in health and or has resulted in treatment for a serious deterioration in health or would have likely resulted in the death or serious deterioration in health. The government would argue that this is the mandatory process that should be put in place via um, the facilities themselves, um, which of course would have um, contacts um, with those individual medical practitioners who operate within them. Um. Senator Hanson. The indulgence of the Senate, I would like clarification on a comment that Senator Steele John made with relation to his amendment, and that is when he made reference to the fact that, uh, if I've got this right, if you've got a regional doctor that can't report to the um, to the uh, reporting body, then the patient must be referred to a specialist. That is the case. Right. My concern with that is. If you're in a regional area, then if the patient has to be referred to a specialist, who's going to pay for that? Because people may not be able to travel or go to see a specialist. So, that's, I have a concern about that. S Senator, Senator Rustin, or did, did you want to respond, Senator Stilton? I just see your guidance. Are we allowed to respond to the question? No, I'm just wondering whether procedurally we can. So, for the clarification of the oh. chamber, yes. the, the oh, debate I'm... is free flowing, okay. and you you can speak on this debate as well. Okay, well, to, to your amendment. So, you have yes. the call, Senator Steele John. Thank you. Well, just briefly in relation to Senator Hansen's question, um, the amendment as drafted does not uh, address the question of uh, the patient's funding to uh, travel to the specialist. You're, you're right. The intent of the amendment is uh, particularly around had the device um, that had malfunctioned uh, been uh, inserted or, or provided to the patient in some way by a specialist, the device has then malfunctioned um, and they have presented to their general practitioner. The general practitioner may be of the view that what the patient is experiencing and its harm um, to the patient is beyond their scope of practice, potentially, and in that case, um, the GP would be freed of their uh, mandatory reporting obligation if they take the step of referring the patient to the specialist that implanted the de uh, device, for example. Um, so I hope that hope that's useful. Thank you, Senator Steele, John. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you, um, Chair. Um, the, the government, uh, sorry, <laughs> the opposition um, has has sympathy with the intent of the amendment that um, Senator Steele John uh, has moved in this place and is before us at the moment. Because I think everybody would agree that um, patient safety must be always at the forefront of our thinking when we deal with issues in relation to the health and welfare of Australians. 
uh, but we also are very mindful of um, the technical aspects of the implementation of the effects of this particular amendment, many of which have been outlined uh, by the minister. Uh, but we also recognise at the moment um, that medical practitioners are under significant pressure due to serious workforce shortages, uh, and this is particularly um, significant for medical practitioners and general practitioners that are working in rural and regional and remote Australia. Uh, and we know that that's where workforce shortages are hitting the hardest at the moment. So I think b before we seek to, to make these sorts of changes, um, we need to make sure first and foremost that reporting processes are, are as easy as possible and the, the simplification of reporting systems is something that I know um, and I'm, that, that when in government we were very keen to, to continue to as a work in progress and um, as indicated by the minister, uh, obviously the government uh, now is intent to continue that process as well. Uh, so we would certainly say to the government and we would certainly say to, to the Greens and Senator Steele John that we are absolutely committed to working to make sure the simplification of reporting systems um, is absolutely maximised. Um, but um, before making any changes at all in this place, they need to be well consulted, they need to be well considered because any changes need to make sure that first of all they're fit for purpose and able to be implemented, but they also need to be able to deliver the effect that they're intending to deliver in the first place. So, um, the, uh, the opposition um, is, uh, is happy um, to support an, an ongoing effort to make sure that the health and safety of all Australians is maximised, and um, certainly um, there are a number of recommendations that we would like to see continue to be pursued. Can, you know, as an example, recommendation 22 of the Medicines and Medical Devices Review, which called on the establishment of a registry of high-risk implantable devices uh, with a view to facilitating timely identification of emerging safety concerns. So while the opposition is opposing this amendment for the reasons that I have stated, I um, just wanted to put on the record that um, patient safety is absolutely first and foremost. Uh, however, we must recognise uh, the, that we need to make sure that the implementation mechanism and method um, is appropriate and timely and doesn't have any unintended consequences. The Senator Roberts. I'd like to ask the minister some questions, please, Chair. You have the call, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Uh, Minister, the way I've been advised on this bill is it strips fundamental legal rights and legal principles that have been fundamental for centuries. Number two, it is sneaky. It's been introduced very sneakily, and I'll ask you questions about that in a minute. Number three, we have I have significant problems with the provisions, and I'll ask you questions about that. The pelvic mesh disaster is nothing short of a cruel, inhuman disaster. People have been neglected and they need this help. You've had two other bills on pel pelvic mesh, which we support, but this one is a bologna sandwich because while it does have some good material on pelvic mesh and alleviating that crippling problem, it has been sneakily bundled in with big changes in a bill that's supposed to support pelvic mesh, but really goes to freeing up and giving complete control with limited accountability to bureaucrats. There's been no committee inquiring into this bill, none at all. The changes are sneaky and they give one bureaucrat unprecedented power to approve medicines that are not tested in Australia. And there's immunity from accountability. I would like to read some parts of the scrutiny, the report from the scrutiny of bills, because there's, that's where I'd like to go with my first questions. <clears throat> Firstly, the reversal of evidential burden of proof. I'm not a lawyer, and I understand you are, Minister. I'd like to quote from 1.176 in the scrutiny of bills report. As the explanatory materials do not address this issue, the commit that is reversal of evidential proof, burden of proof. As the explanatory materials do not address this issue, the committee requests the minister's advice as to why it is proposed to use a defence of reasonable excuse, which reverses the evidential burden of proof for proposed subsection 45 AC3. The committee's consideration of the appropriateness of a provision which reverses the burden of proof is assisted if it explicitly addresses relevant principles as set out in the Guide to Framing Commonwealth Offences. 
What is your response to that, Minister? Minister. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Roberts for the question. Just like to make clear on the record that I am not a lawyer. Um, there are plenty in this place, but I am not one of them. <laughs> You're, that's right. <laughs> it is your adverse reflection on me. Um, thank you. In relation to the reversal of evidential burden of proof. Um, section 45 AC would create an offence for failing to comply with a notice from the Secretary requiring the production of information for documents, and a proposed new subsection 45 AC3 provides a defence of reasonable excuse for the offence of failing to comply with a notice from the Secretary requiring, requiring the production of information or documents that are relevant to a contravention or possible contravention of the Act or regulations. Therefore, the offence does not apply if a person has a reasonable excuse, but the defendant has to prove this. The note to the subsection provides that the defendant bears an evidential burden in relation to this matter. A reasonable excuse defence is appropriate because the matters comprising the, the offence would genu generally be only known to the defendant. For example, that they did not comply because they were in hospital or were dealing with an emergency or a natural disaster or something to that effect, and it would be significantly more difficult for the prosecution to prove that. The pro proposed defence only involves an evidential burden for the defendant to point to evidence that suggests a reasonable possibility that the matter comprising the excuse exists rather than a legal burden of proof. Uh, Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to go to the next topic in stripping fundamental legal practices and principles. Strict liability. Now, my understanding of that is that it means no trial, no evidence of defence, just strictly liable. Documents that are not required under a court order, instead just a bureaucrat. So I read <coughs> from the scrutiny of bills report, item 1.183. I'm just not going to take up too much time because I'm not going to read two pages of this. The committee draws its scrutiny concerns to the attention of senators and leaves to the Senate as a whole the appropriateness of imposing a strict liability offence under subsection 45, under proposed subsection 45 AD2, noting that the penalties impu imposed under that offence are above what is recommended in the Guide to Framing Commonwealth Offences. Did you have any response to the Scrutiny of Bills report? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. And I agree. I mean, strict liability um, offences should only be used in particular circumstances uh, throughout legislation. And they are used in circumstances where there is a public interest ensuring that the regulatory schemes are observed and it can be reasonably expected that the person was aware of their duties and obligations. Uh, the inclusion of the strict liability offences and the maximum of 100 penalty units is uh, justified in the particular context of the regulatory scheme for therapeutic goods can, given the potentially significant consequences for public health and safety in the event of non-compliance. For instance, a failure to provide information or documents could delay the investigation of a contravention of the Act, with patients suffering harm before the contravention is identified, and the provision of false or misleading information could lead TGA to conclude that a therapeutic good is safe for use by patients when it may not be. It is an exception to the offence if a person has a reasonable excuse, such as being unable to answer for a reason, such as being um, in hospital and un unable uh, to reply for not complying. Um, and um, the 100 penalty units, I think in your uh, second reading um, address, you raised comments about an automatic fine of $27,000. Um, it's important to note that the penalty of 100 penalty units is a maximum penalty for natural um, persons and that the amount of any penalty would be for a court to determine in accordance with sentencing principles. Senator Roberts. Procedural fairness. I mean, we've got reversal of evidential burden of proof, strict liability, now we've got procedural fairness. Bureaucrats don't even have to make a case. So let me read 1.190 from the Scrutiny of Bills uh, report. In light of this, the committee requests, requests the minister's advice as to why it is considered necessary to provide a broad exclusion 
to procedural fairness within the bill, a broad exclusion, sweeping would be another word, to procedural fairness within the bill, noting the flexibility that is already applied by the courts when considering the extent to which procedural fairness obligations might apply in a particular circumstances. And secondly, Minister, whether at a minimum the amendment can be narrowed to exclude procedural fairness to circumstances where disclosure is required for urgent public safety reasons. What was the Minister's response? Minister of Health. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, um, on the last bit of that um, question, we just, the Senate just agreed to a government amendment um, to that section of the bill uh, around that. So I think that probably has addressed those, um, uh, se the second part of your remarks, um, Senator Roberts. Um, under the section, this is the section 61 amendment, the therapeutic goods information is released by the TGA under the Act for Health, Safety and Transparency Purposes. This measure supports the timely release of therapeutic goods information by the TGA, which is vital for protecting the health and safety of patients, frontline health care workers and the public. The amendment to this measure, which we just passed, appropriately balances the provision of natural justice with the need to ensure the timely release of health and safety information. The amendment does so by limiting the circumstances in which the natural justice hearing rule is excluded for releases of information to the public under section 615C of the Act. The natural justice hearing rule is not excluded for information released under the provision unless there is a safety related issue and in some circumstances the secretary may still observe the requirements of the natural justice hearing rule. The amendment effectively codifies the TGA's current practice as delaying or preventing the release of information would be contrary to the public interest. Thank you, Minister. Call Senator Steele, um, Senator Steele John. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I want to thank uh, the Minister and the, the Shadow Minister for, for their responses and um, and ask a, a couple of clarifying questions of the, the minister. Um, before I do so, I just want to place on the record um, a particularly compelling uh, piece of evidence given to the inquiry um, into this issue four years ago. Um, it's the evidence of a woman um, who said to the inquiry in relation to their experience uh, with transvaginal mesh um, and the current reporting system. Uh, they said, and I quote, um, no one knows about reporting it. I don't understand why it's our responsibility to report it to the TGA when the doctors who we uh, go back to with our complaints and complications don't have to. I found out via MESH support groups online that the T uh, about what the TGA is and what its purpose is. I contacted my surgeon to ask if he had reported uh, my erosion and issues along with the partial removal of the sling device. I also sent him the TGA link with the alert advising doctors that they should be reporting any adverse effects. He had not reported anything, so I did it myself. So this is the situation that women found themselves in uh, when exposed. 150,000 Australian women were, were potentially exposed to this device uh, where they had to follow up with their surgeon and they had to share the link to the regulator's statements about this, and then the surgeon didn't follow it up. Now, the government may well say, well, you know, as we've defined it here, it's uh, medical facilities, it's hospitals. The problem with that is that if the uh, relevant healthcare practitioner does not work within a facility, they don't fall under those requirements. And we go back to the inadequate voluntary system. Now, the minister in their statement talked about uh, the complexity and the difficulty. I think they were referring potentially to the, the system of, uh, of voluntary reporting, the system of reporting more broadly and the way in which that's been updated. The TGA has told us on three separate occasions um, that they are working right now to improve their systems and they expect that work to be completed um, in reasonably short order. And as the government, if you know, there's a problem with resourcing of the TGA so that they can do that, the government can solve that problem. So that, I think, has been addressed comprehensively in relation um, to the responses from the TGA in the course of negotiations over this bill. The question of burden 
on, on uh, medical practitioners. And I do want to take it uh, because I have heard, as many of us have heard, um, from the representative peak bodies of general practitioners and other, um, uh, other professions in relation to the stresses and strains that they are under. And that is a reality. Um, but I would, also, I would also caution that we need to balance in this conversation. Uh, first of all, we need to take a clear-eyed look at what the burden may reasonably expect it to be. Now, I would hope that there is not, in fact, a, a great multitude of, of, of faulty medical devices circulating in the Australian community. I would really hope that that's the case after these scandals. Um, uh, but even if there were, th this is a situation that a general practitioner um, would reasonably expect it to like, actually experience a patient presenting to them in those circumstances where there is a serious uh, resulting illness. Th these are once or twice in their practice life you would see these kind of This isn't every day somebody's going to be coming in in these circumstances saying, oh my God, I'm in this situation and I've just had this device in. These will hopefully be very rare situations, but when they occur, they must be reported. And I think we need to balance that potential rare burden with the burden borne by the patient. The burden borne by the patient if they have implanted within them a medical device which then is faulty, fails, causes them harm, and then that is not reported to the regulator so that we have a situation where thousands of people's lives are adversely affected. Because that's what happened here. Not in the 60s, not in the 70s, in modern contemporary Australia. Before this became more widely known, before transvaginal mesh and its healthcare impacts uh, became more widely known, the TGA had recorded hundreds of just hundreds. A couple hundred here, a couple hundred there. When Professor Skerritt gave evidence to the inquiry uh, in 2018, if I remember his submission correctly, he, he said that at one point they'd had 12 uh, reports of faults to the TGA. He specifically stated that one of the challenges with the system was if the regulator doesn't get the information, they can't issue the red alert. And so that's why it is so important for that data to be gathered from everywhere it exists, not simply that, where, that which it is easy for the government currently to access. Now, finally, my question to the minister. They reference uh, a potential legal barrier to this amendment. Um, and so I would uh, genuinely like to inquire of the, the minister what they were referring to there. My understanding of the, my read of the Act is that uh, 29AA gives the TGA the ability to uh, issue uh, penalty notices to individuals who uh, fail to fail to comply. Um, however, if the government's in possession, possession of other understandings, other pieces of legal advice, I'd really welcome the opportunity to hear the minister's perspective on what they exactly mean in relation to potential legal barriers. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, well, Senator Steelejohn, um, your approach to this is that there is no other regulation around the behaviour, conduct and standards of medical practitioners, which is incorrect. That, that the TGA's role is not to regulate the conduct, capability, standards of medical practitioners. Well, that's the answer. I mean, you, you, can, you can look like that doesn't affect you. In relation to the, the powers the TGA has to issue penalties and things like that, that is in relation to manufacturers, right? not medical practitioners. So that is the legal barrier. It's not in the TGA's role. There's the Australian Health Practitioners Regula Regulation Authority, a APRA, that does that in relation to the, the standards 
of um, medical practitioners. And so I think that's at the heart of what uh, your amendment, uh, and obviously, with, you know, you obviously disagree with us around uh, a mandatory scheme as opposed to the TGA being able to have the information available to it through uh, the facilities where women but others, not just women, because it's not just about um, the, the, um, the mesh devices, present with issues relating to that device is likely to be in a health facility. It's not going to necessarily be in a GP practice where that device may have been implanted. So that is the idea of having the mandatory scheme by the health facilities. Um, and it's not the TGA's role to um, issue penalties against medical practitioners. It is not the TGA's role, and that is the legal barrier that we ref I referred to earlier in my contribution. Senator Babette. Still, John, if you'll indulge me for just a moment. Uh, Chair, I seek leave to move amendments one and two on sheet 1849 together. We've got amendments before us, so we can't deal with new amendments. So, Senator Babette, um, I called you on the assumption that you were going to participate in the debate of the matter that is before the, the Senate. While this amendment is being dealt with, it is uh, out of order to present your amendment. That will flow a little later in the debate. Leave. So, is leave, is leave granted? Yeah. On top of Senator Steele Johns. Well, I'm in the hands of the Senate. It doesn't make any sense for me. We're not going to get the bill done. So. Le leave is granted. Yep. Senator Babette. All right. So, I move the amendments. So, um, my intent by, by proposing the two amendments on sheet 1849 is as follows. Uh, Amendment 1, amend subsection 19A11 of the TGA Act 1989 to provide that approvals made by, by the Secretary are legislative instruments and will therefore be subject to disallowance under section 42 of the Legislation Act 2003. Quite simply, what we're seeking is to ensure proper oversight and political accountability for decisions made by the Secretary as a result of proposed amendments. Um, I believe that the bill is written uh, as it is written right now. Uh, there appears to be a lack of accountability and too much power in one person's hand. Amendment 2 is designed to serve two functions, ensure that there is ministerial oversight and also to ensure that uh, before giving notice of approval, the secretary must first give notice to the minister and seek their agreement. And, the and we have proposed that the minister be asked to provide their agreement or objection within 14 days or otherwise is considered to have Senator been Babette, given. The time for the, the time for uh, sorry, there is a hard marker in the Senate time, so uh, the debate will be continued at a later time. The committee will report to the Senate. Thank you. Report from the committee of the whole. The chair of the committee at 12:15 will report to the Senate, and we report progress. We'll now move to notices. Of motion. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Being none. Is there a, a report from the selection of bills committee? Senator Urquhart. Um, <clears throat> thank you, President. I pre present the second report of the 2023 of the selection of bills committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansart. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Russell? Um, do I just seek leave to move an amendment to your. You don't, I don't need, need leave, leave. Senator Okay, Russell. well, then I will move. Uh, at the end of the motion, add, and in respect of the provisions of the Social Security Administration Amendment Income Management Reform Bill 2023, the Community Affairs Legislation Committee report by the 6th of June 2023. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister? Just on uh, that amendment, the government is aware that there is majority support in this chamber for an inquiry referral to the Social Security Administration Amendment Income Management Reform Bill 2023 to report on the June 6, 2023. We believe that this date will put the timely passage of this important legislation at risk. We know from previous inquiries that the basics card is out of date and not sufficient to meet the needs of people in community. 
our bill directly responds to the clear message given to the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee inquiry into the cashless debit card last year, importantly giving income management participants more choice. The bill provides the choice of a better product with modern technology and it does so at a cheaper cost than the previous cashless debit card. To prolong the date of an inquiry would deny more than 24,400 existing income management participants with the choice to assess a contemporary and improved card as soon as practical as soon as practicable, and it will keep them on the basics technology, which is out of date and limits participants' options on where they can shop. So we would prefer an earlier reporting date, but we accept that there is a view of the Senate um, that this bill report on uh, this June the 6, 2023, but we just wanted to record our concern about the delay in the passage of this bill. Uh, Senator McKim. President, uh, just to indicate firstly that the Greens will be supporting this amendment from uh, the opposition and to, um, to reject the assertion from the government that this puts at risk any uh, potential legislative time frame and also to indicate to uh, the government that the Greens are prepared to facilitate uh, the Senate uh, being able to deal with this legislation in the June sitting, which, which we would submit gives plenty of time for the legislative uh, timetable to be met. Thank you, Senator um, McKim. Are there any other contributions on this motion? Otherwise, I'm going to put it. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Rustin, an amendment to the selection of bills report, be agreed to. Those back position say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Minister. Um. Thank you. I um, seek leave to move an amendment or just move the amendment yeah, just move it. to the section of bills that's been circulated on um, in my name on government, well, I think it's Gov 1 amendment, which is to add, but in respect of the provisions of the migration amendment, Australia's engagement in the Pacific and Other Measures Bill 2023. The Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee report by the 13th of June 2023. Um, I I hope that senators can give consideration for a slightly shorter reporting date to this inquiry. Why, while we accept um, Senate support for a reporting date um, one week earlier than was originally discussed and have this table, report table by June 30, 13th, we do believe this date still provides some risk that there will be delays to the passage of this legislation and honouring the commitments we've made to Pacific countries. It could delay opportunities for this visa class to address the worker shortages in, in Australia. Um, so I just again wanted to record that and hope that we can seek Senate support for a reporting date of the 13th of June. So the question, uh, Senator McKim. I'll just make a brief contribution. So just to indicate the Greens will um, support this and we uh, understand the government's legislative, um, legislative time frame on this, which is why we're happy to support a slightly earlier reporting date. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those for that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thanks, President. I uh, move the amendment to the Selection of Bills Committee report that's been circulated in my name, which is to add at the end of the motion and in respect of the Treasury Laws Amendment 2023 measures number one bill 2023, the provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the Economics Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 26th of May 2023. Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister. Uh, thank you. I understand again that there ma there's support <coughs> for Senator McKim's um, amendment, a majority support. Um, we would uh, uh, prefer uh, not to have um, in another reasonably long inquiry. The industry needs certainty on these matters, and one of them has been sitting around since 2016. <coughs> we don't believe there's a need for a protracted inquiry for what has already been consulted on extensively. Thank you, Minister. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I'm now going to um, put the amended bill and just remind senators that it has uh, an opposition amendment moved by Senator Rustin, uh, an amendment moved by Senator Gallagher and an amendment moved by Senator McKim that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Thank you, senators. Um, 
I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Minister. I move the general business notice of motion number 175 be considered during general business today. Is there any objection to that? Yeah, I've just put the question. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, and I'll call the clerks and postponements. President, a postponement notification has been lodged in respect of general business notice of motion number 174 in the name of Senator Lambie, postponed from today to the 20th of March. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 8 of today's order of business. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, I remind senators that question may be put on any proposal at the request of any um, senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll move to business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Barbara Pocock. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Pocock. I move the motion. So the question is that business of the Senate. I uh, beg your pardon, Senator Robert. Uh, are you seeking leave? Yes, to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Thank Roberts. Thank you. We will be, one Nation will be supporting uh, Senator Barbara Pocock's motion because we believe that the big, farm, big um, uh, consulting companies are basically guns for hire. They're opinions for hire. They give the government what the government wants out of a million dollars a gig. So some of these big firms are multinationals out of Japan. So we will be supporting you. Thank you. Senator Roberts, so the question is that business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Barbara Pocock, be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Wong, Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the consideration of a motion on Afghanistan be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call the minister. I move the motion. So the question is that um, government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Wong and moved by Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And I'll call on the clerk. Uh, government business order um, for the debate and consideration of motion by the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Wong, and the leader of the opposition in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, and Senator Payman in relation to Afghanistan. Question to be put without further amendment or debate. So the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Now move to government business number two, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. I ask that government business notice of motion number two relating to the discharge of bills from the notice paper be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call the minister. Thank you. I move the motion. So the uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank Senator you. Roberts. One Nation will not be supporting this. We will be opposing it because it's simply Stephen Jones protecting the bankers again, removing penalties. We would want to amend it, not support it. Rural, I, I chaired the, the, uh, committee, the inquiry, Senate Select Inquiry into Lending to Primary Production Customers, and we saw firsthand the heinous activities of the bank. We see, now see that Labor, former Labor Premier Anna Bly is the, is the head of the Australian Banking Association. Please explain. So we have Liberals and Labor running interference for the banks and protecting the banks. We've got rural bank closures accelerating and no provisions for their replacement. We need a postal bank and there is, we have to stop equity theft in this country because that's what the banks are doing. Thank you, Senator Roberts. And I remind you when referring to people in the other place that you use their correct titles. So the question is that Government business number two, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Uh, we'll now move to general business number 175, standing in the name of Senator Hanson. Are you taking that one, Senator Roberts? 157, Senator Roberts. Thank you. 
I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 157, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the regulation of products made or that contain cannabis and for related purposes. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a, uh, a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the regulation of products made of or that contain cannabis and for related purposes. Senator Roberts. I move that this bill now be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Now move to general business number 168, standing in the name of Senator Rice. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 168, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rice. I move that the following bill be introduced. The Ending Native Forest Logging Bill, which is a bill for an act to repeal the Regional Forest Agreements Act 2002, and to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Rice. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to repeal the Regional Forest Agreement Act 2002 and to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. Senator Rice. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an, an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Please leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Rice. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Please leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. I believe there's no committee membership, so I'm going to messages. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The Australia Council Amendment, Creative Australia Bill 2023 and Royal Commission's Amendment, Enhancing Engagement Bill 2023. Minister. President, thank you. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. So the question is, uh, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Australia Council Amendment Creative Australia Bill 2023 and Royal Commission's Amendment Enhancing Engagement Bill 2023. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. I believe the ayes have it. Minister, I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. One further message. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendment made by the Senate to the Private Health Insurance Legislation Amendment Medical Device and Human Tissue Product List and Cost Recovery Bill of 2022. Uh, I believe we are now going back to government business. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 measures a number one bill 2022 uh, further in further consideration in committee of the whole. So we will just find a chair to take the committee through. Um, 
might have the quorum. Could we call quorum? Yeah, I think we need to call quorum. We're after a chair, there's no chair. Oh, thank you. Yes, that would be good. Thank you. I don't know either. Oh, see, there you go. I can. Makes it look like I'm in trouble. Thank you, President. Do you want me to tell him? Could you please? I've got two people up there. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. The committee is considering the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1, Bill 2022, and Amendments 1 to 11 on Sheet 1806, revised to moved by Senator Steelejohn, and Amendments 1 and 2 on Sheet 1849, moved by Senator Babbitt. Any speakers? The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Just got I'm sorry, my apologies. We'll do, sorry, sorry, Senator Babbitt. I'll do Senator Steele John's amendments first. Sorry, Senator Steele John. So, so I will now move the question that Senator Steele John's amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. no. I'd say the noes have it. Division required, ring the bells.
Shut the doors. Okay, Senators, the question is that Greens amend order. The question is that Greens amendment one to eleven on sheet one eight zero six revised two by leave together, moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. The ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim to tell it for the ayes. Senator Askew to tell it for the noes. Thank you. The result of the, of the division is ayes 16, noes 22. The question is resolved in the negative. I will let you know, Senators, we have another amendment to move. Now, the question is that UAP motion 1 and 2 on sheet 1849 by leave together, moved by Senator Babbitt, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. Oh, the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Yes. One minute, please. Okay, I'll do that. That's it. Order. Uh, the question is that UAP Amendment uh, 1 and 2 on sheet 1849 by leave. Uh, together, um, uh, but moved by Senator Babbitt, be agreed to. The ayes shall pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Babbitt to tell it for the ayes. Senator ask you to tell it for the noes.
beautiful. Order. The result of the division is eyes to nose 35. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. Oh, the ayes have it. Uh, the question is now that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. 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 Oh, Senators, I'll just, I've got one voice from both sides of the equation there, so we'll have another crack, shall we? The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. No. Now there's no no's. Okay, that was easy. Uh, the ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Report from the Committee of the Whole. The Committee has considered the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill 2022 be agreed to with amendments. Clerk. Oh, you need to move it. No, you're fine. You, you don't know. Speakers. Minister. The report be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. Read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts, did you want your your position recorded? Okay. Do we, would you? Yeah. All right. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the Therapeutic Goods Act, 1989, and for related purposes, Government Business Order for Day Number Two, Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022, resumption of debate on the second reading, and the amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge. Or, order, Senators. Senator Roberts now has the call. He's in continuation on another bill, so please leave the chamber in an orderly manner. Senator Roberts. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. This bill is purportedly about safety and health. What it's really about is control and enabling injection mandates, vaccine mandates. This sets up the power to be able to do so. I want to read a text message from the parent of a daughter who has been mandated out right now, mandated out of work. This is the text message from the parent. Here is the text I received from my daughter tonight after a Zoom meeting with the Nurses Professional Association of Queensland on the findings of the Industrial Relations Commission in Queensland. She is gutted and feels she does not deserve further discrimination or punishment from Queensland Health. She w this government, that's the Labor government in Queensland, may pursue staff even after they resign, causing them untold me mental, social and economic stress. It appears Queensland Health believes these staff members have not suffered enough due to them refusing to take an experimental injection, gene therapy-based injection, and wish to punish them some more. This is vindictive in the extreme. Then here's the text from her daughter. Hi, Mama. I'm going to aim for bed early. I'm emotionally very tired today, especially after the Zoom meeting today. It was a long meeting. They essentially said if we didn't apply initially for a special exemption in the first instance, medical or religious, then they have exhausted all options for the PSAs through the Industrial Relations Commission. We can continue to have them represent us if we wish, as they will likely be appealing the recent decision. But they also said it is now a good time to resign to prevent being terminated and that appearing on the person's record. They also said CHQ, Queensland Health, can continue to pursue disciplinary action against me even after I've resigned. They recommended to resign in the next few days before they start the end termination process. I've sent all questions after I've rechecked them into the main info hub also of the union for a response. I tried to ask a few within the meeting, but only got one answered, and there were many questions coming through in the meeting. There are many people affected. People are getting swamped. So I'm considering resigning by the end of the week, if not tomorrow. 
I will hopefully have some more answers after they respond to the questions, especially around what degree of legal or financial or professional impact disciplinary processes will have if they go the whole hog on me. If they go the whole hog on me, a 20-year-old woman, I am tired. I'm tired of having it hang over my head, especially when I feel so undeserving of this treatment and I gave all that I had and more to the health and my work. That's coming from a 20-year-old graduate nurse. That's disgraceful. Look, safety is the number one priority of any person in any business. Not just for moral reasons, which are the top, but also for commercial reasons. Safety saves money and saves and it increases productivity and profits. That is still to be understood in many companies, sadly, around this country, and sadly, amongst many union bosses. But safety is abused. It's exploited by some employers. It's exploited by some union bosses calling strikes over safety issues when they couldn't get their way industrially. And now we see that this, this government is abusing it. The TGA bill gives sweeping powers to the Secretary of Federal Health Department. I've highlighted pieces here. If you could just excuse me a minute, I've got to get my notes together because we were using them in the previous session. COVID was a trial of controls. And what this bill does, it gives further control to the Secretary of the Federal Health Department. Sweeping powers. In, in the TGA bill, sorry, the TGA bill, there are sweeping powers to the Secretary of the Federal Health Department. And what troubles me is what they are trying to do, which is to completely abolish the drug approval process and all the safety testing that goes along with that. Now we want to coerce employers into vaccine mandates with these controls in this bill. After decades of simulations and preparation, we had, which included APRA being set up in 2008, we had control of the medical system in enabling vaccine mandates in this country. We've just survived the United Nations World Health Organization's attempt to have international health regulations. And that was defeated because of a grassroots movement which we were proudly part of around the world, not just us, but around the world. We're now facing down the barrel of the United Nations World Health Organization pandemic treaty. And what you're doing with the TGA bill and with this bill is you're setting them up for foreign entities, the UN World Health Organization, to come in here and take over. That's part of the eternal battle of human battle of control versus freedom. Always one nation is on the side of freedom. We've seen so far the United Nations World Economic Forum Alliance on the side of control, pushing through Greens policies that Labor adopts and the LNP adopts. Energy, climate, killing our economy and our country's future. COVID, killing our country, killing people, thousands of people, killing our economy. Water, stealing rights, uh, stealing rights to, to use, wa use water, stealing rights to use property, contradicting the data. What we have here is enablement of mandates so that employers will be forced to mandate treatments. And they'll face serious fines if they don't. We have two amendments to protect employers and remove vaccine mandates. If they pass, we will support this bill. If they do not, we will vote against it. So let me tell you something. Some people say, ask, am I anti-vax? I am quite clearly not anti-vax. I am pro-medicine. We all want safe treatment. We all are pro-medicine. We all each decide what is put into our body. We all want freedom to each make our choice and for that choice to be accepted. We all wholeheartedly support medicines that are fully tested and proven safe 
effective, affordable and preferably available. But I am completely opposed to untested drugs, making it mandatory to take an untested drug to engage in life and earning a living. What's worse, stopping our children from eating because the breadwinner is, is out of work due to a vaccine mandate. If you want to eat, then you'll have to take this shot. So we totally oppose coercion. We totally are anti-mandate. We are pro-choice, freedom of choice. And I'm happy to be the placebo on any of these tests. The Labor, Liberal Nationals and the Greens have confirmed they're pushing control. We saw the Liberal Nationals push vaccine mandates, enable vaccine mandates, drive vaccine mandates in the last parliament. Now we're seeing Labor do it through, the, do the, through workplace health and safety. We will continue to work for workers, small, medium enterprise businesses. We will fight for workers' rights and we'll fight for families. We will oppose this bill unless our amendments get through. We will continue to support our sovereignty. We will continue to support our economic security. We will continue to support honest governance based on solid data and facts. We will oppose this bill unless the amendments are satisfactory. Thank you. Senator Payman. Acting Deputy President, I rise to support this bill. In 2018, Marie Boland conducted a review of model work health and safety laws. I acknowledge her considered examination and the families who have lost loved ones at work who spoke with or wrote to Ms Boland. Those families have fought tirelessly to improve the system that let them down to ensure other families don't have to face the same tragedy. Mary Boland's report provided 34 important recommendations. And unfortunately, not one of those requiring legislative change has been implemented by the Commonwealth because the former government let it languish. But this bill changes that. It is a shame that the former coalition government didn't manage to implement the report's recommendations, but not surprising because they have never been able to grasp the simple concept that workers deserve a safe workplace. To me and my Labor colleagues, understanding the importance of work health and safety comes easily. We naturally relate to understand the issues because of our own experiences, the experiences of our loved ones, and because we listen to workers and their representatives. However, for those on the other side of the chamber, this issue has not been a priority. Is it because they're out of touch with everyday Australians? Is it because of ideological stubbornness? This week, during question time, the opposition has been ranting and raving, trying to stir up fear in the community, all because of our proposal to make a modest change to the tax concessions on superannuation for those who have more than $3 million in their accounts. Where was this passion when the Boland report was handed down under your government? Why do we only see this level of hysteria now? Now, when it comes to this proposal that would not impact 99.5 per cent of Australians, but never when it concerns improving the work health and safety of workplaces across the country for millions of workers. Those on the other side could have risen to the moment, but instead have chosen to stoke fear and division and the only reason that comes to my mind is that they're completely out of touch with everyday Australians. Well, thankfully, the adults are back in charge and this government is putting the decade of division behind us to focus on improving the lives of all Australians. This bill is just the first step of these important reforms from the Boland Review because the Albanese government is taking work health and safety seriously. The health and safety of workers is something that I and every Labor member and senator will always prioritise. Throughout our party's history, we have always prioritised workers' safety and it is central to our existence. Every worker has the right to a safe workplace, free from mistreatment and to come home to their loved ones. I remember when my father worked tirelessly around the clock to put food on the table for my family and the mistreatment he spoke of at times. 
He has worked in hospitality as a kitchen hand, as a security guard, a taxi driver, a cleaner, you name it. English was not his first language, and yet when he arrived to this country with the clothes on his back, on a boat, he worked hard to establish a life for us that he wasn't able to have. And he wasn't going to let language barriers get in the way of that. A life of peace and security in a country full of opportunities for his young, growing family is what he aspired towards. Little did he know that it wasn't going to be as easy as that. He was paid below the minimum wage and often asked to work ridiculously long hours. But Dad didn't complain. He was asked to complete dangerous tasks that posed a threat to his health and well-being, but Dad didn't complain. The imbalance of power that my dad experienced often meant he was tolerating and copying the mistreatment and abuse from his employer, but Dad didn't complain. Perhaps he didn't know who to turn to for help. His only focus was putting food on the table, roof over our heads, and paying for our education. Was he asking for too much? Did he deserve that poor treatment? Isn't aspiring for a better future something every Australian family dreams about and have the right to do so? I remember asking him why he wouldn't quit and find another job, and all Dad would say is, I accept this hardship so that you, don't, so you can focus on your studies, get into a profession with job security, and you don't have to go through what I'm going through. So I'll never forget my Dad's sacrifices and honour his struggles. And it wasn't long before I realised that my dad wasn't alone in his struggles. During my time as an organiser for United Workers Union, I saw the, his experience reflected in the lives of many workers, from cleaners to hospitality workers and everything in between. As an organiser, I spent my time fighting for improvements for workers' rights and conditions, including standing with aged care workers when they went on strike for a pay rise. I heard so many heartbreaking stories from these dedicated workers who have served our nation's most vulnerable and elderly for so long. After 48 years as an aged care worker, Jude Clark was tired of the jobs cuts, hours cuts, workloads increased and a high turn turnover of staff um, with less, less care hours and obviously more profits for CEOs. She believed workers and the elderly taken care of deserved respect dignity and time. And she would say, the residents should never be hurried or told to wait because I'm too busy. We as workers deserve more time to say our hellos and our last goodbyes. Sometimes we are the only family these residents have. Is that too much to ask for? And after being assaulted by a high care dementia resident, another worker, Emma Bowers, was left traumatised and could not return to work. Even though the cut had healed, the damage was done. She recalled, I was tending to a male patient in the high care dementia ward at an aged care facility when I was assaulted. Hit on my forehead and I only realised I was injured when I saw blood flowing down my face. My initial thought of concern was towards the resident to make sure he is safe and not her. This was due to the understaffing of that facility. And she goes on to say, if we had enough staff, we would not be put in situations where our health and safety is at risk. These are just two examples of workers' struggles out of the thousands who are going through this every day and deserve our attention. And now as a Labor senator, I am so proud to be part of the team that delivered a pay rise for those workers and the team committed to fixing aged care under the leadership of Minister Annika Wells. I acknowledge the years of campaigning from United Workers Union members and the dedication of the union members across the country to improving workplace, healthy, workplace health and safety. This brings me to also recall the conversations I had last year in August with workers from Pfizer manufacturing facility in Western Australia. They were on strike for 24 hours asking for only sixty an hour pay rise from Pfizer, who paid their Victorian counterparts significantly more. So surely they weren't asking for anything outrageous. Many workers have been working at that facility for over a decade and have, having to fight against casualising the workforce. And I spoke to Chippo, Raymond and Tariq, who explained that workers relied on penalty rates and overtime to be able to make ends meet. They have to work at 
long hours t uh, to keep them away from their families. When they're home, they're exhausted, they struggle to sleep and have no energy to spend time with their children. Exhaustion is not a healthy state to return to work, and their health is on the line, but so is the health of millions of Australians who rely on these Pfizer workers. My central belief that all workers deserve safe and secure jobs is what drove me to become politically active, and I know that my Labor colleagues share the same belief. Workplaces that allow consultation and cooperation, that have a culture of fairness, that respect diversity and promote equality, are healthy and safe workplaces. So far, we have passed the Secure Jobs Better Pay legislation and implemented the recommendations of the Respect at Work report to eliminate sexual harassment in the workplace. Importantly, placing the positive duty on employers to make sure their workplaces are free from victimisation, bullying and harassment. We are completely on the side of workers, and we know this requires our ongoing attention. Ultimately, we want to ensure that everyone who goes to work can come home safely, and we are dedicated to that mission. This bill will make amendments to align the Commonwealth Work Health and Safety Act with the recently amended Model Work Health and Safety Act published by Safe Work Australia, as recommended by the Boland Review. It will strengthen and promote a consistent national approach to managing work health and safety and will ensure that Safe Work Australia can receive relevant information to perform its research and policy development roles. It demonstrates that we are committed to ensuring all Australians are protected by consistent work health and safety conditions. This bill expands the most serious offence under the Commonwealth's current work health and safety laws to include negligence as a fault element. This means that employees who expose their workers to serious risks that are both reckless and grossly negligent will face the most serious consequences. This bill will also prevent someone required to pay a penalty un under the law from recovering the penalty under insurance, which means that businesses cannot simply build in, work, um, build in serious work health and safety incidents into the cost of doing business, because the well-being of every worker should be a top priority for employers, and businesses should not be able to build into budgets the cost of an unsafe workplace this will ensure work health and safety remains at the forefront for employers and is taken seriously. This being an important set of reforms from the Boland Review, and while this bill does not implement an industrial manslaughter offence or increase penalties for work health and safety offences, which were recommended in the Boland Review, the Labor Party remains committed to that reform. And I want to acknowledge Minister Tony Burke's effort leadership and work in this area. This government is serious about improving work health and safety in Australia because we know that even one death is too many. The risk of an unsafe workplace is too great to be tolerated, and we know that it can destroy a person's life and the lives of their loved ones. There is more work to do, and this bill is just the start of the reforms that will have a positive impact on the safety of Australian workers and their workplaces. We're getting on with the job, not wasting a single second, because as a Labor government, we are dedicated to delivering safe workplaces for all Australians. Every person elected to this place should support this bill, because we should all be able to agree that improving the work health and safety for Australians is a good thing and that every worker should be able to go to work and come home to their loved ones safely. I am very proud to have come from a union background, to have become politically active fighting for workers' rights. I'm also proud to have been elected as part of the Albanese Labor government, to be trusted by Western Australians, to build a better future for all. And so I'm proud to support this bill. Thank you. Senator Babette. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Now I rise here to speak regarding the Work, Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022. Now, this bill provides a perfect opportunity for our parliament, all of us here, to do a to remedy, to remedy a great injustice. Now that injustice is the injustice of vaccine mandates. Now for too long in our country, for, for much too long, hard-working Australians have been discriminated against by employers, by authorities, by everyone really, who are, and these employers are, these employees, I should say, are dedicated, they're highly skilled Australians, and you know what's happened? They've been shut out of careers that they love. That's what's happened, just completely shut out. Careers they have given long, dedicated years of service to, as an example, nurses, teachers, firefighters, volunteers. I'm sure you've all seen uh, in the past where volunteers weren't able to go and fill sandbags because they weren't vaccinated. Ridiculous. Now, we've created division amongst our people, an unneeded division, which has torn apart family members, friends, colleagues, even strangers. Now, the Australian Human Rights Commission states, and I'll quote from them, they state, the guiding human rights principles for considering measures taken to advance public health are, they must be reasonable, necessary and proportionate. They must take into account the potential for discrimination Mandatory vaccination policies and the accompanying use of vaccine passports and certificates have significant implications for freedom of movement, of association and access to everyday goods and services, privacy and autonomy and equity and discrimination. Vaccine passports and certificates are more likely to be consistent with human rights principles when they are used as a tool to ease more burdensome lockdown restrictions and improve public health outcomes. That ends the quote there. Now, I ask you all in this place to think long and hard about the words that I just quoted direct from our Human Rights Commission. Mandates are an egregious abuse of basic human rights, and this bill it provides an opportunity to prohibit mandates once and for all. Why have mandates been put in place? Apparently in the name of science, apparently. We were told that mRNA injection uh, through mandates were necessary to stop transmission and to end the pandemic. That's what we were told. We were told that uh, it would save lives and that it was the only solution. That's what was said. Now, a study funded by none other than the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and published in The Lancet found that the level of protection from past infection is at least equivalent to, if not greater, than two doses of mRNA vaccine. And I use the term vaccine loosely. Now, these COVID vaccines have potentially dangerous side effects, and I keep harping on about this every chance I get. You've all heard me talk about it before. Now, as Dr. Marty Macari, Professor of Surgery and Health Policy at John Hopkins University, said in a sworn statement, or said in a sworn testimony, before the United States House Select Subcommittee, is what he said, and I'll quote him. He said, myocarditis is six to 28 times more common after the COVID vaccine than after COVID infection among 16 to 24 year old males. Myocarditis. Senator Babette, I'll have to interrupt you there because the time for this uh, debate has expired and you will be in continuance later on. Pursuant to order, I call on Minister Gallagher to provide an explanation relating to an order for production of the current budget process operational rules. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Senator, and I welcome the opportunity to explain uh, to the Senate uh, why the government is not able to release the budget process operational rules as the, at this time and also um, acknowledge the Senate that we did release the last um, B pause, as they're called, after the October budget as a sign of, account of transparency and accountability. The information was made public and I have signalled that the government would be in a position to consider doing so again after the May budget when it's finalised. 
What the Senate has asked for is something that has never been asked for in this place before and something the government, the former the opposition when in government never ever ever did, uh, was to provide the budget operational rules together before the budget is finalised. I've said before that I think this is unreasonable. I maintain that position. I understand um, why the opposition might form the, the view that they should be released, despite it never having done so or considered it relevant when they were in power. But I, I would urge others who have supported this um, order for production of documents, um, especially the Greens, to consider the fact that we are trying to be more transparent and accountable that, than the, former, um, the current opposition and former government ever was. We have provided this information once the budget was finalised, and we've said that we would look to do so again. But we do believe that it's unreasonable whilst the budget is being put together at this time. The document directly informs Cabinet and ERC decisions. Um, and uh, I think there are very strong reasons why, especially when we have foreshadowed that we would look to release them once the budget is finalised, that it's not uh, reasonable or fair, and in fact it's deeply hypocritical from those opposite to, to uh, seek th that document uh, before the budget's finalised. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume. Deputy President, I rise to take note of the explanation given by the Minister for Finance. Well, how quickly the gloss comes off a Labor government, how quickly the rhetoric, the rhetoric of opposition, the rhetoric of opposition gives way to the political expediency of Labor government. There was certainly not a Order. conversation, a lot of talk from Minister Gallagher about transparency, about openness. Indeed, it was only in October last year that she actually said, and I will quote, that transparency is a core part of APS business, a core part of APS business, Minister Gallagher. Well, indeed, in this spirit, I have to admit, I, I, you know, I credit where it is due, I was encouraged. I was encouraged that when the Senate ordered uh, the production of documents, agreed to the order of production of documents uh, number 87, which sought the budget process operation rules, the government provided them to the Senate. The government provided them, and so convincing had those proclamations of a new style of politics um, and, and new levels of transparency, so convincing had those proclamations been that for a moment even I almost believed them. But it only lasted a moment because it's very concerning that the moment that those rules were updated, well, Minister Gallagher changed tack. And in fact, instead of providing them, she then told the Senate the BPOS govern the consideration of policies that are being brought forward in the 23-24 budget process, which has commenced, a line that she has repeated just now. She claimed that, the doc that those documents would divulge deliberations of Cabinet and then sought public interest immunity from the order. Well, that is Minister Gallagher's right, don't get me wrong, to make that public interest immunity claim. However, when a public interest immunity claim is made, it is fundamental that it is genuine. It's fundamental that it is consistent. Indeed, it is a test of honesty and integrity that it is so. And with that in mind, I note that evidence provided at Senate estimates from Minister Gallagher's own department confirming that the documents that we have requested are not classified cabinet in confidence documents, but rather official sensitive. Now, that is a lower classification. And it is a significantly different classification. Senator Gallagher said herself at Senate estimates, we are putting that budget together. My preference is that we don't release them once we're doing that, with a view, I think I said this in the Senate, that once that process is complete, I would be in a position to release them to the Senate. But this process is entirely inconsistent with the approach that Senator Gallagher took in November last year. She then admitted that the BPOR documents provided to the Senate on the 28th of November were in fact in operation at the time that they were tabled. They were in operation at that time. So what has changed between November last year and February this year? What has changed? 
that is entirely inconsistent with the reason that the minister has just provided the Senate. And I asked departmental officials at those estimates when the new rules, that is the rules that were replacing the version that were tabled on the 28th of November, were approved. That was early December was the evidence that was provided. And I asked if there was any vacuum in time when the old rules ceased to operate and the new ones came into effect. And Senator Gallagher confirmed that this was not the case. So therefore, we know that the rules tabled in the Senate on the 28th of November were operating at least at, at, until at least early December. So it is totally laughable to claim that the minister cannot now table the new version of the BPAWs as they're currently in use, because she has confirmed that the previous BPAWs were being used at the time that she tabled them. Yep. So what has changed, Acting Deputy President? What has changed? This is a document that was previously handed over with no hesitation at all, but now, all of a sudden, the government has decided that it won't hand it over anymore. Now, that change of tack is surely no coincidence. Once again, we've seen that Labor is very happy to say one thing about transparency when it suits them, but another thing about transparency when it doesn't suit them. Just as the government starts to break its promises on no changes to super, on no changes to taxation, on no changes to franking credits, Minister Gallagher has suddenly decided that budget transparency is also no longer important. What a surprise that might be. This is a government that doesn't take managing the budget seriously, and so it's afraid to budget. It's afraid to publish its budget rules because it doesn't want to be publicly held to the standard that it's apparently setting itself. They have dumped the objective of a balanced budget from their fiscal strategy. It was gone. Nowhere in the last budget did the words say, we are going to bring the budget back into balance. Nowhere, not once in the budget documents. It's been decades since that phrase, or even an implication of that phrase, was absent from budget documents. It's nowhere to be seen. They have ditched the tax to GDP ratio, so there's no handbrake on taxes. Let her rip. Let her rip on taxes. There's no handbrake. There's no rules. It's part of their plan to let bracket creep eat into the wages of Australians to help prop up the budget. They won't rein in spending, so that's why the RBA is being forced to do all the heavy lifting on interest rates, which is hitting everyday Australians in the hip pocket. And yet they have the audacity to point to uh, the governor of the RBA and say it's all his fault. Higher mortgage rates, higher energy bills, higher grocery prices, this is what this government has delivered, and let's not forget higher taxes. Because perhaps the reason the government doesn't want to release their budget rules is because there is no offset rule anymore. That's disappeared from the budget process rules. Or is there, um, or there, uh, the rule is there potentially, but maybe it's just so flagrantly ignored that it's meaningless. Perhaps that's the case. Labor announced $23 billion in additional spending, and we expect to see a hell of a lot more. Sorry, Acting, De Acting Deputy President. Um, we expect to see an awful lot more where that came from in the May budget. Now, how will they fund all that spending? Certainly not with making the hard calls about reducing expenditure. It's with taxes. It's with doubling of the super tax. It's with new franking credits taxed by stealth. It's by removing the personal income tax cuts that they tried to oppose at the time. This is a government that does not keep its promises. We've said that we have no intention of making any changes to super taxes, said Anthony Albanese in May 2022. We've made it very clear, Kieran, that we don't have any proposals for tax increases, said Jim Chalmers in April 2022. These promises clearly mean nothing to Labor. They don't mean much to Senator Gallagher, clearly, or to the Treasurer or to the Prime Minister, but they mean an awful lot to Australians that are planning for their retirement. They mean something to the recent retiree who sold a business and is putting the proceeds in their self-managed super fund and is now finding that they're going to be charged tax twice. They mean something to a farmer that transferred their farm into their super fund that's suddenly looking how to find cash to pay for unrealised capital gains for the first time. We knew that they would say anything to be elected, and they did. 
This is the same Jim Chalmers that said he was pleased and proud of the high taxing agenda that Labor took to the 2019 election. Labor is clearly happy to say one thing and to do another. In the case of the BPORs, Labor is happy to set the standard but then not abide by it. Australians are sick of the double standards. They are sick of the double speak. They're sick of broken promises, of having no intention to do something but then going ahead and doing the exact opposite, only months, months labour, having no proposals to do something but then going ahead and doing the exact opposite, less than a year later, whether it be on transparency, whether it be on reducing the cost of living, Labor is happy to say one thing and do another. And who suffers for this? Who suffers for this? It's the ordinary Australians that felt that they were doing the right thing, that trusted the Labor opposition and when they said we were going to make no changes to taxes, who trusted the Labor opposition when they said they were going to make no changes to super, who trusted a Labor opposition when they said we have no interest in taking your franking credits away. They trusted you. They trusted you and you duped them. You duped them. And they have a right to be disappointed. Now, whether it be on transparency, whether it be on the cost of living, while you may be happy to say one thing and do another, you may do that. But in the coalition, we are committed to holding you to account for the commitments that you have made. And we will continue to do that every single day until you stick to your promises. Thank you, uh, Senator Hume. Senator Brockman. On the same matter, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. I too rise to take note of the ministerial response. And we have a great deal of accountability hypocrisy from those on the other side. Accountability hypocrisy. The B pause, a, a pretty arcane document, I think it's fair to say. I think not probably many people listening to this broadcast would know what the B pause are. There uh, might even be one or two people sitting in this chamber today who don't know what the BPORs are, uh, the budget, process, budget operational process rules. Um, sadly, I do. Uh, I, I had some encounter with them uh, in a previous life as a staffer for the finance minister, so I do, I do know what the BPORs are. And the easiest way to explain them, I think, to the Australian people is they are the guide rails. They're the guide rails for the departments, for the ministers who are developing uh, a, a budget to stay within. They're the rules for the budget. It's pretty simple if you think about them that way. And what we saw when Senator Hume was able to have uh, the government release the B pause for their first budget was that there were some pretty significant changes in there. It revealed that the Labor government had ditched the offset, um, the requirement to offset new expenditure for election commitments, uh, removed the coalition's government's tax to GDP cap of 23.9 per cent from the fiscal strategy, also removed the cap on APS growth in Canberra. So we see from the information that we got from the first release of the BPORs that these make a real difference. And so now we've got this change of position from the Labor government, where just a few months ago they were willing to release the budget rules, and now they're not. And so I think the question the Australian people should rightly be asking of this government is why? Why? If they've changed the budget guidelines, why won't they tell? If they've changed the rules governing the, the, the construction of their next budget, why won't they tell the Australian people how they've changed those rules? That's pretty straightforward. That's honesty. That's transparency. And remember, we've got a, we've got a Prime Minister that came in on, on a very clear set of promises regarding transparency. Couldn't be more clear than this. Anthony Albanese, quote, transparency is always a good idea. Another quote. Well, what we need is transparency, and I want politics to be cleaned up. This is my favourite. 
The Albanese government is committed to honesty, integrity, honesty and accountability, and ministers in my government, including assistant ministers, will observe standards of probity, governance and behaviour worthy of the Australian people. So why? So why? If those opposite are holding themselves to that standard, did, under pressure from Senator Hume, release the B pause just a few short months ago, the budget rules just a few short months ago, and now when they've acknowledged they've changed those rules, they've acknowledged they've changed the guardrails, they've changed the guardrails which govern how the budget is put together, they won't come clean. They won't come clean with how they've changed those guide rails. And sadly, this is, this is now becoming a pattern with this government. And you, wonder, you, ha you have to wonder, Senator Hume, whether, whether the release last year was actually an accident. Was it, was it because it was a government on training wheels? Was it, it because it was a government that wanted to try and stay within its promises for a little while anyway? Um, I suspect a little of all of the above. But the guide rails that they have now changed secretly and won't release are very important to the Australian people because they're seeing a pattern from this government. They're seeing a pattern. They're seeing a government that talks a lot about transparency and accountability, but they're accountability hypocrites. They have accountability hypocrisy built into their DNA. So we've seen you know, changes to the transparency of super funds, which was one of the first actions of this government. I mean, why? Why was that? Coming into government, one of the first things they had to do was reduce the amount of transparency within super funds. I mean, you, you, you have to question what this government's motivations actually are. And instead, we see a government that is attempting to keep quiet whenever they can information that will be damaging to them. And as they put together this budget, as they put together what is going to be a very important budget for the Australian people at a time of rising inflation, rising interest rates, uh, this budget is a very, very important one to craft in the interests of the Australian people. And these budget rules are the guide rails, are the guide rails for that budget process. It's vital to know that those guide rails are set correctly. We've seen the government expecting the RBA to do all the heavy lifting uh, in terms of inflation. And so we've seen the fastest rate of interest rate rises pretty much in the history of Australia. Uh, we've seen mortgage interest rates on the average home go up to an extraordinary degree where, where the average homeowner is, is paying uh, almost $1,000. It might be over $1,000 now, uh, more for their uh, home loan interest every month. Uh, it, it's a situation where the government has done nothing th through its levers of power to take pressure off those interest rate rises and to assist the Reserve Bank in controlling inflation. Inflation is a scourge. Anyone, anyone who uh, lived through the 70s and 80s knows the scourge of inflation. Um, now, sadly, I'm old enough to, to remember them. Senator Scar, I think you probably do as well. Um, and, and the scourge of inflation, um, persistent inflation, is, is, is absolutely devastating. Uh, I can remember certainly on uh, my uh, parents' family farm back in the 70s the sheer financial pressure that was put on them through a combination of high inflation and relatively high interest rates at the time. And the government does have things they can do. They've done absolutely nothing so far, but the government does have things they can do. And putting the correct guide rails in place for the upcoming budget would actually assist them in doing that. Now, have they done that? We don't know. Senator Scar, we don't have a clue because the government is now not releasing its budget rules, even though just five months ago they did. Five months ago, when those rules were still active, as Senator Hume has said, those rules were still in place when they were released five months ago. And they were, they were released to this parliament, as they should have been. And now Senator Hume uh, has quite rightly asked for the rules at the moment. We know the rules have changed. We know the rules have changed. 
and we want to know how the rules have changed. What has the government done to the budget rules in the lead up to a really very important budget for this nation? I mean, we've got the Reserve Bank doing all the heavy lifting on inflation. We've got this government doing absolutely nothing to tackle inflation, to tackle the cost of living crisis faced by families. Instead, we've got them out there lifting tax on superannuation, something they promised not to do, something they very clearly not to do. Changes to the franking credit, Senator Scar. Uh, I'll take that interjection, even though it's disorderly. Um, it's in very intelligent. Um, changes to the franking credits. So we see the government without a clue about how to tackle the current pressure that's on the Australian economy. Showing us these guide rails, showing us these budget rules will help the Australian people understand just how this government is going to tackle those things. And I suspect they won't release them because they don't have a clue. Are there any other senators who wish to speak in this debate? Uh, so the question is, the Senate take note of the explanation. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Is a division? No division required. So normally you vote yes, but you take, we take just as a statement of fact that we've taken note of it. I call it for the eyes. No division required. Uh, I think I call on the clerk. Government business order of the day number two: Work, Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022. Resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Senator Babbitt, would you like to continue your remarks? Yes, please. I absolutely would <laughs> like to continue my remarks. Now, where was I? When I was speaking before, I was talking about myocarditis. Myocarditis. I've been speaking about this since I first stepped into this place. Six to 28 times more common after, after the COVID vaccine than after COVID infection in males between 16 to 24 years of age. Now, it is critical that a system of, wealth, of work, health and safety derived from this legislation minimises the potential for harm to workers, of course. Now, what we know and what every employer in the country should know by now, should know by now, is that mRNA vaccines can cause injuries, and indeed they do. Myocarditis, pericarditis, Bell's palsy and neurological conditions. Now, these are serious adverse events that could result in lost time injury attributed to mandated workplace mRNA vaccinations. Now, every workplace must strive for the protection of its workers. Every, every single workplace must take into account the inherent risk posed by mandating mRNA vaccines. Now, this bill, as it stands, unfortunately, it fails to address the biggest elephant in the room in relation to workplace health and safety. Let's not let this opportunity go to waste. Let's get that amendment in there. Let's protect people from mandates, although I suspect that many in this place will not do that. Thank you. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I'd like to start by thanking senators for their contributions to the debate on the Workplace Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022. The bill is a first step towards achieving safer and healthier workplaces in the Commonwealth jurisdiction. There is still a long way to go. The bill before us implements some important recommendations from the review of the model workplace, uh, model work health and safety law conducted by uh, Mari Boland in 2018. 
Safe Work Australia undertook expensive tripartite consul consultation seeking feedback on implementing key recommendations of the Boland Review. In June 2022, the model work health and safety law was amended in line with this process. This bill will bring the Commonwealth Work Health and Safety Act 2011 into line with these updates. There are two changes in particular I draw to the attention of the Senate. New fault element for Category 1 offences. Um, first, the bill amends the fault elements for the most serious work health and safety offence to include gross negligence or negligence to the criminal standard in addition to recklessness. The Boland Review found there had been very few successful prosecutions in part due to the difficulties associated with proving recklessness. The government is acting on genuine community concerns that employers who put their workers at risk of danger through grossly, ne grossly negligent conduct can escape punishment because the bar for conviction is set too high. Now both reckless and grossly negligent employers who expose workers to serious risk can face the most serious consequences and penalties. The second one is prohibiting insurance for work health and safety penalties. So the bill prohibits a person from taking insurance to recover payments made on penalties imposed under work health and safety laws. Having insurance means that you effectively end up in a situation where the penalty is no longer necessarily a dis disincentive for the employer. The penalty is removed because it's something that's been insured against anyway. We need to make sure that the penalties that are there have an impact on behaviour. Work health and safety offences must remain serious deterrents and they cannot become the cost of doing business. Those who owe a work health and safety duty should not be able to insulate themselves from the consequences of breaching their duty by putting the safety of their workers and public at risk. The government is committed to working closely with the states and territories to deliver safe workplaces for all Australians. This bill takes a first step towards achieving safer and healthier workplaces in the Commonwealth jurisdiction. There is still a lot left to do. Australian workers deserve to be able to go to work and come home safely to their loved ones. I thank all senators who have spoken in support of this legislation and I commend the bill to the Senate. So the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Stubridge be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to work, health and safety and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The qu Uh, Senator Roberts. Yeah, I, I'd like to move my amendment um, on sheet 1842. But I also have a question. We have an amendment on sheet 1839 that's not on the run sheet. Senator Roberts, are you seeking leave to move them together? No, I, I'd, I'd just like to do. I'd like to find out where 1839 is because it's not on the run sheet. Uh, it hasn't been circulated, Senator Roberts. Well, then I'll move the uh, amendment in, in Senator Hanson in our party name uh, on sheet number 1842. Is leave granted for them to be moved together? 
Okay. Leave is granted. Does he want to speak to it? Senator Roberts, do you want to speak to your amendment? No, I just want to move it. Thank you. Senator Chisholm? Uh, just indicating that the government will be opposing this amendment. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And just in relation to the coalition's position uh, on the amendment, whilst I understand the intent of the amendment, uh, what it will do is mean there are no exceptions to the banning of insurance or indemnity from work health and safety penalties. Uh, the coalition can't support the amendment. The reasons being the main object of the Model Work Health and Safety Act is to provide for a balanced and nationally consistent framework to secure the health and safety of workers and workplaces. The amendment would mean that the Commonwealth is actually departing from the concept of the model work health and safety laws. I note that the Victorian government in their legislation that passed in 2021 and the New South Wales government in their legislation that passed in 2020 both have used similar wording to what is presented in this bill on the basis that what we want to see is that national consistency. Um, it is important for employers and employees that we continue to provide the nationally consistent framework of work health and safety laws and regulations. Senator Roberts. I, I move this amendment because the bill contains a reversal of burden of proof. So that's, that's, we cannot accept that. And without that, uh, we're not going to support the bill. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, Senator Babbitt, are you going to move the other sheet? Yes, uh, I move the amendment. Um, I'd like to move the amendment circulated in my name, sheet uh, 1848. Uh, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, yes, I do. I'll say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Senator Babbitt, you have the call. Look, um, you know, I've been in this place uh, obviously not as long as many of you here have, and I campaigned very, very strongly on the issue of vaccine mandates. You know, people out there are hurting, people are injured. And despite the fact that the bureaucracy and the government, even the, some in the opposition, would like to cover it up, it can't be covered up for long. A day of reckoning is coming. A day of reckoning is coming. And uh, you, you have a chance to be on the right side of history. Start speaking up. Uh, start standing up for the people out there that have been hurt by big, by big Pharma. These guys are corrupt. These guys are dodgy. Uh, these guys lie to all of us in this place. You know, admit that. Admit that. Uh, that that uh, you were misled and that you were wrong and do the right thing. Thank you. Senator Chisholm. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the government uh, will be opposing this amendment. Um, we believe the Fair Work Act's existing framework provides sufficient protection from COVID-19 vaccination discrimination and strikes an appropriate balance between protecting the rights of workers who are not vaccinated against COVID-19 in protecting public health and protecting the rights of workers vulnerable to, be, vulnerable to being affected with COVID-19 as well. Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Adam Mack and Deputy Chair. And I'd just like to talk to this amendment as well. Uh, and I'd like to start off by noting that just this week, the former Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, member for Cork, said that when he was Prime Minister, uh, the advice was, was that mandates was that mandates weren't necessary, weren't advised in any setting other than health settings. So the question is, why do we have mandates, and why are employers imposing mandates that weren't actually the advice of the government medical authorities themselves? So that in itself shows that these mandates are completely unnecessary. Uh, we've also got evidence from the FDA. They themselves admitted in December 2020 that there is no evidence that the actual vaccine stopped transmission. Now, we've subsequently found out not only did they not stop transmission, they haven't stopped infection. 
So what is the purpose of discriminating against people in the, in the workplace uh, if it doesn't actually stop people from getting sick? Now, if you look at the initial outbreak of COVID and, and COVID generally, the people who were most at risk were older people who weren't working. In that working age population where people were healthy, there was a very low risk of actually getting seriously ill from COVID. So why have we gone out and imposed all these draconian mandates and the lockdowns and, every, and the border closures and everything like that earlier on? Why are we still here in March 2023, two years after the start of the vaccine rollout, imposing these mandates? They are completely pointless. But not only are they completely pointless, they are cruel and unnecessary. Because for the last 18 months, from about late October onwards, I have daily received messages from people who are injured by the vaccine. Across, and a lot of these injuries are in people who were healthy and young and would not have necessarily been seriously ill from the COVID vaccine. There are also people who had pre-existing conditions, and I'm referring here to Natalie Boyce, uh, who you know, had an antiphospholipid syndrome condition, who was actually at risk from taking the vaccine who is actually at risk from taking the vaccine, because the vaccine uses phospholipids, uh, both in its uh, lipid nanoparticle that in encapsulates the spike protein, or the mRNA that codes for the spike protein, and then yet again, when it crosses the cell membrane, the membrane, the cell membrane is also made up of phospholipids. So why on earth, and we know that when the uh, trials were carried out, that they weren't uh, done, uh, performed with people, uh, who have uh, immune um, conditions. So it is, it is a great risk. We are putting uh, healthy working people at great risk by imposing mandates on them. And a lot of these mandates, I might add, are actually out of date because a lot of these mandates are actually saying that you can actually um, still work for us if you've had two shots. So there's people who would have got two shots back in August, November 2021. And even if you looked at the initial trial data, it was only good for about 35 days. Um, so th their uh, immunity has, has been completely, you know, from the vaccine, is no longer relevant anyway. So a lot of these mandates are just in place for the sake of imposing power, command and control, rather than actually doing anything substantial. But I want to highlight, because we keep hearing, and I noticed that Senator Chisholm said that these, we've got proper protections in place. Uh, around the COVID uh, vaccine. Well, I just want to touch on this non-clinical evaluation report yet again for the umpteenth time, because it seems to me the people in this chamber don't actually want to read it. Because if you actually read it, you would see how pointless these vaccine mandates are. And I'll just touch on, and this is the one um, that I think is really important to start off with. In their trials, it was shown that there was an almost similar microscopic lung inflation in in inflammation observed in both challenge control and immunised animals after peak of infections at day seven, day eight. In, a, in other words, they knew from the get-go that there was no difference between those people who were vaccinated, sorry, those animals, because they didn't test it in, in the people, those uh, animals that were vaccinated and those animals that weren't. But let's have a look at the risks that we're taking here. Now, we know what the risk from COVID was because we have over th well, about three years of data now, and we know that there is a very low risk of people under 60 of working, uh, healthy working age population of actually getting seriously ill from COVID. So here's the risk we're taking. The, you know, if we go on the initial trial data, there was no distribution or degradation data on the S antigen encoding mRNA. So in other words, we have gone and we've used an entirely new uh, form of vaccine and we've coded the mRNA, the, mRNA, the mRNA inside the lipid nanoparticle, codes for a spike protein, but they never tested how quickly it degrades in the body or how far it travels throughout the body. So, and that's very, very important for a couple of reasons, because a normal vaccine will stay in the shoulder because it's a much, much larger protein. I mean, I know the word gets thrown around a lot, the lipid nanoparticle, but it actually does mean something. It's one trillionth, one to the uh, power of negative nine. So it is a very, oh, sorry, one billion, sorry. Um, that is a very small molecule. And what that means is it can cross the endothelium, get in your uh, bloodstream and then travel throughout your body. And we know that because this paper shows that on page 44 
It increases throughout all the nearly all the body organs. In particular, I'll just concentrate on one of them. In women's ovaries, the concentration doubled from day one to day two, and then they stopped the trial. Then they stopped the trial. And women are born with only one set of eggs, oocytes, and they get inherited. They're passed by a generation. So to just recklessly impose this on our children uh, is just incredibly risky. And yet again, weigh it up against the risks of, of uh, COVID to children, where we know that they have very few ACE receptors on their cell, uh, versus the risk of actually what this can do. Because this is the other thing about this product, is that this product uses transfection. And unlike most natural uh, organisms or, or, or molecules in the body, they can only cross the cell membrane either with the use of an enzyme or the use of an ion channel. No, no, no. These act, this vaccine was designed, uh, and this is where the 30 years of research went in, with the lipid nanoparticle to cross a cell membrane without having to use an enzyme or an ion channel. And what that showed in here was that you've now got 60 to 80 per cent of infection of all cells in all organs. Okay, so your normal vaccine, your antibodies, you'll get the antigens in your shoulder and your antibodies will come in and they'll kill the foreign body in your shoulder. Okay? In this particular pathway, they are giving you a vaccine that travels throughout your body, can enter any cell, and then it'll take over your cell's ribosomes, which are the, uh, part of the organelles inside the, uh, the cell, that will produce the protein, a spike protein. And that will induce an autoimmune response. It'll create both B cells and T cells. Now, your B cells are okay, they're helper cells, they create antibodies to fight antigens. But your T cells, they're known as killer cells. They come in and they kill your own healthy cells. Okay? Yet again, we're exposing people to this risk. Okay? That is completely unnecessary. But not is it only completely unnecessary. It's incredibly dangerous if it goes wrong. Now, it won't happen to everyone because the fact of the matter is this product had to be stored at negative 70 degrees, which meant that by the time it left the TGA, and we know how much of the mRNA was degraded by the time it left the uh, TGA, which was about 40 per cent. So the studies, you know, the TGA, if you look at the batch results, about 40 per cent of the mRNA had already been degraded by the time it left the TGA. So I can assure you by the time it gets on the back of a truck and goes across the Australian roads or it's sitting in some esky out at Bunnings, most of it's degraded. So consider yourself lucky if you got it and you didn't get sick. But if you're one of those people who got a proper shot of it, uh, and you know, when I say the shot of it, that also is a bit of Russian roulette, because they put five doses in one vial. Now that again is how risky? Very risky, because fats don't necessarily uh, emulsify evenly. So if you read the instructions, you've got to sit there and you've got to tip this little uh, vial up and down 10 times. But you can't shake it because you'll degrade the mRNA. So you've got to do this slowly. Do you think they'd be doing this slowly in Bunnings when there was a cue to the football? I would doubt it. But if you're, if you're unlucky and let's say they don't turn it up and upside down 10 times and emulsify it properly, and you just happen to get the fatty bit on top, which has got the actual lipid nanoparticle, you could get the hot shot. You could get all five doses in one. But then again, you could also get another uh, random element to this, which is, if you actually read this document, the size of the lipid nanoparticle was between 45 nanometers and 180 nanometers. In other words, there is a variance within the lipid nanoparticles of 450 per cent. I mean, what sort of quality control is this? So I would ask that people do support this amendment. People have a right to choose what goes into their body, and they shouldn't be the plaything of unaccountable pharmaceuticals and bureaucrats. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. In light of the Acting Minister, Senator Chisholm's comments, I wish to, when he mentioned COVID, I wish to note and draw to the Senate's attention the bill that was passed this morning, the TGA bill, combined with this bill, make it impossible to dodge vaccine mandates. And I want to draw the attention of the Senate to two points. First of all, in an article by Adam Crichton in The Australian, who's the Washington correspondent for The Australian and News Corporation, an article headlined, US helped, COVID helped fund COVID-19, said the ex-CDC director, Robert Redfield. 
Robert, Dr. Robert Redfield is the former director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States, and a, a supposedly authoritative body. During a House Select Coronavirus Pandemic Subcommittee hearing on, quote, investigating the origins of COVID-19, that the deadly coronavirus was more likely the result of an accidental lab leak. Whoops! Those conspiracy theorists were right. The former head of the U.S. Center for Disease Control has told Congress the United States government likely helped fund the development of SARS-CoV-2, which he believed leaked from a Chinese lab in late 2019, ultimately killing more than six million people globally. Asked by Republican Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis whether American tax dollars funded the gain-of-function research that created the virus, Dr. Redfield, who was CDC director between 2018 and 2021, replied, I think it did. This is serious stuff. And he goes on to say, quotes in the paper, as a clinical virologist, I felt it was not scientifically plausible that this virus went from a bat to humans and became one of the most infectious viruses we have for humans. His testimony came a week after revelations the FBI and the US Department of Energy had assessed the lab leak theory, once dubbed a conspiracy theory, now where have I heard that before, to be the most likely explanation for the origin of the pandemic. Dr. Redfield, who was appointed by the Trump administration, said he had been sidelined early on by Dr. Fauci, where have I heard his name before, and National Institute of Health head, Dr. Frances Collins, where have I heard her name before? who Dr. Redfield said wanted to create a narrative that the virus emerged naturally. It's rubbish. The two hours of testimony and questioning by Democrat and Republican representatives of four expert witnesses on Wednesday centered around private emails from top US scientists to Dr. Fauci in late January, which suggested the new virus looked engineered, Senator Babbitt, and what may have prompted their subsequent about face. On February 4th, four of the scientists, among a group of 11, who had convened on a confidential conference call organised by Dr Fauci, from which the Centre for Disease Control, Dr Redfield Head, was excluded, claimed the lab leak idea was not feasible in a draft academic paper that became the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2, published in March. The CDC head did not even know there was a February 1 conference call until the Freedom of Information came out with the emails, and, I was and he said he was quite upset as a CDC director that I was excluded. One of the witnesses, Nicholas Wade, former, both former editor of Nature magazine and senior New York Times science writer, said the media had been used to establish the natural origin theory like this government has been used. He also pointed out the scientists, and remember this is a Democrat, who seemingly changed their mind over the course of a few days, later received an, a US $9 million grant from Dr. Fauci's NIAID in May 2020. This is serious stuff. Another witness, Dr. Jamie Metzl, said the idea the virus emerged from wet markets was never the most logical explanation. I'm a lifelong Democrat, he said. I consider myself a progressive person, but I couldn't find the justification for the strong arguments calling people like me investigating, looking into pandemic origins in good faith, conspiracy theorists. This smells. Both the TGA bill combined with this bill enable injection mandates. So let's have a think about what could be, who could be the beneficiaries here. Yesterday, oh, sorry, Tuesday, I discussed the fact that over the last 15 years, 47 market-leading drugs have aged out of patent, costing pharmaceutical companies $30 billion in a year in lost sales, including drugs that made up 42 per cent of Pfizer's drug revenue and 62 per cent of AstraZeneca's. This patent cliff is set to get worse with another 15 leading drugs nine of the world's top 20 selling drugs due to expire this decade. Pfizer will lose another $15 billion in annual sales. 
The only way to replace so much revenue is with a whole new class of drug, mRNA, not tested, thought to be dangerous, killing people in this country and globally. We've now seen that on the market with mandates that the, the former Prime Minister drove. The federal government drove the injection mandates in this country. He bought the, he bought the injections. He indemnified the states, he gave them to the states, he gave them access to the health data that enabled the states to, to mandate and to, to control the mandates. We are looking at something here being set up that is heinous. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I rise to, to speak in favour of this amendment uh, that is going forward here. It's, it was never the case that there was a justification for mandating uh, the coronavirus vaccine, and that is for the simple reason is that there was never any evidence that the vaccine stopped or prevented tr transmission in a material way. Uh, we know that now. We know that from evidence from Pfizer themselves, but we actually did know that at the time too. Despite some people's attempt to rewrite history, there was never any evidence pre presented uh, that the vaccine uh, for any of its other issues uh, uh, Senator Roberts has gone into, others have gone into, uh, there was never any evidence that it helped stop someone uh, contracting or transmitting uh, the coronavirus uh, disease. And that can be the only reason to mandate a medical treatment for someone or a vaccine for someone. Uh, we have got various mandates or some, some mandates in workplaces for vaccines. I was subject to one when I, work in a meat, when I worked in a meatworks. Uh, I had to get a Q fever vaccine uh, in the meatworks. But those vaccines have been tested and shown to work in that fashion. This one never had been, never had been. Uh, and I say that as someone who got the vaccination, I'm not arguing against it being of some benefit to, to some. Uh, although I think that was oversold too. But that's not the question here. The question is, should we force some Australians to get a medical treatment, treatment to keep their job? To keep their job. There is a, should be a fundamental right in this free country uh, to work to provide for your families. I would have thought my colleagues on the other side would understand that, that a basic human right is the right to work. The right to work, to earn a living so you can provide for your family. And uh, through uh, these last couple of years, uh, shamefully, this country has denied thousands of Australians that right to work, to provide for their family, because they wouldn't uh, take a vaccine that has only been invented in record time in the last few years and had questions about its side effects, benefits, etc. Certainly questions. And on top of that, forcing them to get that vaccine came of, to no benefit to anybody else who had got the vaccine or made a different decision. No benefit to anyone else. There was never any evidence of any benefit. Uh, and, and there was no evidence of that at the time. At the time, I remember in mid-2021, uh, when we were rolling out vaccines or starting to roll out here in Australia, uh, Dr Fauci in the United States admitted that the viral load uh, that uh, was evident in people with the vaccine and with coronavirus and those without a vaccine and with coronavirus was the same. It was exactly the same, with the same viral load. Uh, and then we learnt, we learnt just the other week in the European Parliament through testimony from Pfizer officials that they never even tested the vaccine uh, to prevent tra on whether it prevented transmission or not. Never tested it. Now, presumably, health officials either knew this or certainly should have known this. They should have asked it. Uh, we, we rely on our health officials uh, to subject uh, major large pharmaceutical companies to appropriate regulation and oversight, we would have expected uh, our health officials to have asked Pfizer, well, we're considering putting mandates or some government agencies are mandating this vaccine. Does it prevent transmission? Hopefully they would have asked them that question. And hopefully Pfizer would have been honest in saying that. Why, we, why didn't we have that information? Why didn't we get it? Until uh, too many people have had their lives destroyed and upturned by government decisions based on, on willful ignorance. Uh, it, is a, it is absolutely negligent uh, that our governments, our agencies and large corporations too uh, have not 
have failed to get adequate information about the effects of their own decisions which have destroyed people's lives in this country. Now, we still have mandates. Most mandates have gone because it's so clear right now. It is absolutely clear that they had no impact on transmission. We had the Omicron outbreak and uh, uh, we were one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. It, 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 spread, it, it, it spread like breeding rabbits through this country. There was nothing stopping it. Certainly the vaccine did not do that. Uh, so now most mandates have gone, thankfully, uh, despite their, their, their terrible impact over the past year. But they still do exist. They still do exist. We still have large companies uh, 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 imposing them uh, in, in a space I'm very familiar with, BHP. A large, one of the largest Australian companies still has a mandate to work at BHP. I know so many people who lost their job uh, because of that uh, completely unnecessary restriction. Uh, I, I believe I'm, told, I'm informed Telstra in retail shops. I'm in retail shops. The office workers are fine, apparently, but if you're, if you're a minimum wage or not much higher than minimum wage earning uh, retail uh, 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 manager in a, in a Telstra shop in, in Australia, you have to have the vaccine. Uh, uh, firefighters in New South Wales. Uh, have to have the vaccine. I met some of them uh, the other day. Terrible stories, you know, painful stories, hearing about people who have dedicated their lives to protect and serve their nation, protect our livelihoods through some of the most uh, difficult times in our country during bushfires. Uh, we don't protect them. We haven't protected them. Well, this, here, this amendment here is our opportunity to rectify uh, that, uh, uh, that, that shameful uh, decision that we have made over the past year or failed to make in favour of them. This amendment, very simply, just adds to the list of things you cannot be dismissed for or not employed for in the Fair Work Act, uh, a, uh, that you cannot be dismissed for not receiving just the COVID-19 vaccine, not other vaccines, just the COVID-19 vaccine, for the reasons I've outlined. Uh, you cannot be dismissed, dismissed rightly in this country from your job because of your sex, because of your gender, because of your religion, uh, uh, and you shouldn't be uh, sacked on this basis either. It should be a basic human right in this nation, and uh, this, the voting in favour of this amendment would allow us to rectify a gross injustice uh, that has fallen on so many Australians over the last couple of years. Uh, this bill that we're debating, the overall bill, is all about improving and protecting the health and safety of workers uh, in our workplaces. Admirable, admirable objective, and uh, a bill that the, the that coalition. Senator's support. Uh, well, we should also ensure that we do not have unnecessary regulations and restrictions on people that do not contribute or help uh, to the health and safety of the workplace. Uh, someone's individual health decisions uh, around their diet, around their exercise regime, are completely matters for themselves. It should have nothing to do with the employer. Your boss shouldn't tell you how many cheeseburgers you can eat. Uh, or how, how many gym sessions you have to do every week. That's got nothing to do with them. And a decision to get the COVID-19 vaccine or not falls into those categories. It is something for you to decide, for your individual health. It has no impact on someone else. It has no impact on your boss. It has no impact on your workers' colleagues. So why do we continue to allow a situation where large companies in this country can deny people employment uh, uh, because of their own inability to admit they were wrong. That's the stage we're at right now. We're at the stage of this where people are too proud to admit that they were wrong. They were wrong, clearly wrong. Now, I'm confident eventually these mandates will go. They'll, they'll die of neglect at some point. It's just a matter of how many more people are hurt in the interim. Well, let's swallow our pride now. Let's eat some humble pie. We all made mistakes in the last few years. These are some of the grossest ones. Let's rectify that and ensure we have proper standards in this country that protect people's rights at work. Uh, Senator Antic. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Look, I, I, I want to start by uh, uh, just picking up on some of the comments uh, of uh, Senator Canavan and congratulate him on moving this amendment. Obviously, I speak in support uh, of this amendment, and uh, I thank uh, uh, Senators Rennick, uh, Babbitt, and uh, Roberts as well for their support for this. And uh, really, what uh, what this represents uh, is uh, a moral lifeboat for this chamber, because um, as Senator Canavan has uh, has outlined in his uh, oratory, uh, we are seeing now uh, the business end of what we saw over the last two years in this country. I, I uh, come from uh, a lineage of uh, people from the former Yugoslavia, and my grandmother, uh, I believe, would have turned in her grave if she had seen what had become of the country 
that she, left, uh, she, she came to after leaving uh, communist Yugoslavia in, uh, in the 19, late 1940s. Um, people from the Eastern Bloc would stop me all the time uh, a year ago, 18 months ago, and say, we fled our country because of this sort of tyranny. We, we fled our country because of what was happening. Now, people uh, may laugh at that. They shouldn't, but they may. And those opposite have spent the better part of the last two years simply dismissing these claims as tinfoil hat-wearing conspiracy theories. Uh, now, none of us have found our tinfoil hats today. Senator Roberts has lost his. Senator Babbitt has left his in his office. But what you are seeing are people in this chamber who are very serious, who have picked this up early, who have understood the, the, the outrage of what has happened, the fact that there was never any justification, as Senator Canavan quite rightly says, for what we saw over the last two years, is 100 per cent true. We knew it at the time. Many of us knew it at the time. But there is now an opportunity which has afforded itself for people in this chamber to swallow their pride and understand that what they have been partied to has been wrong. And there was a time in this country where the left of politics, Labor and the Greens, used to stand for working people. And some of the stories that I've been uh, uh, accustomed to over the last two years uh, have been nothing short of heartbreaking. And I want to take the opportunity to let people uh, stand in the shoes of those who have lost their house, who have lost uh, their businesses, who have lost their life savings in some cases, simply for the heinous crime of refusing see if you can make this out refusing to take an experimental therapy which had never been tested before. Now, uh, we can hang on the issue of it was passed provisionally approved by the TGA. Think about what that actually means. This really wasn't tested at all. That is a fact. Uh, we are now seeing incredible instances, coincidences of the highest order of excess deaths, of uh, problems with pregnancies. Uh, people have been proven right. So I'm sorry to tell you all, you've all been had. The mainstream media have done a number on you like you've never seen before. Uh, you've fallen for it, but here's the thing. Here's the beautiful thing about this place is we're all ready to forgive, we're all ready to forget, and it's time that we moved on and allowed people to get back to work in this country. Senator Canavan outlined earlier very, very correctly uh, that we are living in a world where you can quite rightly not be discriminated against because of your race, because of your gender and because of a range of other issues. And yet somehow the decisions you make about your own medical care uh, do not have that kind of uh, protection. It is, it is quite extraordinary that we, still, we are still going down this path, particularly when there was never a case for mandates, as we have seen. We have seen it. The Premier, Dominic Perrottet, the Premier of New South Wales, made this observation last week. He has now said that transmission uh, is not affected by vaccination. You are not protecting grandma if you are taking this experimental therapy. You are not. You are not protecting your workmates. You, you are just simply not. There was never a case for it. But now the good news is this. We've got an opportunity for everyone to right the ship, take the moral lifeboat, support this amendment. Senator Cash. Uh, just very briefly, um, at this stage of the pandemic, COVID-19 vaccination mandates are not required, um, nor they are not needed, nor are they required in the overwhelming majority of Australian workplaces, and that is a good thing. The Australian people do not want to return to the restrictions we had at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is important, however, that medical advice determines whether a vaccination is needed in a particular workplace, whether it is for COVID-19 or any other disease. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 vaccinations remain an important tool in certain aspects in healthcare, including in aged and disability care, where there is direct contact between workers and patients who are highly vulnerable to COVID-19. It is important that these sectors are able to rely to make decisions about whether a mandate may be necessary based on medical advice. Um, as such, whilst we note that the overwhelming majority of workplaces do not require a COVID-19 vaccination, and that is a good thing, it is important in sectors like healthcare uh, that they are able to make decisions on whether there should be mandatory vaccinations for its workers, but based on medical advice. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Macdonald. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, look, I rise to talk, speak to this uh, Work, Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022. And I want to start by... The... OK. Uh, so, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. I note that you've resumed your seat. Uh, the question before the chamber is that the amendment moved by Senator Babette on sheet 1848 be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Division is a division required? Uh, a division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Tell off amongst them. That's a good photo. Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Babette uh, be agreed. The ayes will move to the right, to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Chacon for the noes, and for the ayes, I appoint Senator Canavan.
There is the result of the division is ayes 5, noes 31. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Report from Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered the Work, Health and Safety Amendment Bill of 2022 and agreed to it without amendments. Um, with the, yeah, the minister. Uh, I move the report of the committee be adopted. Uh, the question is as moved by the minister. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The minister. I move the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, Minister. It being. Oh. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to work, health and safety and for related purposes. Uh, we'll now proceed to two minute statements. Senator MacDonald. Thank you, Acting De Deputy President. Australian agriculture needs champions, and I'm very proud to acknowledge two such champions here today, Dr Theresa Craig and Delene Ray. Both were this year named members in the General Division of the Order of Australia, a fitting tribute to two women I greatly admire for their work promoting a product we should all get behind, Australian beef. Dr Craig was recognised for significant services to politics and the agricultural industry. She has a PhD in nutrition across all species and specialises in cattle and sheep. She was a member and vice chair of the Queensland School's Animal Ethics Committee for seven years, as well as an author of several publications. Dr Craig is also an adjunct professor with the University of Sunshine Coast and has filled with distinction multiple executive roles in the Queensland Liberal National Party. She has also been a key lecturer for the University of New, Queen New England CRC feedlot course and is a past president of the Agribusiness Association of Australia. And for the past 14 years, she has owned and operated her own animal nutrition consulting firm. Now, Delyn Ray is a leader, a leader in the Australian organic food production movement, and has been recognised for her significant service to the organic beef industry as managing director of OB, OB Beef and chair of Organic Industries Australia. She is a fierce advocate for food safety and for food security. Delyn grew up in the family's properties in the heart of Queensland's Channel Country and uses a lifetime of experience to promote and sell Australian organic beef to the world. She's managed the company's quickly expanding businesses in Southeast Asia and the Middle East, and she's done all of this while also learning to speak Mandarin, French and Spanish and understanding Afrikaans. I congratulate both of these outstanding women and encourage them in their efforts to protect and promote our highly valuable meat industry. Thank you. Senator White. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week I had the pleasure of meeting with the Indian Consul General to Victoria and Tasmania in Melbourne, Dr Sushuel Kumar. We had a good discussion and I learnt more about the important strategic, economic and cultural factors which underpin the vibrant friendship of our two nations. Dr Kumar has only been in the job for about six months, but it was clear to me that he understands Australia and that he appreciates how deeply the Albanese government values the contribution of the Indian uh, diaspora uh, make to Australia and Victoria. I was glad to learn that 40 per cent of Australia's Indian diaspora call Victoria home. This is a growing population of some 200,000 people, particularly in growth corridors of the western and southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Victorian universities also educate 42,000 Indian uh, university students, which is over a third of all Indian students in Australia. I suppose this is to be expected from the education state, but I was heartened that young members of the diaspora come to Australia 
Australia and Melbourne. As a, as a product of a Victorian university myself, I can understand why. The Consul General and I also discussed the federal government's commitment to India under the leadership of, Prime, of, of the Prime Minister, Minister Wong and uh, Minister Farrell. The India-Australia Free Trade Agreement, championed by Minister Farrell, is a huge step in strengthening our economic bonds. Now over 85 per cent of Australian exports to India are now tariff-free, as well as 96 per cent of Indian imports to Australia. The Prime Minister is in India today to reaffirm our commitments to projects like the Free Trade Agreement and the Quad Leaders Agreement. Our cultural connection to India is about combining the skills, knowledge and expertise of India, Victoria and Australia to achieve outcomes that are enduring and mutually beneficial. That is something I'm proud of and I'm proud that Victoria is leading the way. Thank you. Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, as chair of the Select Committee on Work and Care, one issue that's come up repeatedly in our recent hearings around Australia is the way our workplace relations laws are failing those in our community who care for others. We heard a great deal of evidence about the disastrous impact unpredictable hours of work are having on the lives of parents and carers. We also heard the personal stories of carers struggling to manage impossible schedules caught between their boss and their care for children or others. And let me just give you one example. Julie is a single mother who, cares, who works as a casual cleaner. She had consistent shifts through the first two years. She worked for her employer, a regular work schedule that allowed her to pick up and drop off her young daughter at childcare. Her predictable working hours gave her the certainty that she needed to balance her work with being a sole parent. Without warning, her employer dramatically altered her roster, moved her to a different site and placed her on shifts that meant she could no longer rely on her childcare arrangements. Afraid that she might lose her job, she felt unable to challenge the scheduling changes. When she attempted to use a flexible work arrangement to allow her to care for her daughter, her employer rejected it as in conflict with their business interests. For decades, flexibility has been spoken of as a silver bullet in our workplaces, a cure-all for working parents and those looking after others. The reality is, in many cases, flexible rostering has been centred on the needs of the employer rather than those of the worker juggling work and care. As part of the next tranche of industrial relations reform, the government must restore roster justice for workers, ensuring that they have predictable, stable rosters with advance notice and consultation on roster changes. Workers like Julie, caring alone for their kids, should not be forced at short notice to make the impossible choice between caring for their child and putting food on the table. Thank you. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Yesterday was International Women's Day, and so many wonderfully diverse events were held here in Canberra. The first one I attended was a very, very special event at Old Parliament House yesterday morning, and that was the long overdue unveiling of two statues of our first female parliamentarians, Dame Dorothy Tangney and Dame Edith Lyons. A huge, huge shout out to my friend and colleague in the other place, Nola Marino for her passion and commitment and dedication to uh, realising both of these statues in the parliamentary triangle, the first statues in the parliamentary triangle of Australian women. And I hope the Labor Party will be equally passionate about uh, ensuring there is one of our first female prime minister as well uh, located there. The artist Liz Johnson has done a remarkable job of capturing uh, both ladies as they walked into the old parliament house uh, together side by side. And it was especially lovely to meet the families, the next generation of both families, who are so incredibly and rightly proud of both women. Dorothy was a much-loved teacher, and Enid uh, was the mother of 12 children and also the wife of a prime minister. Uh, and they, they both have very different stories, but what they have in common is their resilience, their strength and their passion and their commitment to make a difference in the lives of other Australians. So one of the biggest takeouts for me is the fact that while both were from different sides of the ideological divide, they walked into Parliament House together and throughout their careers they worked very closely and collegiately together and they were friends. And they worked on 
on all sorts of causes for Australian women and children. And it's an important reminder for all of us here. We are diverse, but together we can do so much. Thank you. Senator Polly. I rise today to speak about Australian Reading Hour and the importance of literacy in our daily lives. Literacy is so important to our development. And this begins with our children in, still in the womb. It helps with their understanding of the spoken word, the written word and the interactions with people and the world around us. Reading helps us to learn about new ideas, escape from reality and look beyond our own experiences. We are so fortunate here in Australia to have such inspiring authors. Last night at the Parliamentary Friends of Australian Books event, I had the opportunity to speak to some of those working in this sector. Our publishers spoke about how important it is to support Australian authors, support the authors, support our local publishing houses and to support the bricks and mortar of our big, uh, bookstores. Uh, book I also had the opportunity to meet uh, Rick Morton. He's not only an award-winning Australian journalist, but also an author of three non-fiction books. I look forward to sitting down and reading his work that I received last night. We saw firsthand over the last three years how important the arts are in our mental health and to create balance in our lives. The Albanese Labor government is committed to arts in Australia, not just arts but licorice as well, I might add. This year we announced our revived cultural policy and the establishment of Creative Australia, which includes Writers Australia. Writers Australia will support the literary sector in Australia, which is so important to allow Australian stories to be told. I encourage everyone today to pick up a book for an hour in celebration of Australian Reading Hour, share our favourite books with our children or enjoy some quiet time with a new read for ourselves. Literacy is the fountain of all knowledge. Senator Stirl. No, I love licorice. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Now the South 32. I want to talk about the South 32 Rottnest. This is serious. South 32 uh, Rottnest Channel swim. It's a 19.7 kilometre open water swim from Cottesloe Beach in WA to Rottnest Island, held this year on the 24th of February. Now I am. I've got to tell you before I get carried away, highly regarded worldwide and one of Western Australia's iconic events. The Rottnest Channel Swim is a 19.7 kilometre open water swim, as I'd said. Now, I have participated in the Rottnest Island Channel crossing on a number of occasions. I have uh, skippered twice and I have paddled solo three times for my daughter, who has done team events and she's done, I think there's about four solo crossings. But I have to say that there were no less than 2,600 swimmers. I think there was about a thousand odd boats in the water between, Rotto, uh, between Cottesloe and Rotto that day. And I believe there's about 600 people in to all up that are involved in volunteering and helping out. But I want to take a special uh, uh, an opportunity to sincerely recognise and thank the Rottnest Channel Swim Association President, Dr Kirsty Bolombra. Now, I couldn't be there this year because I was actually home at my place on this beautiful day on February the uh, 24th, helping Dr Bolombra's husband babysit my grandchildren. Love you, Kirsty. Great effort. Fantastic. There was many records broken. I got the pleasure of going over on the Sunday with the grandkids and to see Rottnest still alive. People walking around Rotto with their numbers still on, sunburnt noses, a few hangovers and all that sort of stuff. But it was a truly amazing weekend. And I've said to Kirsty, look, I am retired now. The odd shark sighting has put me off. I'll put it down to getting a little bit too old, to which she did tell me. I did get reprieved for about seven years while she was having children. She said she's going back next year. I think I'll be one of the volunteers helping on the island. Well done, Kirsty, and to all in the Rottnest Channel swim. Thank you, Senator Stell, for your effort. Um, Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's always a pleasure, always a pleasure to follow Senator Glenn Stirl, at least in the speaking order as, as opposed to the ideology. Always a pleasure. What is it about the Labor Party and franking credits? They are obsessed. They are monomaniacal about franking credits. They're like Captain Ahab chasing the great white whale. Moby Dick. That's what they're like with franking credits. It didn't end well for Captain Ahab. It's not going to end well for the Australian Labor Party. And today, this week, we've had disclosed from the Department of Treasury key budget measures corporate taxation. 
The cat is out of the bag, and what a mangy, feral beast it is. What a mangy little beastie it is. The cat's out of the bag. This is what Treasury said. This is what Treasury said, not me. This is what Treasury said in relation to the franking credits, the attack on franking credits in off-market share buybacks. I quote, shareholders who benefit most from the franking credits attached to an off-market share buyback may argue the policy is effectively a tax increase or a winding back of dividend imputation, end quote effectively a tax increase or a winding back of dividend imputation. And shareholders can argue that because it is, because it is effectively a tax increase or a winding back of dividend imputation. In the context of off-market share buybacks, many Australians rely upon those franking credits. And then, in relation to the frank distributions funded by capital raisings, this is what Treasury says. There were significant concerns raised by the public, and rightly so, because again, this is a vague policy, it's uncertain, it's retrospective, it will hobble Australian companies in terms of their capital raising measures, it's ill informed, and the government should abandon this policy, which will hurt millions of Australians. Thank you, Senator Billick. Thank you, and it's always a pleasure to follow Senator Scar, who's always had a pleasure of, enjoys the pleasure of following Senator Stirl. But can I say? I'm not um, as theatrical as Senator Scar. Australia's new national cultural policy revive commits the Australian government to regulating content on video on demand streaming platforms. We have local content rules for broadcast and cable TV, but Australians are increasingly turning to video on demand services for their entertainment, where no such rules apply. Local content rules are important for jobs in our local screen production industry particularly when they are competing against the industry in countries that also protect their local content. But it is about so much more than that. It is also about telling Australian stories to Australian audiences so we can celebrate and preserve our cultural and national identity. I am a big fan of shows like Mystery Road and wait for it, Bluey, and I want to see more content that reflects the culture and society I live in. Having local content rules for streaming services will bring Australia into line with the EU, Belgium, Canada, Croatia, Denmark, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland, Portugal and Poland. The new local content rules will start on 1 July next year. We need to make decisions on questions such as the design of the scheme, what defines a video on demand streaming service and what types of investment are acceptable in meeting Australian content obligations. To inform these decisions, we are consulting with the streaming industry and other stakeholders. Submissions on this consultation close on the 24th of April and the details are on the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, Communi Communications and the Arts website. I encourage anyone with an interest in this scheme to get involved. I'm proud to be part of a government that is moving forward with ensuring that we maintain a strong local screen production industry Thank and you. that Australian stories Senator continue Billich. to be told to Australian audiences. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thanks, Acting De Deputy President. Right now, the most powerful voice forces in the media, the weapons industry and the political class, are baying for war, and we should all be alarmed. Twenty years ago, the world went to war on a lie. This followed a concerted campaign from these very same groups to send the US and its allies, including Australia, into a devastating and ultimately failed war with Iraq, from which the Middle East and much of the world has never recovered. We're approaching the 20th anniversary of the illegal invasion of Iraq, and we should learn from what happened. Nine entertainment newspapers have put together a hand-picked panel of academics and defence industry insiders, many with ties to the defence industry, who this week have launched an extraordinary campaign for war with China within three years. There's not one voice of moderation, not one critic of the pro-war agenda, not one. This is a real failure to represent the views and perspectives of the great majority of Australians and the array of academics and strategists who do not want war. It begs the question. So who does? Nine's campaign is timed ahead of the Defence Strategic Review and a major announcement on nuclear submarines, and appears to be a concerted campaign to change public opinion in favour of a march to war and a dramatic escalation in defence spending. The panel has said Australia's defence spending as a proportion of GDP should double from 2 per cent to 4 per cent. Our annual defence budget is already $48.6 billion, and we're not in a war. 
That's 97 times the amount this government is planning on spending on new homes in a housing crisis. Australia has so much to lose from a war with a major nuclear power in our region. We have far more to lose than the US, but there are arms manufacturers and defence insiders out there who want to make an even bigger killing. War is not inevitable, and we need to resist it now more than ever. The New York Times ultimately apologised for its warmongering in the lead-up to the Iraq invasion. Twenty years on, we need an urgent reminder of that lesson. We don't want another apology. We need to stop another war. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Shoebridge, and I and the other parliamentary friends of Assange Group met today uh, with Julian Assange's father, John Shifton, and his lawyer, Stephen Kenny. And we heard from his partner, uh, Stella, who talked to us about her despair about the lack of action from the Australian government to release Julian Assange. Now, we've learnt today that our Prime Minister will meet with both the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, and for the first time with President Biden next week. Prime Minister, will you finally raise this issue directly with our allies and counterparts? Will you raise the release of Julian Assange? You have come out and said you think enough is enough and you believe that he should be freed. The test will be next week whether you raise this directly with Mr Biden. And I ask the Prime Minister that you make a statement following that meeting on whether you did raise this issue. And I urge the Australian media to hold our Prime Minister to account. We heard from this government since the election nearly nine months ago that quiet diplomacy was necessary for the release of Julian Assange. Well, we've, uh, we've let this run. It's nine months down the track, we've heard nothing, and his family are despairing. Enough is enough, as you said, Prime Minister. Now is the time to raise this directly with President Biden and make sure this Australian citizen, who is a hero to so many, is finally freed after four years of incarceration in a maximum security prison, after nearly 14 years in confinement, and he is yet to be found guilty of any crime. And there's no crime in telling the truth. It's, there is a crime in keeping Mr Assange behind bars. Thank you. Senator Askew. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Sometimes words like passion and entrepreneurship can be overused, but I can't think of any better words to describe Ros and Jeff Wallace. The pair are the brains behind the St Mary's Camel Farm, a labour of love that oozes from every corner of every timber-clad shed on their property at Fairview, Fairview. The St Mary's Camel Farm, and I bet you didn't know there were camels in Tasmania, no. was born from the couple's twin interests, accessibility and camels. When you listen to Roz talking about camels, you can hear the passion in her voice and her love for the largely misunderstood creatures. And while you might think that Tasmania and camels are an extremely odd couple, let me tell you, it works. The St Mary's Camel Farm was born as an accessible tourism venture the Wallaces ran adjacent to their work in disability support, along the lines of equine therapy or riding for the disabled, but camel style. Clients would come in for therapy time with the animals, which are surprisingly gentle and friendly despite their size. However, as so many tourism and people-focused operations were required to do, they were faced with needing to pivot quickly when the pandemic struck. With lockdowns looming and increasing the fear of the immunocompromised, it looked like they were, would immediately lose their client base. So the pair got to work and in December 2021, the St Mary's Camel Farm opened to the public. The St Mary's Camel Farm has six animals and they recently welcomed a gorgeous baby calf damper to their caravan or herd of camels. And while camels are most often associated with the deserts of Egypt, the camels at St Mary's have adapted quite well. Their favourite treat is an Australian breakfast sample staple, wheat bix. So not only that, but the St Mary's Camel Farm has cultivated its own community and has become an important place of connection for the town, with the farm hosting an annual Christmas party for the community along with their other events. Their mateship, fellowship and ingenuity deserves recognition. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Last year, the Albanese government continued the Morrison government's campaign to sign away Australian sovereignty to the United Nations World Health Organization, the WHO. Despite the attempt failing, WHO's power grab is ongoing. 
WHO is not independent. Their owners are corporate donors who contribute most of the WHO budget. WHO's current sugar daddy is Bill Gates, who has made billions out of his investment in the same vaccines that WHO promotes. Gates bought the WHO and they now recommend his products. It is that simple. The head of the WHO is Tedros Ghebreyesus, previously health minister of a terrorist organisation called the Tigray People's Liberation Front, where he used international aid to buy power and punish his enemies. The regions of Ethiopia that Tedros starved for medical supplies suffered disastrous cholera epidemics in, 20, in 2006, 2009, 2011. Independent investigators found Tedros was, quote, fully complicit in the terrible suffering and dying that spread in East Africa. He's a killer. WHO is rotting from the head. Last week, Associated Press reported on the WHO sex crime scandal, where WHO staffers sexually exploited girls and women during the Congo's recent Ebola outbreak. Inhuman. At, eight, at least 83 WHO staff engaged in abuse, including rape and forced abortions, with victims as young as 13. WHO refused to fire the perpetrators, using the absurd argument their, their actions didn't violate WHO's sexual exploitation practice policies because the victims were not receiving WHO aid. The raping part is okay with Tedros. This is the person who heads an organisation that many in government and academia want to elevate above the Australian parliament. One Nation rejects the UN WHO power grab and will defend Australian sovereignty. So should you all. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today we are celebrating a huge win for manufacturing for the regions and the climate. The Greens have ensured that the National Reconstruction Fund will not be used to fund coal and gas or native forest logging. The guardrails that we've put in place mean that no public money will flow to coal and gas corporations. The amendments that the Greens have secured will ensure that the National Reconstruction Fund will be focused on creating high-quality jobs across a diverse economy, particularly in regional Queensland. The, co the Coalition tried to use public money to fund coal and gas through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. But they were unable to do so because of the guardrails that the Greens and Labor put in place. Now we have the same assurance that the NRF won't be used to fund the climate crisis. Last year, the Greens took a policy to the federal election championing a manufacturing fund that genuinely rebuilds Australian industry. As a unionist, I will continue to champion a future for manufacturing with well-paid and secure jobs. Under the coalition, we have watched as manufacturing in this country has been kneecapped into a pure dig it up and ship it out economy. Australia deserves a better deal and the regions deserve a better deal too. Coming from Gladstone, I know all too well who really loses out when a government doesn't plan for the future. When industry collapses, it can take out services, jobs and with it the connective tissue from which community grows. This is why I've introduced a bill for a National Energy Transition Authority so that communities have a say as they transition away from coal and gas. This is what the Greens are in Parliament to do. As a senator from regional Queensland, I'm here to ensure our communities are put first and not the coal and gas corporations. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about the 50th anniversary of the Wage in Wollarama. Agricultural shows are the lifeblood of small regional communities. And the wage in Wollarama, and I might be a little bit biased, but I reckon the wage in Wollarama is one of the best, if not the best, going around. Now, the, the people in Dowran might, uh, might, might, uh, might have a go at me for that, but uh, the wage in Wollarama is a special show. Obviously, wage in itself is the heart of the West Australian sheep industry. And the wage in Wollarama is such an important two days for that small community. And the fact that we have finally reached, with a slight delay, the 50th anniversary in, in, the, uh, in celebrating the wage in Woolarama is a great testament to that local community. Because regional shows, reg country shows, are community driven. They are extraordinary centres of economics, 
of economic progress for communities. They bring communities to life. They bring new people into communities. They bring exhibitors from the city, from other country areas. Uh, but they allow the community itself to come together and to Sorry, celebrate what time. makes oh, yeah. those communities great. And what makes the wage in Wollarama so great is the sheep industry. The sheep industry, which is, is centred in that region, Cogen up Katanning, Nyabing, Wagen, uh, so many small country towns in regional Western Australia uh, are built on the sheep's back, just as Australia was in the 60s. And we've got a dark cloud hanging over that industry at the moment, but at the Wage in Woolarama, we're going to see that that community is ready for a fight, is ready to stand up for West Australian sheep farmers and ready to do whatever they can to keep the sheep industry alive. I thank you. Senator Brockman, Senator Green. Thank you. While Parliament has been sitting this week, the top end of my home state, Queensland, has been experiencing heavy rain, showers and storms as a monsoon trough lingers over the tropics. Yesterday and overnight, the severe weather has been concentrated in the northwest Gulf Country, northern goldfields, upper Flinders, central west districts of the state. And today, as the trough moves further south, heavy rainfall will continue to impact Queensland. Um, I want to thank the Minister for Emergency Management, um, Senator Murray Watt who assures me that the government um, continues to monitor the situation closely. Uh, thank you, Senator Green. The time for um, two-minute statements has expired. We'll move to question time. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer, I refer the minister to the column written by former Labor State Secretary and former Labor Chief of Staff Cameron Milner in The Australian today, marking the anniversary of the tragic death of our former colleague Kimberley Kitching. Is Mr Milner correct that there still has not been an investigation into allegations of workplace bullying? Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, I'm going to ask for order, and I expect there to be order. Minister. Thank, thank you, President. Uh, look, uh, uh, this week is the anniversary of Senator Kitching's passing, uh, and uh, I would express again uh, that our thoughts are with her loved ones as that anniversary approaches. Um, it is, as I said uh, in the condolence speech, um, you know, I think I and many others in this place understand what it is to lose someone you love uh, and how it, anniversaries are difficult. Um, Senator Kitching was someone who was deeply interested in Australia's place in the world, and I believe she would be very proud of what this Labor government is doing. She's greatly missed by many, including many of her colleagues uh, and uh, by her family. Uh, I have responded to these matters at length previously, including the question you raise, and I'd refer you to those answers. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Will the Prime Minister act on Mr Milner's call for an open and independent investigation into the bullying claims? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Well, as I said in my earlier answer, I've responded, and as has the Prime Minister, prior to the election to these matters, and I'd refer you to those answers. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. President, can the Minister please put on the record why has the Prime Minister refused to undertake an open and independent investigation? Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, these matters were traversed in great detail prior to the election, uh, including publicly, and I would refer you to the many answers which were given. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Payman. My question is to Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is delivering on its commitment to establish 50 Medicare urgent care clinics across Australia to improve access to health care for all Australians? Minister Wong. Thank you, Senator Pates Payman, and thank you very much for the question and the opportunity to talk about something that Australians are deeply interested in, which is the strength of the Australian health care system and, in particular, the Medicare system. Australians expect and deserve access to quality and affordable health care, and that is what our, government, what our government and those on this side are seeking to deliver, because we are the party of Medicare. 
We are the party of Medicare, and we have always supported Medicare, unlike those opposite who we know historically opposed Medicare, historically opposed Medicare, and have had grudgingly over the years, grudgingly over the years, to start to tell people uh, that they actually support it. Because, the, because they knew it was politically unsustainable for them to continue to oppose it. So four decades on, the party that created Medicare is strengthening it. We promised at the election that we would deliver 50 Medicare urgent care clinics, and we are delivering. We are delivering. Expressions of interest have opened, and the first of the clinics will be treating patients this year. Uh, they will offer bulk build services Order. and open for extended Order. hours. You hate this, don't you? You hate this. You, you, do, you, you hate Order. this. You, 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 really, uh, you really hate Australians getting access to better health care. You know, you, you know, the fact that people actually believe that a public health system is a good thing. It's anathema to the Liberal it's Party, isn't it? And they don't want to know. I have they don't want to know. They don't want to know how. How this government is strengthening to it. And remember, let's remember, you know, this is the party who is led by a man who cut fifty billion dollars from hospitals. Peter Dutton as health minister, fifty billion cut from hospitals, tried to introduce a seven dollar GP tax Senator and secretly Cash launched and Senator Rustin. <coughs> Order. Uh, Senator Payman, uh, first supplementary. Had you, sorry. Nationals, our 50 urgent care clinics will help take the burden off public hospitals. Order, Senator Payne. I have a senator on her feet waiting to ask a question, and I'm waiting for silence. Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Albanese government is working with states and territories to strengthen access to primary care? Minister Wong. Thank you, thank you to Senator Payman for the question. And of course, we on this side understand that the pandemic made clear that governments need to work together, work together, to deliver the care Australians deserve. That's why, that's why our government uh, delivers is committed $100 million to co-develop and pilot innovative ways to improve care with states and territories. In Queensland, the government is using the funding to expand its care collective initiative. This will improve coordination in the health system, specifically for people living with chronic and complex health care needs. In Western Australia, the nurse practitioner and team-based care pilot will fund 20 nurse practitioners over two years. Practitioners who will work with other— uh, well, you know, I'll take the interjection from the other side. You know, I would have thought you'd be interested. I would have thought you'd be interested in what's happening in Western Australia and Queensland, but clearly not. These practitioners will work with other health professionals to diagnose and treat Senator a wide Rustin. range of health conditions, Senator and their Rustin. services will be free. Uh, Senator Payman, second supplementary. Can the minister update the Senate on how else the government is delivering on its commitment to strengthen Medicare after 10 years of neglect and mismanagement by the Liberals and Nationals? Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the government is strengthening Medicare, which is required after nine years of cuts and neglect, and we've set up the Strengthening Medicare Cut Task Force to help better support patients with ongoing and chronic illness. We have already committed $750 million to deliver the highest priority investments in primary care in line with the recommendations of the task force. But you know, after a decade of failure, there is a lot of work to do. There is a lot of work to do, because those opposite left Australians with a trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. Hospitals left under strain, medical staff exhausted, the bulk billing system on the verge of collapse, and out-of-pocket costs skyrocketing. Well, I suppose we should Senator expect Rustin. nothing more, nothing better, from a man who was described as Australia's worst yes. health minister. Mr Dutton, Australia's worst health minister. This is the man who now leads Mr Morrison's Liberal leftovers. Uh, thank you, Minister. The your time, of today, thank Mr. You, Morrison's Minister, your Liberal time has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you. 
Uh, Senator Brockman, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator yeah. Gallagher. Fine. Yesterday, the Assistant Treasurer could not rule out that if a family farm is an asset in a self-managed super fund, the owners could be forced to pay tax on that farm if it increased in value during a particular financial year. Minister, can you confirm that your government is proposing to tax super fund assets such as the family farm where it has only been where there has only been an increase in its value on paper. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a moment. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. Um, Senator Brockman, who was the question to? Senator Gallagher. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank um, Senator Brockman for the question. I've answered this a number of times uh, this week. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yes, um, Minister, I have. Minister, please, you have asked Minister the Gallagher, same question please, please a number of times. Oh, Senator Watt, Senator Watt, I've just sat the minister down because there's too much in too many interjections. Uh, minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Yes, I have been asked this. I've been asked it in various ways. Yes, I have. Uh, superannuation. Uh, is based on individual accounts. If your account has more than $3 million in it, of which we know is a very small part of the overall numbers of superannuation accounts, then we are increasing the, or decreasing the concessional arrangements on those high balance accounts. Right? So if, you're, if you have an asset in your super account, you are still required under the prudential arrangements to have a diversified portfolio. That would have been the case under your government. And you earn income that tips you over the three million dollar threshold, then you will pay a concessional rate of thirty per cent instead of fifteen per cent on the earnings over three million dollars. Now this would cover people Senator who Scott. have a farm as part of their asset or it might include other, uh, other property that they might have in their super funds. Uh, so um, I think that is, how, that, that is the answer I give. That is the answer I've given all week, um, and that is the position we've taken through these super changes. But I would note, again, that the average super balance in this country is $150,000. To have a dignified retirement, is in the order of $565,000. That is what superannuation is for, to, to allow for a dignified retirement. This is making a Thank modest you, Minister, change your time for has a very— expired. Uh, Senator, I'm going to wait for quiet. I have a senator on his feet. Senator Rustin. Senator Brockman, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Minister, for that one minute and 30 second yes. Minister, the Assistant Treasurer recently likened the $3 trillion in superannuation funds in Australia as honey, which he wants to spread around for the good of the hive. Do you believe that accounts are the property of the individual account holder, or do you believe or do you agree with the Assistant Treasurer that they are a uh, honeypot Senator Brockman, your time for the government has to spread? Minister Gallagher. I think I got the gist of it. I think I got the gist of it. Superannuation. Superannuation. Okay. Uh, I'm going to sit. Um, Minister, Super please resume your seat. I'm going to wait until the interjections have stopped from both sides of the chamber. Senator Mackenzie. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Superannuation accounts are individual accounts owned by individual members, uh, which are subject to taxation, as they currently are. Uh, they are. Superannuation currently has ta tax arrangements that apply to it. What the change that we are making, the change Order. that we are making, is for a very small amount of Senator people McGrath. who are fortunate enough to have more than three million in their accounts, that they pay a concessional rate of 30 per cent on earnings over $3 million. It's a very modest, uh, modest change 
to the arrangements that have been put in place. But as, as people in this place know, superannuation is based on individual accounts. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, uh, the minister spent 95 per cent of her answer uh, responding to really the primary question still and the general thesis around the government superannuation changes. On relevance, the supplementary question went specifically to the words of the assistant treasurer, which she should reject uh, that it is not a honeypot uh, for the, to be spread around the nation. Um, Senator Birmingham, as I uh, order, order, I'm responding to a point of order. As I understand the question, it, it did have the honey definition in it, but the senator was also asked directly if um, senator accounts, uh, superannuation accounts, were individual. So I believe she's being relevant. But I will continue to listen. Minister, you've finished. Um, Senator Brockman, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, yesterday in question time, when asked to categorically rule out any further changes to the superannuation taxation system in this parliament, you said, and I quote, the government has made it clear that this is the only change to superannuation taxation during this term. Considering during the 22 election campaign, Mr Albanese said, We've said we've had no intention of making any changes to super. How can the Australian people trust the commitment you gave yesterday? Thank you, uh, thank you Senator Brockman, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, my answer yesterday was correct. Uh, I stand by that answer, uh, and I would say uh, that the Australian people realise that they have a government that's making responsible and difficult decisions after we inherited a budget mess from those opposite. That is what the Australian people think. They want a government that shows up, that deals with the challenges, that explains, explains the decisions we take and why we take them. And we're taking them because we've got a $50 billion structural budget problem in this country. We have a trillion dollars in debt that was the debt that was doubled before the uh, pandemic hit. We've got increasing pressures on our budget, including in national uh, security and defence, and in health, and in hospitals, and in aged care. All of those areas, increasing pressures. And unlike you, we don't think the budget is this ma magic pudding uh, uh, that you, you use for yourself Your without explaining has it. Order. Minister, resume your seat. Your time has expired. Order. 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 Uh, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to Minister Watts, representing the Minister for Industrial Relations. Minister, the federal government and Safe Work have been on notice about the deadly health impacts posed by manufactured stones since at least 2019, when the matter was canvassed extensively in a New South Wales parliamentary inquiry and the press. We know too many workers are dying slow, painful deaths from silicosis. Recognising that it, had that it took us too long to act on James Hardy, why does Safe Work still say high silica manufactured stone can be sa used safely and still refuse to support a ban on this deadly product? I thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Shoebridge. And I know this is an issue you've had a long-standing interest in, uh, as have many of us. Uh, who have been concerned about worker safety, particularly in the construction industry, where this applies most. Uh, and I agree with you, Senator Shoebridge. This is something that should have been dealt with a long, long time ago. Uh, a lot of people have been on notice that this is a problem and is a very serious health risk. Um, I've heard it referred to as the asbestosis of this generation, and that, that is certainly what it looks like. And that's exactly why our government is taking action uh, to finally fix this once and for all. Uh, as, as you would probably be aware, Senator Shoebridge, uh, in late February, the 28th of February this year, Minister Burke, as the responsible minister, met with work health and safety ministers to consider Safe Work Australia's decision regulation impact statement to better manage the risks of silica dust within the workplace. At that meeting, ministers unanimously agreed to a national approach to dealing with the spike in silicosis and silica-related diseases in workers from harmful exposure of respirable crystalline uh, silica. Ministers agreed uh, to a range of reforms as a priority based on recommendations from Safe Work Australia, and they included the delivery of national awareness and behaviour change initiatives, stronger regulation of high-risk crystalline or crystalline silica processes for all materials across all industries, 
and further analysis and consultation by Safe Work Australia on a prohibition on the use of engineered stone under the model workplace health and safety laws, including consideration of a licensing scheme for legacy and non-prohibited products to be completed within six months. Ministers also noted the Commonwealth's intent to explore an importation ban on engineered stone and its effects, and Minister Burke's department is now working with states and territories and other stakeholders as part of this scoping work. Uh, we recognise the need to act quickly, and ministers will meet again to discuss silicosis as soon as practicable. Thank you, after Minister. Safe the work time for answering has work. expired. Senator Shubrick, first uh, supplementary. Minister, the main provider of manufactured stone in Australia, Caesar Stone, is a foreign corporation with no significant assets in the country and since September 2020 has been unable to get insurance coverage for silicosis-related claims in Australia, while it's also facing dozens and dozens of claims from sick and dying Australian workers. What guarantee do you give to workers who become sick after working with this product that they will not be left high and dry if Caesar Stone exits the market? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, as I say, a range of issues uh, concerning silicosis and the threat that it poses to workers in the construction industry, uh, including those who unfortunately have contracted silicosis, are exactly the issues that Minister Burke is dealing with at the moment. Uh, and I understand that you're seeking an assurance or, or some information about what will happen uh, to workers who become sick uh, if, if Caesar Stone were to exit the market. Uh, I'm not briefed on that precise matter, but I'm happy to provide you with some information about that. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, I note that the, the statements about taking action, and, um, and to some extent that's positive, but the, the best estimates we're hearing from the minister is this could be six to 12 months before a ban is put in place. So what do you say to the families of those workers who are getting sick now, waiting for a ban to finally happen, and being told, again, we're going to the beat of safe work? And it's too hard to do it now, and that industry controls are sufficient. What do you thank say you about the failure Shubridge. to get a ban Your time now? has expired, Senator Watt. Um, thanks, President. Thanks, Senator Shoebridge. I don't think that anyone, or certainly no one within our government, is saying that the current controls are sufficient. Uh, and that's exactly why Minister Burke is leading this work nationally, involving all state and territory ministers. Uh, I think it is not just unfortunate, but a grave dereliction of duty from the former government to have been in power for nearly 10 years while this information was publicly available and, do, and did nothing about it. And within the first 12 months of our government, we are actually taking action. Um, we do, so what I say to the families of those workers who are getting sick now is that they do now have a government in the Albanese Labor government who takes these issues seriously uh, and is actually taking action. Uh, well, Senator Heads and Anderson, it, it would have been good if you'd spoken up at some point, at any point, while you were in government uh, to ensure that this was done. Uh, but now that we are in government, we are taking action on it. Uh, and, and the sooner that that can happen, the better. Thank you, uh, Minister Watt. Senator Billick. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Watt. Can the minister outline why international education is, is important to our economy and building relationships with other countries? Minister Watt. Thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Billick. And I know you're a very strong supporter of the international education industry in your home state of Tasmania and right around the country. Uh, a strong international education sector is an important contributor to the Australian economy. It's in fact the biggest export that we don't dig out of the ground. Uh, but of course this industry was absolutely smashed by COVID. In 2019, international education contributed over $40 billion to the Australian economy and supported over 250,000 jobs. The pandemic saw that fall to $20.8 billion in 2021-22, so nearly halved. International education has recently returned to being Australia's fourth biggest export industry, now worth $25.5 billion, but obviously there's still a very large gap between where we were before COVID came along. International education also plays a role in filling Australia's skill needs uh, with high quality graduates trained to Australian standards. Our government's work to reduce the visa backlog, another mess we inherited from the former government, and increase post-study work rights will help attract the best and brightest to Australian shores. International students are starting to come back, and that's a very good thing, uh, but there is a lot more work to be done here. And that's why the work that the Minister for Education, Jason Clare, uh, has done and the Prime Minister is doing India right now is so important. 
International education directly progresses Australia's interests in a stable and prosperous future for our region. The deep and enduring connections that result from international students studying and living in Australia brings more than revenue, it builds us friends in the region and beyond. International students help to strengthen Australia's international relationships. They are an invaluable part of Australian communities, bringing new perspectives, ideas and skills to enrich the cultural fabric of our society. Edu education plays a key role in building cultural diversity and people-to-people -people links around the world. It also ensures re regional stability, and that's some of the many reasons Thank why you, our Minister. government is supporting it. The time it. for answering has expired. Senator Bullock, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Can you provide an update on what the Albanese government is doing to strengthen higher education ties with India? Minister. Thank you, President. And yes, I can, Senator Billick. Uh, as you would be aware, our government takes the relationship between Australia and India very seriously, and that is a strong and important relationship for our future. I know that's certainly the case in my own portfolio of agriculture, uh, and the recently signed free trade agreement with India opens lots of new markets for agricultural producers in India. Uh, but I think that education is also a big part of the reason why this relationship is continuing to grow. The Prime Minister's announcement overnight that Deakin University will be the first overseas university approved to build a campus in India is proof of the strength of our relationship, and I'm sure all Victorian senators in particular uh, are very proud of that. The Minister for Education's visit last week, thank you, Senator Chikani, The Minister for Education's visit last week to sign the new mutual recognition agreement is further proof of that. It delivers an immediate benefit to the hundreds of thousands of Indians with Australian qualifications and to anyone with Australian and Indian qualifications that wants to continue their higher education. This agreement was the broadest that India Thank has you, signed Senator with another White, country. The time for answering has expired. Senator Bullock, second supplementary. Minister, what are the benefits to Australia of the work the Prime Minister is doing on higher education in India? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Bullock. And I'll <coughs> just clear my throat, as <coughs> Senator Farrell is wont to do. Uh, <coughs> our relationship with <coughs> India presents massive opportunities for Australia, both for our economy and for the people, to people for the people that people links it generates. The Indian government has a plan to increase its higher education enrolments to 50 per cent of young people by 2035. Uh, the, the quality of our universities and the strength of our relationship has led India to ask for our help in getting this huge undertaking done. Following recent visits, we will see more Australian education providers established in India. The University of Wollongong and Deakin University have committed to establish campuses in Gujarat and will be education partners for the many companies operating uh, in Gift City and surrounds. Uh, RMIT University and the Birla Institute of Technology uh, Polani signed an agreement, and there are 11 memoranda of understanding signed between Australian universities and, in and Indian counterparts. We're going to do Thank a lot you, more Senator in this space. Watt, it's really important. Your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. I appreciate it. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, and I believe it's Senator Watt. Um, the Albanese government has earmarked up to $3 billion from the National Reconstruction Fund for investment in renewables and low emissions technologies. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation's investment mandate for its $10 billion is to invest in, quote, renewable energy, low emissions and energy efficiency projects and technologies, end quote. My question is, what can the National Reconstruction Fund's $3 billion for renewables invest in that the CFC can't already do? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watts. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, as I understand it, you're um, yet to uh, finalise your position in relation to the National Reconstruction Fund, so I do hope that the information that I provide you can convince you that this is something worth getting behind. Uh, the little I know about you, because we haven't spent a lot of time together, I do know that you're a big supporter of manufacturing, uh, particularly in your home state of Tasmania, uh, and the National Reconstruction Fund will be a key way uh, to take manufacturing in that great state forward. Uh, I know Senator Urquhart has a lot of history in Tasmanian manufacturing, uh, and I'm sure, Senator Tyrrell, you'll um, support that as well when we, when we come down to it. The short answer to your question, Senator Tyrrell, uh, is that the National Reconstruction Fund is going to be very focused on manufacturing, uh, and a good example of that in the, in the renewable space might be uh, a smelter, whether it be Bell Bay or anywhere else in Tasmania, or another manufacturing facility that might wish to change its energy sources to become more reliant on renewable energies as a way of reducing their energy costs. 
That is the type of thing that we would expect a company would be able to apply to the National Reconstruction Fund for co-investment. Uh, and if the right rate of return was available, then the NRF would be able to support that. It's a bit different to the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, I guess, because that is much more focused on funding new innovation in the renewable energy space, so around the production of renewable energy uh, and how we can do that through new and innovative, innovative means. So National Reconstruction Fund, much more focused on manufacturing facilities, how to upgrade them, how to bring more value-adding, how to reduce their energy costs rather than the CEFC, which is more about how can we develop more renewable energy, uh, which could then be used to supply to manufacturing facilities. Uh, but as I say, Senator Tyrrell, um, we think that it's a really, uh, it will make a massive difference for manufacturing in our country and in your state of Tasmania. So I do hope that when it comes time to the vote, you'll support us. Thank you, Minister Watt. Um, Senator Tyrrell, for supplementary. Uh, order. Order. Senator Ayres. And others, Senator Tyrrell. Thanks, President. Uh, the Medical Research Endowment Account is investing $3.5 billion in health and medical research. The $20 billion Medical Research Future Fund invests in commercialising those new medical technologies. Can the minister give an example of the, something the National Reconstruction Fund's $1.5 billion for medical science can invest in that the government's other investment vehicles can't already invest in? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, my understanding, bearing in mind I'm representing Minister, is that the answer is essentially the same. Uh, if, if what I'm about to say is not entirely correct, I'm obviously happy to give you the precise information. But my understanding is that, just as with clean energy, the National Reconstruction Fund will be focused on medical manufacturing, whether that be the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, of medical devices, vaccines, or the actual manufacturing process and how that can be done more efficiently, generating more jobs and more profits in states like yours, uh, whereas the, med uh, the, the medical research fund that you were talking about is more focused on funding the research for discovery of new vaccines, of new medicines and things like that, rather than actually manufacturing them. So I guess the National Reconstruction Fund can take those discoveries one step further. And rather than having great medical discoveries here in Australia that then get manufactured overseas, we can make more things here in Australia, which we agree with. Unfortunately, there's a few people over there who don't. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Okay. The Albanese government has earmarked a further $1 billion from the NRF towards advanced manufacturing and a separate billion dollars for critical technologies. But your critical technologies list includes advanced manufacturing as a category of critical technology. It's the first category. You've decided to set up separate buckets of money for different things, but a dollar spent in the first counts as a dollar spent in the second. Do you see how that might be confusing? Oh, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, again, I might need to get a little bit more information to fully answer your question, but my understanding is that the critical technologies list is, is, already, is under review, hasn't been finalised. Um, there's obviously a consultation process that, that has been going through in the creation of this fund, the settling of guidelines as to the types of things that it can be invested in, that you can, can be used to invest in. Uh, and, and I'm sure that if there is any lack of clarity there, that will be tidied up through the, uh, the review process. Um, while I'm on my feet, though, I do want to just point out that this is going to be a really important vote for our country when we come to vote on this legislation. I'm pleased to see that the Greens have now announced that they will be supporting that legislation. Uh, uh, I think the crossbench are still working out their position, and we'd be happy to work with you on that. But there's, there's, there's actually two groups, the Liberals and the Nationals, who are completely opposed to this. And that for all the time they run around dressing in high vis, uh, pretending to care about manufacturing and smearing a bit of grease on their face, when it comes to the crunch, they vote against it. That's a Thank disgrace, you, and they should hang their heads Your time in shame. Has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, on Monday this week, in response to a question from Senator Bragg, you said, and I quote, "Because of the nature of defined benefits, they will be included in the scheme." And we announced that when we announced the measure. We expect that the changes will definitely uh, cover defined benefit schemes, and there are a couple of areas that we are going to consult on and that we want some industry advice on. Can the minister confirm that veterans who are eligible to access a defined benefit scheme will be caught up in Labor's new super tax? Uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Um, and I, I think because I've been dealing with um, these questions all week, and uh, I would point out to the chamber that the coalition closed the defined benefits superannuation scheme for the military in 2015. But we have been clear. Uh, but we have been clear that defined benefit schemes will be part of this change. We said that when we announced it and we will consult with the sector on implementation. And I welcome the opportunity to go through, and I think I might start uh, with the member for Hume's uh, comments about, uh, which relates to um, high balance accounts um, back in 2016. Well, it's very simple. We need a fairer superannuation system which has integrity, and this means that those of us who can afford to pay should be paying our fair share. The situation we had was some people were contributing millions of dollars into super, and it's totally inappropriate that someone who's contributed millions and millions of dollars continues to get 15 per cent concessions. Um, that was the member for Hume Order. in 2016. That was the member for Hume in 2016. And now uh, we've got. Hume. We've got a sensible, modest, responsible change that deals with fairness and equity in the superannuation Order. system. And those opposite, the party of the member for Hume, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, are going to die on a hill for a less concessional arrangement for 0.5 per cent of people who are fortunate enough to have more than three million in their super account. That is the Senator state Hume. of the Liberal Party. As we work towards some sensible budget repair, some modest changes, the no coalition making Thank themselves Minister, irrelevant. Your time say has no. expired. Uh, just order, order. Senator Hume, your constant interjections are disorderly, and I called you to order a number of times. I expect you to come to order. Senator O'Sullivan, our first supplementary. Thank you, Thank you President. Uh, Minister, given your answer, will you rule out applying the tax to veterans who, defined, uh, who accessed the defined benefit scheme prior to 2015? Uh, Minister. Uh, the, the policy that we've announced and will be reflected in the budget applies to 0.5 per cent of people who have more than $3 million in their superannuation account. Okay? In their superannuation account. Now, we are looking at how we apply it to defined benefit schemes. Order. We are looking at how we do it. Uh, Minister, um, please resume your seat. Senator Wong and others. Minister, please continue. As I said earlier this week and as I've just repeated, we've been clear that we want this to apply to defined benefit scheme as well. If you are fortunate enough to have $3 million in your super account, we think that paying a less applying a less concessional arrangement, still highly concessional, still highly concessional, just less than is currently available, so 30 per cent instead of 15 that that raising a very modest $2 billion when it's fully operational Thank you, to Minister. contribute Your time to budget expired. repair. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Uh, thank you for that very revealing answer. Uh, why is Labor, therefore, going after veterans and attempting to tax them on earnings that they won't receive until they retire? I am waiting for order before I call the minister. Senator Wong. Order, Minister. The average super balance in this country is $150,000. That is the average super balance in this country. Women, for women, it is less than that. The average superannuation Minister, balance is 140000 Order, Senator Wong. Minister. We are not going after anyone. We are implementing a sensible change. Well, we are implementing. I wish. I wish you got so exercised Order. about all the other issues facing the country, like the state of the budget that we inherited, for example, might be one of them. Senator How Green. we fund some of those pressures that we've inherited. 
all of those zombie measures that you left there for years propping up your budget, your terminating measures. Senator Henderson. The, what about energy bill relief? Why didn't you care about that? Well, why didn't you care uh, about Minister, that? Minister, you voted no. Minister, you voted no. Minister, we were here. please resume your we're, seat. Minister, Minister, order, 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 Minister Gallagher, this is the second time this week that this chamber has been so disorderly you have not heard me say order on a number of times. It's question time. It is disorderly and disrespectful to continue to call out and to call out so loudly that my saying order is drowned out. It's question time. I expect senators to respect that. Senator Babette. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Health Minister, Mr Gallagher. We meet again, Ms. Um, Minister Gallagher. La last time we conversed in this chamber, you said in relation to COVID-19 vaccines, and I quote, it's not just an individual decision. This is the thing. It's not just about an individual's decision and keeping yourself safe. It's keeping other people safe from this virus. People who aren't able to be as protected as some of us, it's actually a community responsibility to be vaccinated. You also repeated this during Senate estimates, Minister. Can you please advise what evidence you have relied upon to justify your statements regarding mRNA vaccinations and their effectiveness against transmission of the currently circulating COVID strain? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Senator Bibbett. Minister. Thank you, and I thank the Senator uh, for the question and also for the advice that he, early advice that he was going to ask a question about uh, the vaccine or about COVID-19. By getting vac vaccinated and staying up to date with booster doses, people are helping to protect their communities. They, by, they do this by reducing their own risk of serious and severe disease, and they are reducing the potential burden on their local health service and maintaining their ability to work and provide care for others. At the initial stage of the vaccine, at the initial stage of the pandemic. Um, there was also the push through the vaccination program to ensure uh, essentially a herd immunity to the virus, which is, simple, which is similar uh, to the approach that we take with the other vaccination programs. And my comments relate uh, to that. Um, anyone who undertakes a vaccination uh, for a particular illness or disease is doing it as a member of a community, um, because quite often those diseases won't won't necessarily uh, give us severe illness, but for those who are vulnerable, for those who are immunocompromised, um, they could be affected. And so I do see uh, vaccination as a community responsibility. And there is no doubt that by having the vaccines, it is preventing serious disease from occurring uh, to people and preventing deaths, and has been instrumental in allowing society to open both socially and economically. Murray. Uh, before I call Senator Babette, I'll remind senators once again that the conversations across the chamber are disorderly. And it is Senator Babette's opportunity to ask questions and for the minister to respond. Senator Babette, uh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. So we've now had over 11 million COVID cases that have been reported in Australia, and most Australians by now have some level of natural immunity or they've been vaccinated. Now, even New South Wales Premier Mr Dominic Perrottet recently said that there's no evidence that vaccines prevent transmission or impact transmission. Uh, you know, potentially, I think you may have misled the Senate. Now, let's go back to the, to the uh, very start, specifically Pfizer. Did Pfizer test whether the COVID-19 vaccine prevented transmission before rolling it out? Uh, thank you, Senator Bitt. Senator Ayres, I've called you to order a number of times during question time. I'm asking you to respect when I call you to order and not continue to call out. Minister. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, President. On the issue of uh, Pfizer and whether the vaccine was uh, tested for, uh, to, in response to its ability to prevent community transmission, I will have to take that on notice. Happy, happy to come back. 
But it was. A, I mean, I think we do have to understand that. Uh, the approval processes for these vaccines were done uh, very quickly in the eye of a pandemic. Uh, they followed the safety uh, procedures as required, and the TGA had a rigorous assessment process for approval of those vaccines. And there is no doubt that the vaccines have helped prevent serious illness and death in thousands and thousands of Australians. I mean, I think. You're very fortunate if you've had COVID and you haven't had serious disease and it hasn't required hospitalisation or caused your death. But failing to vaccinate people would have resulted in a lot more deaths. It uh, would thank have. You, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator De Bebeck, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Obviously, you failed to answer my question there, but I believe that your government continues to fail many Australians by not outlawing vaccine mandates. Now, you've got an opportunity here to make up for the previous government's failure, the previous Liberal government's mistakes. So I'll ask you one more time, you know, uh, do you believe that you've misled the Senate around your comments regarding community responsibility and the vaccines? Are you willing to retract those comments? Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I don't believe I have misled the Senate, and I take um, the remarks I make in this place really seriously like it, um, around that. Um, I do believe that vaccination is a community responsibility. I do believe it. If we all went around unvaccinated, there would be a whole range of diseases and illnesses in this country. And whilst it might not affect many of us in this chamber, although it would affect some of us, if you are immunocompromised, then the fact that people aren't vaccinated could have a significant and Senator serious Rennick. effect on your own Tell health. About science, like that is, that is the reality. That's the approach we take with the childhood vaccination program. It it's the approach that Senator we've taken Watt. with the pandemic, and there is no doubt. And despite Senator Rennick's interjections, there is evidence because the mortality rate from COVID is significantly reduced now that we have a highly vaccinated population. The evidence is in on that. Uh, Senator Rennick, I called you to order a number of times. There's ample opportunity during the week for you to put your opinion about a whole variety of questions and matters. Question time is not one of those. Uh, Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the committee is ensuring, sorry, on how the government is ensuring Australia's biggest emitters contribute their fair share towards emission reductions? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Watt. That's minister Watt. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Pratt for her question and for her advocacy over many, many years, like many on this side, for action on climate. And, uh, the government's safeguard mechanism reforms uh, are really the first chance in over a decade, over a decade for us to implement climate action that gets us towards net zero. And that's really the important thing, is how do we get towards the target, how do we get to the targets uh, that have been set that I, I, I thought that the opposition supported, but uh, more about them shortly. Uh, and Australian businesses are, are pleading for it because they know that reducing emissions is essential to their long-term competitiveness in a global net zero economy. We want to deliver sensible pro-climate reforms that the Australian people voted for and that business needs so they can reduce emissions. But those opposite, and really I think Senator Canavan is demonstrating it now, they, were, they, they oppose reforms because they, there is a pathology of political conflict over there. You're not interested in solutions. You're not actually interested in, in, in reducing emissions. You're not interested in, in actually having uh, a, a, market, a, a, a mechanism which enables the market to have certainty so we can deliver net zero which supposedly, supposedly you, you support in principle. You're not interested in that, but you are interested uh, in having conflict. The same old fights reheated for 2023. But of course, you have to ask the opposition, who are they actually fighting for? Who are you actually fighting for? You're not fighting for business. You're not fighting for businesses. Because we know the business community Senator support Wong, it. You're Senator not fighting Wong, for working order. Australians. You oppose order. both new jobs and secure jobs, order. whether it's the minimum Thank you. Please continue, Senator Wong. 
You're not fighting for working Australians. You oppose new jobs in your opposition to the National Reconstruction Fund, and you oppose a boost in the minimum wage. And you're not fighting for families because you voted no to energy price relief just weeks before Christmas. So the question Thank to you is, Senator whose Wong, side are you on? Your time for answering has expired. I'm going to wait until there's silence before I call Senator Pratt. Senator Mackenzie. It seems to be a habit of yours that the minute I call order, you continue to call out. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. President, can the minister highlight the opportunities presented by the Albanese government's plans and what the potential costs of squandering those opportunities would be? Minister Wong. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Um uh, Senator Pratt, and, and you're right. These are uh, these are uh, plans where there are, is a great deal of cost to all of us across the economy, across the community, if those opportunities are squandered. And I'd remind the chamber that the proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism have been carefully designed, following ne nearly six months of consultation, and it has broad support across the community. Uh, and if I could go back to my first answer, which is, you know, what, who are the, you know, what are you fighting for? Because you, you, you know, you, you're fighting against business, you're fighting against working families, you're fighting against those on the minimum wage, but you know, they're actually even fighting themselves. They're actually fighting themselves because these are reforms that were first proposed by. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, these are the same reforms that your party room uh, signed off, and you're so determined to pick a fight, you're actually fighting against your own policy. So, so determined to pick a fight, you're even fighting against your own policy. Order, order. At Senator Watt and Senator Rennick. Um, Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister please outline the impact of the Albanese government's proposed reforms uh, and the impact that will have on certainty of investment and, any, and what threats there may be to that certainty? Thank you. Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Pratt. And uh, we on this side of the chamber understand that without certainty the market doesn't move. Uh, and if you want a demonstration of that, you can see the failed, 22 failed policies of those yep. opposite, uh, and the way that smashed investment uh, in the in the uh, generation sector. Uh, and businesses know that. Uh, and I refer to recent media this week. Uh, where there was a headline to, in the AFR saying coalition blocking the best shot at net, net zero success, where it was reported that big business, big business has urged the federal opposition to back the government's safeguard mechanism requiring big polluters to bring down emissions, warning a lack of bipartisan support could jeopardise the enormous Minister Wong. private investment. Minister Wong. Minister Wong. Uh, order. order. I have a senator on his feet. Order, um, Minister, uh, Senator Watt. Um, point of order, uh, President. I just draw your attention to the fact that Senator Rennick continues S to try to disrupt Senator the Watt. procedures, Senator despite Watt. your repeated requests Senator not to. Watt. Order, 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 Senator Watt. Senator Watt, order. That is not a point of order. Um, Minister Wong, please continue. I can't remember where I was. <laughs> uh, so what, I mean, what we have is business themselves saying that your lack of bipartisan support could jeopardise, and I quote, the enormous private investment needed for the clean energy transition. I mean, you're, you, are, you are seeking to again uh, to thank just you, be Senator records. Wong. Your time your has expired. Senator Patterson, first. Uh, Thank you, Madam your... President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs and Cyber Security, Senator Watt. The European Union, Canada, the United States, and other jurisdictions have banned TikTok on government devices because they regard the risk posed by the app as unacceptable. Overnight, the Director of the FBI reaffirmed the serious threat of backdoor espionage and interference from TikTok. Of 53 Australian government departments and agencies who responded, only 25, less than half, confirmed an outright ban. 
Why has the Albanese government not followed our like-minded partners and banned the app on government devices? Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, it is interesting. I, I, I recognise that Senator Patterson is someone here who does take issues of cybersecurity and national security seriously, uh, but I can't help noticing that he and all of his colleagues have taken a lot more interest in these issues since they entered opposition than they ever did when they were in power and had the opportunity to do so. Uh, I also observe that poor old Senator Rennick up the back there he never seems to get a question, and maybe one day he'll get the opportunity to ask questions as well. Uh, the fact is that since our government, the Albanese government, has been in power, we have absolutely lifted the game of the Australian government when it comes to cyber security to move beyond the derelict system that was left behind by the former government. The Albanese government is committed to ensuring all Australians are aware of the challenges of protecting themselves online. And as I say, as I say, all the people who now have all the questions in the world had, have am had ample opportunity to do something about this issue themselves as members of a nearly 10-year-old government that ended only a few months ago. It wasn't that long ago that Senator Patterson was asking me questions about the cameras uh, that are in departmental buildings, and again, something that the former government not only could have done something about but maybe could have stopped happening in the first place. Uh, so I welcome this newfound interest in these issues from members of the opposition, including Senator Patterson, uh, and I would welcome the support uh, of the opposition to the reforms that this government is putting, putting in place. Uh, Minister uh, Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Patterson. Uh, on relevance, Madam President, my question was about TikTok. We're one minute, one minute and 30 seconds into the minister's answer, and the word TikTok has not passed his lips. Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. Um, I'm, I am going to direct the minister uh, to the question, but I'll go to Senator Wong. If you've made the order, I'll, I'll just point. Um, minister, um, Senator Patterson asked specific questions about government departments in, in relation to TikTok, and um, I need you to be relevant to that question. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, well, as I think uh, Senator Patterson is aware, the Minister for Home Affairs is conducting a review of all social media platforms, and the government will consider the recommendations of that review, a review I might say never occurred under the former government. Uh, the concerns regarding TikTok are not new, uh, and they've been in public for some time. And again, there could have been something done about this by the former government if they thought that it was actually a concern. Um, but as I say, the minister is conducting this review. The attorney general has also requested advice on whether a government-wide ban is required to address uh, protective security Watt. risks. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. In July last year, TikTok Australia first admitted in a letter to me that Australian TikTok user data can be accessed in China. In December, the company admitted to using the app to spy on journalists. Why has the Albanese government failed to act for eight months on this important cybersecurity matter? Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson, Minister. Seriously, eight, why have we not acted within eight months when you're part of a government that was in power for nearly 10 years? Uh, and, and, you know, why were you asleep at the wheel on these issues uh, amongst Minister everything Watt? else for Minister nearly Watt, eight years? Please resume your seat. Order. 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 Senator Patterson is entitled to have his question answered, and I would ask you on my left in particular to respect the quiet minister. Thank you, President. Uh, unlike the succession of failed former coalition governments, the Albanese Labor government is taking a considered deliberate approach to better regulating how digital platforms access and store consumer information. Uh, the Minister for Home Affairs has asked her department to consider all options to address data access and usage concerns as they relate to TikTok and other social media companies. I don't recall the former government ever doing that, uh, but this minister and this government has done so. Uh, the concerns about the security of Australians' data on social media are well known, and they are not limited to TikTok. Current policy and legislative settings do not give Australians the information or the confidence that their personal data is being protected and secu uh, stored securely, and we're doing something Thank about you, it. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Patterson, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Will the Minister commit to a time frame to ban TikTok from government devices? 
Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Uh, well, as I say, the minister is undertaking that review, but what I can guarantee you is that this government <laughs> will do something about this well within the nearly 10 years, uh, that the timeline, that your government sat on its hands and did nothing about these things. Uh, I truly hope that we are in power Order. for that sort of length of time. Uh, but however long it takes, we're going to get this Order. done. We've already started work on it within our first 12 months in office, as opposed uh, to the former government, which did absolutely nothing for nearly 10 years, and all of a sudden has become wise after the fact. Uh, if only, if only you'd had this sort of insight when you were in government. If only. But 10 years went by. Nothing was done, uh, and now, yet again, mess that we've got to clean up. So I have every confidence that this minister and this government will take action as quickly as possible to address these issues. The reviews are underway. The Attorney General is seeking advice. Things that never occurred under the former government. We take national security seriously. We take cyber security seriously, and that's why we're acting on it. Thank you, um, Minister. What, uh, Senator Sheldon? My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Last year, nearly 70 per cent of Australians lived in a natural disaster zone. Can the minister outline what steps the Albanese government is taking to make sure Australians are better prepared and better protected for natural disasters? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Sheldon, uh, for, about another, for another question on an issue that I know you are very uh, interested in. Uh, and work very hard on. And I might, just before I directly answer the question, just note that yet again in Northern Australia uh, we are facing some very serious rainfall, particularly in the Northern Territory uh, and northwest Queensland over coming days, an area that I know Senator Macdonald is very familiar with. Uh, Senator McGreen, I think, has spoken about this issue as well. And I know that all of our well wishes go to people in those areas to stay safe. Uh, please remain aware of emergency warnings in coming days and, of course, uh, that famous slogan that too many people ignore, if it's flooded, forget it. Um, so let's all take care over the coming days. But, Senator Sheldon, uh, as you know, uh, the Albanese government knows that as Australia faces more intense and more frequent natural disasters due to climate change, we need to be better prepared. And that's why we've established the Disaster Ready Fund, our flagship Disaster Resilience and Mitigation Fund. The Disaster Ready Fund will invest up to $200 million in federal funding every year uh, in disaster mitigation and resilience measures. And where possible, that funding will be matched by states, territories and local governments where they are partners in these projects. Now, these measures that this fund will provide the funding for could be used for everything from seawalls to evacuation centres and drainage improvements uh, to things like community preparedness plans and training programs. And I'm pleased to say that applications for the first round of our new Disaster Ready Fund closed on Monday this week, and they are now being assessed by an independent panel. Now, that funding won't become available until 1 July this year, but we've deliberately got moving quickly early in this year so that we're ready to go uh, once that time frame arrives. We also know that we need targeted support for communities still recovering from the devastating 2022 February-March floods, along with all of the other floods that we saw last year. As I mentioned earlier this week, we've, we, we recently announced uh, the first phase of funding uh, for the Northern Rivers, and there's going to be a lot more to come because uh, mitigation thank you, matters. Minister Watt, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, uh, first supplementary. Can the minister outline how the Albanese government's approach to disaster preparedness compares to previous Commonwealth government approaches? Uh, minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Sheldon. Well, I can. Um, and one, mil one, mi one minute will absolutely be enough time to outline uh, the Albanese government's approach and how that compares to what we saw from the former government. Uh, in fact, I could really just mention the former government's approach very quickly because the answer is not much. Uh, who could forget the former government's infamous nearly $5 billion emergency response fund? Established in 2019, in three years, the Coalition's Emergency Response Fund didn't release a single cent in recovery funding and didn't complete a single mitigation project. What it did do, of course, was raise nearly $1 billion in interest for the former government, while actually doing nothing to assist Australians with disaster mitigation or disaster recovery. Now, who knows what kind of damage could have been avoided, uh, what kind of loss could have been avoided if the former government had used that fund uh, in the way it was constructed uh, to provide for mitigation. Unlike the former government, the Albanese government believes in planning for future events, not waiting for Thank them to you, happen. Thank you, Minister Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Can the minister outline any threats to the Albanese government's commitment to ensuring Australians are better prepared and better protected from natural disasters? And before oh, they become humanitarian disasters. Sorry, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. 
Uh, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Sheldon. Uh, now, we have known for years that the federal government has needed to significantly increase its investment in protecting communities from natural disasters. All the way back in 2015, the Productivity Commission recommended that the federal government should invest $200 million every year in disaster mitigation and resilience across Australia. But what did the former coalition government do? Absolutely nothing, as we saw in so many other areas of policy. For years, they ignored the advice of the Productivity Commission before eventually setting up this emergency response fund, which failed uh, to release a single cent in recovery funding and didn't complete a single mitigation project. In fact, when the legislation was being passed to create the then Emergency Response Fund, the only reason it even provided for mitigation funding was because Labor insisted on it as an amendment uh, when we were still in opposition. So it's no wonder that we have such a big backlog of mitigation projects right around the country. We're starting to work through that backlog with the Disaster Ready Fund, and I look forward to working with Thank states you, and Minister, territories to implement it. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I move to take note of answers by the government to opposition questions number two and three. What we see in question time, day after day, is rhetoric uh, as opposed to reality. Before the election, uh, the rhetoric of the government was about no changes to superannuation. No changes to superannuation. But after the election, not just comments from the opposition, but if you look at the financial services media on the 28th of February this year, they said, and I quote, Labor's super tax reform moves the goalposts again, end quote. And so what the industry sector is saying is that this is a broken promise and the goalposts have been moved again. And I note that when it comes to goalposts, the Labor has form on this. In the area of national security and defence, the former Defence Secretary, uh, in, a, in a speech uh, here in Canberra, highlighted that the then Labor government made such a number of changes to strategic guidance and funding for defence that, in his words, the goalposts weren't just moved, they were cut down and used for firewood. And so when they come into this place and they talk about 10 years of wasted time, of the worst government ever, and they try and refer to things like defence, you have to compare the reality of what the former secretary highlighted of their poor governance, of their broken promises and their inadequate funding with the record of the coalition that actually increased funding from a record low since World War II up to an excess of 2 per cent, brought about things like the integrated investment plan to make sure that we had not only the headline capabilities but also all the enabling things like infrastructure that we need to have a capable defence force. And in estimates this year, the Defence Department confirmed that that was the first time a measure like that had taken place, which was actually some of the best governance they had seen in the area of defence. And so this rhetoric we see from those opposite about poor government, uh, which they also go to manufacturing. They talk about the fact that manufacturing has been downplayed, but what we see in reality was under the coalition government, things like the Modern Manufacturing Initiative actually led to a huge amount of investment and more apprentices in training than at any other time in Senator Australia's Reed. history. The reality under Labor now is that one of the most promising sectors in Australia's industrial sector, which the coalition invested in heavily and, in fact, established Australia's first space agency to give a focal point for investment, that this government, in their industrial funding and their plan, have omitted. And the space industry is alarmed at the lack of continuity 
and support from the government in this area. The other rhetoric we saw before the election, like the super, was around power prices. $275, we heard time and again from the government that their policies would drive down prices. But what we see in reality is that prices are going up. They went up 18 per cent last year. Today, in the paper, indications there will be more pain, with the standing offer planning to go up by nearly 20 per cent uh, because of the policies of this government, which are run, run largely on ideology and rhetoric. Because if you compare with other nations, and let's take the Biden administration in the US, their inflation reduction bill, which was passed last year, looks to reduce the cost of living and particularly one of the energy measures. So unlike the government here that says variable renewables will get us to net zero and will drive down prices, the Biden administration has taken the engineering and the science of people like the International Energy Agency, the OECD, the Princeton University report, and has said the science tells us that the cheapest way to get clean and reliable energy that will drive down emissions is to actually increase nuclear power in your economy. And so they have brought in tax measures to incentivise their industry to increase the nuclear power in the states from 92 gigawatts to nearly double by 2050. So that is policy that is based on evidence and science, not rhetoric. So whether we're talking about superannuation, whether we're talking about national security, whether we're talking about manufacturing, whether we're talking about cost of living or about having clean, reliable and affordable power, don't listen to the rhetoric of those opposite. Look at what they've done and compare it with the successful outcomes of people who base policy on engineering and Senator, science. Thank you. Senator, Senator White. Thank you. The reality is we've been upfront about the challenges that we've been in inherited. We've been left with a trillion dollars of debt with little to show for it. The, you know, we've seen aged care in crisis and a decade of neglect in Medicare. So we've got to make tough decisions because people, at, people in Australia are making tough decisions around their kitchen table. So we, we as a responsible government, have got, got to make tough and responsible decisions around the, cab the cabinet table. Back in 2016, um, the member for Hume talked about tough decisions when he said, well, it's very simple. We need a fairer superannuation system which has integrity. And this means that those of us who can afford to pay should be paying our fair share. The situation we, ha we had was some people were contributing millions of dollars into super, and it's totally inappropriate that someone who has contributed millions and millions of dollars continues to get 15% concessions. So who said that? That was the member for Hume in 2016, the current member for Hume, the shadow treasurer. So what we are doing is not just talking about it. We are looking at curbing tax breaks for those with over $3 million in super, a very small, modest change. So 30% of earnings over, uh, 30 on earnings over $3 million instead of 15%. It is still a tax, uh, it is still a tax break, and it is, it is, but it is not uh, the 15 per cent, it is 30 per cent, and it affects a very small number of people, and it only takes effect in 2025. It will affect fewer than 0.5 per cent of Australians with super balances over $3 million. 99.5 per cent will see, of people in Australia will see no changes to their super. In contrast, those opposite froze the SGC three times in 2014, 2020 and 2021, and millions of Australians lost millions of dollars in super and will be poorer in retirement for, as a result of it. It wasn't 0.5 per cent who were affected by that SGC freeze. It was millions of Australians. I have seen myself personally many, many members of the, my former union who are going to live in poverty in retirement because those opposite froze the SGC, um, modest amounts of money, but big money for those people uh, who were affected. That's what you did in retirement. What we are proposing for those in retirement, what we are proposing is a modest, modest change. It is responsible, it's modest, and it's to keep super strong and fair.
Super was designed to make sure working people have security and dignity in retirement. Your freeze of the SGC didn't deliver that in any way, shape or form. It is condemning people into poverty in retirement because you froze it three times—2014, 2020 and 2021. Women were badly affected by this, and it is on your shoulders. So to hear what what I've heard in the last few days about this very modest um, proposal that is going to affect those, that, those uh, who have $3 million balances in super is, is just incredibly hard to take. But then what else would we expect from the people who have brought us robo-debt? Again, watching that Royal Commission and seeing what has happened to the, the poorest people in our society, how, how, as Alan Tudge said, we will find you, we'll track you down, and, and you will have to repay those debts, and you may end up in prison. That is your legacy. That is what you did. We are proposing a very modest change that is only going to affect a small number of people. And let's be clear, there were more people at the Ed Sheeran con concert last weekend in Melbourne than there are affected by these changes. That's the thing you should think about. The, and, and yet you, SGC, frozen three times. Millions of Australians lost money and are going to be in poverty and retirement because of what you did. We forget about that. Absolutely forget about that. And again, we've heard from the member for Fadden admit for the Royal Commission that he lied about robo debt because loyalty to his colleagues mattered more, not loyalty to the people of Australia. And what a perfect summary of this entire time in government that you had loyalty to yourselves, not to the Australian people. Senator Antic. Thank you, um, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The, um, the late great Margaret Thatcher once made the observation that um, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. Uh, and that is what the Australian people are in the early stages of uh, understanding as we speak right now. The Labor Party, however, do not understand that Senator this is Pratt. not uh, their money. This is not their money. We're dealing with the money of the Australian people, with the workers of Australia. Superannuation is not your money. It's not your money. You didn't work for it. And despite the assistant uh, treasurer's uh, views that we heard this afternoon repeated that uh, this was simply honey which could be taken from the hive, uh, this is not the manner in which the Australian people view their own hard-working savings. Um, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer uh, have basically gone back on their promise. They, they, these are changes that they said they would not make at the election. Uh, and we are seeing history repeating itself here with the same old, the same old Labor Party. This is, this is what I imagine uh, for the voters of Australia, the 31 per cent of them or 32 per cent of them or whatever it was, that voted Labor um, must have at least thought they were going to get something different out of the other end of the pipe. This is a bit like uh, what I imagine it must like, be like to be a North Melbourne supporter at the start of a football season, just thinking that the new season is going to bring something different. and yet come about round four, about where we're up to, all we're seeing is clangers and kicks out of bounds on the full. And, uh, so this is what we're seeing. We're seeing, uh, and, and, and let's be honest, despite all of that, it doesn't matter how many parades the Prime Minister goes off and, and marches in, doesn't matter uh, how many colourful parades he goes and marches in, doesn't matter how many uh, you know, all expenses paid trips he, he takes to go and visit the global glitterati, uh, the, uh, you know, the little fella from Ukraine, whatever his name is, in the green t-shirt. Whatever his name is, anyway, who cares? Uh, he, he, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. It does not matter because ultimately, ultimately, well, I can't remember what his name is. He's just on the screen all the time. But anyway, um, it doesn't matter because ultimately, what happens here is we get the same recycled product over and over and over and over again. They're making it up as this they go along. Senator Antics, sorry, oh, I oh, have here we go. Senator this is good. Seat. Senator Ayers. Point of order, I, um, uh, acting uh, deputy president. Uh, that was an extraordinary reflection uh, on the uh, leader of Ukraine, uh, who, for I thought everybody uh, in this place, has been a symbol of uh, a, uh, a a very is, is important struggle for for democracy and freedom. And you want to ask him to withdraw that? 
Uh, I will take some advice from the chair because Senator Shoebridge had my attention at the time. Thank you, Clark. Uh, there is no point of order on reflections on leaders of other countries, uh, but I will invite the senator to withdraw or, or contain his remarks, if he will. Just the uh, senator, I'll withdraw any uh, in, improper applications. Just making an observation as to his uh, appearance, but in any event, uh, we'll move on. So anyway, we'll move on. Uh, yeah, I've got senator respect for democracy. I've got respect for senator democracy. Thank you, thank you. Interjections, thank you. Thank you, uh, Acting De Deputy President. Now, what I was saying was that Labor are making this up Senator as they go along. And within the past two weeks, the Prime Minister has let's go through this. The Prime Minister has refused to rule out further changes to superannuation. The Treasurer has refused to rule out changes to negative gearing. The Treasurer has also refused to rule out changes to capital gains tax, including the imposition on the family home. And then the Prime Minister uh, rushed out and said, no, we won't touch your house. And the Treasurer said, oh, well, I guess that's right. So we, we know where this is headed, Mr Acting Deputy President. We know it. This is a slippery slope. This begins and ends with CGT, with franking credits, with further shifting of the goalposts. That's, that is what we are seeing here. And as Peter Dutton points out ahead of the, elec the, the election, Labor promised solemnly they weren't going to change the goalposts on super. The Prime Minister was unambiguous on that. And now, less than a year into government, we're talking about 10 months into government, uh, the goalposts have been shifted. And it's clear that Mr Albanese and Dr Chambers, the Chalmers, uh, are coming after more of your money. We know that now. We've seen it. The Australian people have seen it. And it's too late for them. As they, Labor simply won't slow down on this. They can't control their own spending and they won't, they won't stop coming after our money. And to believe them that they say out of $150 billion that they're going to be satisfied with $2 billion out of revenue is just an absurdity. It's just simply not, not going to happen. Uh, Bill Shorten was talking about this when he was the Labor leader. Uh, but at least in that instance, and we all remember that fateful campaign, Bill Shorten had the decency to be honest with the Australian people. And his plans uh, before the 2019 election, uh, unfortunately, this current Prime Minister can't do that. And on top of all of that, uh, the Labor's claim is plainly wrong. Their claim that the superannuation policy change will only affect 80,000 people. Uh, is wrong. Um, over the time, the number of Australians taxed will increase dramatically uh, because of the reasons I've already outlined. We know this coming after more. Labor's being tricky, and you cannot Senator take the uh, trust on tax. And the Grattan Institute has estimated within 30 years, uh, about one in 10 workers will begin to retire with super balances of around three Senator million dollars. Senator O'Neill, I've called you a few times now, please. Two hundred. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. That two hundred times more people than the government is claiming. Young people are going to lose out under this policy, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, an independent analysis has shown that a 25-year-old retiring in 40 years will see the tax on the super double, at Senator the equivalent Antic, of a, just a million dollars expired. today. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I just want to start by saying what an absolute disgrace that last contribution was to our parliament, an absolute Absolutely. disgrace on what I thought was bipartisanship, support of the efforts in Ukraine, their leader, President Zelensky. You might not care about our international relationships and the responsibility with which we carry that seriously, but we certainly take it seriously. We stood in the House of Representatives chamber exactly. all together with both leaders of the House, with both leaders of this place, all leaders of this place, in solidarity with Ukraine. Mere lip service, given what this senator has just said, and I'm not going to repeat the disrespectful comments. Lip service. That is all this government is former opposition is worth. This opposition is worth lip service. Absolute lip service. Just like we've seen. When, when the leader of the opposition Senator, talked about— Senator Stewart, can I bring you back to the, the question? That, he raised it. it? No, he raised that's, it. that's not what take note is for. I'm, I'm sorry. He I talked have, about the Prime Minister travelling. Please take your seat, Senator Stewart. I, I've had advice from the clerk that you need to be relevant to the question. I please just ask you to go back to the, the motions that were put by Senator Fawcett. Please re resume. 
Thank you. I, I was making comments, given that he raised them in, in his contributions to this parliament. I felt like it deserved a response to restate Absolutely. how seriously we take are, our, our relationship. There are many um, opportunities to make contributions different to this, but this is you must be take, uh, responding to the question put by Senator Fawcett, please. Thank you, Deputy Acting Chair. Back to the topic of superannuation. I'll say calm myself after that dis disgraceful display. We've made our priorities clear as a government about who we stand for, and that is for the Australian working people. Those opposite have made it clear who they stand for. The 18 people, 17 people with over $100 million in their superannuation balance, one person with over $400 million in their super superannuation balance, that's who they stand for. 0.5 per cent of the Australian population, some of the worst, wealthiest people in our, our country, and good on them, but they shouldn't be asking taxpayers who work on the factory line, our nurses and our teachers, to be paying the $2 billion that, in, in taxes that, that we will get from these changes in, in the first year. These are very modest. I know people love the word modest in this chamber. Very modest and sensible changes. Yeah. Very modest and sensible changes. And we've already heard some quotes today from, from uh, those opposite who agree from back in 2016 about, about having to make some changes to, to the superannuation in this country. We are the government for the Australian working people. They are the opposition for the half a per cent. It was great to hear Peter Dutton make his first election promise for 2025, reinstating tax breaks for those 17 people with over $100 million in their superannuation and for that one person, that one lucky person, Peter, Peter Dutton is on your side with over $400 million in your superannuation. We have finally found something the Leader of the Opposition will stand up for, show some spine for. It's certainly not veterans at risk of homelessness. It's not women fleeing family violence. It's not Australian manufacturing. It's not business looking for energy security. Not families seeking cheaper childcare. Not people needing cheaper medicine. Not households seeking energy bill relief. No to any of those things, but if you're one of those lucky 18, he's got your back. When it comes to the wealthiest half a half percent, those opposite have your back. Last week, we heard the federal member for Fadden admit to the, that, about the Royal Commission that he lied about robo-debt because loyalty to his colleagues mattered more than loyalty to the Australian people. Shame. What a perfect summary of the entire time in government. Loyalty to themselves and not to the Australian people. Shame. And I think it's a bit rich for those opposite to, to, to sit over there and talk to us about trust when I'm pretty sure that, I don't know, a, a, a former Prime Minister just appointing himself to a couple of portfolios might, might warrant or it might be considered a bit of a broken promise to the Australian people. I don't know, not being there when the country's on fire or going underwater might be considered a, you know, breaking a promise to the Australian people to have their backs. An absolute indictment. There were more people at the Ed Sheeran concert, thank you to Senator White for pointing this out, last weekend than there, were, than there will be affected by these changes. An absolute disgrace. We know who those opposite are on Senator the side Stewart, of. Senator your time yeah, has yeah. expired. Uh, Senator Ayres. Um, if I may, just on a point of order and seeking um, some further clarification, and I'm, and I'm happy, uh, 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 Mr Acting Deputy Chair, if you come back to the chamber later. You're, I, I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the contribution before, but um, you directed Senator Stewart to return to the, um, the uh, motion moved by Senator Fawcett uh, and indicated to her that she should uh, not continue to reflect on the comments that Senator Antic made. Uh, his extraordinary, I won't go into them, but extraordinary reflection 
uh, on the president of Ukraine. And I do accept uh, that, that, ju just that, 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 that Senator Stewart uh, did say that all of us were there for that photo uh, uh, in solidarity with Ukraine. It's, it's not the Senator, case that Senator, Senator Antic was there, is, but I would appreciate I would appreciate. What is your request? I would appreciate uh, some clarification of whether or not senators are entitled to reflect on the comments of the senators before them in the ordinary debate and the take note. Thank you, uh, Senator Ayres. As I as I said before, um, I was distracted by Senator Shoebridge when the remark was made, so I did not hear it. Uh, the clerk gave me advice that uh, the senator wasn't being relevant to the motion that it had been put. Um, and that was the basis of, of my ruling. Um, if, you, if you accept that, otherwise I'm, I'm happy to go away and, and, uh, and review it with the clerks and come back. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, modest seems to be the word of this week. And uh, let me tell you, I certainly agree that Labor has much to be modest about, in fact embarrassed about, in relation uh, to their broken promises. So they might not think that modest changes matter, but absolutely on this side we know they do. There is nothing modest about their broken promises, and particularly in relation to superannuation. So it was modest because it only relates to a small percentage of hard-working Australians. What did they say? 0.5%? But guess what? It was actually 10 per cent, and I wouldn't be surprised if it actually turns out to be much more than 10 per cent of hard-working Australians. And who are these hard-working Australians? They are the people who have worked hard all their lives to earn their money and to put money into superannuation. They are farmers, they are veterans on defined benefit schemes, and they are many other Australians. There is nothing modest about what you are proposing to do to them. And anyway, even if it was modest and not a broken promise, why are you doing this? Why are you t taking people's money away from them from their retirement if it is so modest? It does not make sense. So really, let's call a spade a spade. This modest proposal is actually a broken promise. So no matter how much they try to say modest, 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 Every time the Australian people hear the Labor Party say that, it means broken promise and it means they are raiding your superannuation. Australians are very smart and wise people. They know their super is their money. It is not the government's money. It is not the union's money. It is not super fund money. It is their own money that you are taking from them despite promising before the election that you would not. So let's have a look at what Labor actually promised every hard-working Australian in this nation. Before the election, Jim Chalmers, now the Treasurer, promised that there were going to be no new tax increases. He said those exact words. Labor has broken that promise. Labor has said it will now double taxes on super. And you really have to ask what will be next, because once you know that once you've broken one promise, many others will come. They are clearly either being so duplicitous and, frankly, lying to the Australian people when they come. Oh well, we've just had this little idea here. It's modest. It's reasonable. We said we wouldn't do this before the election, but hey, it's modest. Let's just do it anyway and take people's money away from them. So. In the last three weeks alone, the Prime Minister has not only refused to rule out further, further changes to superannuation—again, they said they would make none—the Treasurer has refused to rule out changes to negative gearing. The Treasurer has also refused to rule out changes to capital gains tax, including imposition on the family home. Then the Prime Minister rushed out and said, oh, 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 the Treasurer shouldn't have said that. Uh, no, we won't touch your house, but that is still not saying you won't make changes to capital gains tax. And then the Treasurer said, mm, uh, oops, sorry, I guess the Prime Minister is right. But clearly the Prime Minister of this nation and the Treasurer of this nation cannot be trusted 
uh, whenever and whatever they say, particularly before what they said before the last election. And those of us who are old enough to remember previous Labor governments will know that this is Socialism 101. It is the politics of envy. It is the politics of division, because they start taking from people who have worked hard and have bigger bank balances, have bigger incomes, have bigger superannuation, and then they keep widening it and widening it and widening it so that so many working Australians who have worked hard for their money do not have it anymore. So what else have this government done? Um, since this government came into power less than a year ago, they have had nine consecutive interest rate rises, which is putting a profound stress on all Australians who have a mortgage. It's looking pretty grim out there, and everywhere I go, people are saying how much this Labor government has negatively impacted on their cost of living. And sadly, there will be more cost of living pressures put Thank on the, by this Labor government. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. So I'll put the question moved by Senator Fawcett. All those in favour, say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from Minister Watt in relation to silicosis. Um, and I was particularly troubled by the lack of any coherent response from the government regarding the insurance crisis in the industry and the impact that will have, almost certainly, on any worker who comes down with silicosis um, from this day forward and, indeed, going back to September of 2020. It's a fact that the major supplier of dangerous manufactured stone in Australia is Caesar Stone, and it's facing a global insurance crisis, leaving workers, fabricators and home renovators who contract silicosis with their product from their product without any protection. And I would have thought the government would be on top of that issue, because Caesar Stone is a company that's been allowed to recklessly travel down the same path of James Hardy in, that James Hardy did with asbestos leaving thousands of injured fabricators and home renovators with a deadly disease and no insurance coverage to pay their claims. In many ways, the risks are even greater from manufactured stone than with James Hardy. Manufactured stone producers have no production facilities or other assets in Australia to meet claims in the absence of insurance. James Hardy at least had assets in the jurisdiction. And so that means whenever Caesar's own thinks it's no longer profitable to be involved in the Australian market, they can cease operating. And given the lack of insurance, there will be zero assets from which fabricators, home renovators, workers with silicosis can recover damages from. They will be left with a deadly disease and no remedy at all. This is why the Greens have been calling for a ban on silicosis since 2020. This is why we've supported the CFMEU's call for a ban. This is a deadly product in an industry that's been allowed to run like cowboys completely like cowboys. Because of the known risk of silicosis litigation, it, Caesar Stone has been unable to obtain any insurance coverage for silicosis-related claims in Australia since September 2020. And most of the company's global insurance products actually have ex specific exclusions that mean they exclude damages related to exposure for hazardous dust, because the insurance industry has known for years about the deadliness of this, in, of, of this dust. And we know this not because of, the work, because of Safe Work's work in the space. Safe Work has been saying, oh, they can continue having the product provided everyone wears a mask and they do wet cutting and they um, have additional filtering. Safe Work has been complicit in allowing manufactured stone to continue to be used across the country and has been complicit in thousands and thousands of workers being exposed to toxic levels of silica dust leading to them contracting silicosis. Safe work is part of the problem. We know about Caesar Stone's lack of insurance, not because of Safe Work's um, activity in the space. We know because it's in the financial disclosures that Caesar Stone gives to the US Securities and Exchange Commission. And that makes it clear there is this complete absence of insurance. And I'll just read from part of that disclosure from Caesar Stone to the US Securities Exchange. It says in part, we, have, we currently have limited product liability insurance policies, which apply it to us and our subs subsidiaries and cover claims relating to bodily injuries, though in most cases these policies exclude damages caused by exposure to hazardous, hazardous dust. That's what Caesar Stone is telling the US authorities, and they, they say this. 
For example, as of September 2020, our Australian product liability insurance ceased coverage of newly diagnosed silicosis-related claims. Such events might have a materially adverse effect on our business and results of operations. They've, they've said it in black and white. And what's the Australian government done? Nothing to stop the product. What's safe work done? Nothing. Um, and, and, and it is deeply offensive, of course, when you read Caesar Stone's reports. The only thing they're concerned about is the cost of business. They don't once mention in their reports the likelihood, in fact, the certainty of thousands and thousands of workers contracting silicosis because of this. They, um, Caesar Stone also said this. Since 2008, we've been named either directly or as a third party defendant in numerous lawsuits alleging damages allegedly caused by exposure to RCS related to our products, filed by individuals, including fabricators and their employees and our former employees, their successors, employers, the State of Israel, and in subrogation claims made by the NII. Work cover of several states in Australia and others as of December 31, 2021. Uh, we were subject to pending lawsuits with respect to 154 injured persons globally, of which 114 were in Israel, 38 in Australia and two in the United States. And we've received pre-litigation demand letters with respect to an additional 18 persons, in each case relating mainly to silicosis claims. And they say this since 2008 and through to December 31. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Your time has expired. Uh, I put the question moved by Senator Shoebridge. All those in favour say aye. Against, say no. The ayes have it. Uh, we'll now move to tabling consideration of committee reports and government responses. I call the government whip. We go first. Oh, sorry, uh, Minister. <laughs> I present the government's response to the report of the Economics Legislation Committee on its examination of annual reports tabled by 30 April 2010 and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator uh, thank you. Um, I present additional information received by committees relating to estimates. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights Scrutiny Report 2 of 2023. And on behalf of the Chair of the Education and Employment Legislation Committee, Senator Sheldon, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into provisions of the Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022 and a related bill. And on behalf of the Chair of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee, Senator Pratt, I present the report of the committee on its examination of annual reports tabled by 31 October 2022. Thank you. Thank you. No one's seeking the call to speak. Senator Stilljohn. Chair, just for your, um, just for your knowledge, I'll be uh, seeking to speak to the government response to the Joint Senate Standing Committee, the Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS's re uh, report on independent as assessments. The government response uh, to that report. Okay, which is coming. Yeah. yeah that that will be at item 10, 20 for your uh, help there, Senator Steelejohn. Uh, 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 Senator Scar. Mr Acting Deputy President, I do want to make a few short observations in relation to the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee examination of annual reports tabled um, on behalf of Senator Pratt. I, in the previous parliament, I served on that committee. and There is an important point in relation to annual reports which are prepared by government agencies and government departments. First, they should be prepared within time. They should be prepared within time. And there were three reports that were only prepared after the expiration of the quite reasonable amount of time which is given to government agencies to report. And to be frank, that is not good enough. That is not good enough. And there should be close examination of the agencies that failed to produce their public annual reports within the time which is provided for them an examination as to the reasons why. The second point is those annual reports should be released and made available in good time before budget estimates. So if we as senators in this place are to do our job as we should be doing it in terms of holding the executive to account, those annual reports are invaluable information. So we know what questions to ask. We have time to read the annual reports, absorb the information, as opposed to getting them perhaps one day before estimates starts or even after estimates. It is not good enough 
for annual reports to be prepared either out of time or not to be released in good time before the estimates process. And it's certainly something which I will be focusing on over this term of parliament and beyond, if I have the opportunity, uh, in, in that regard, because I don't think, I don't think it's good enough. Uh, I come from the private sector. You release your annual report before the shareholders meeting, not after. So the shareholders can ask questions. The same thing should apply even more so in the public sector, so that we as senators have the opportunity to ask questions that need to be asked and, indeed, the questions we, which we have a duty to ask on behalf of the many stakeholders in the Australian community. Thank you. No one else seeking the call. I'll put the question. The question is that we take uh, that the Senate take note of the reports. Uh, those that have opinions say aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Now we'll move to consideration of documents, uh, which are listed on page six to eight of the notice paper. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Senator Pocock. I, I did miss that. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. It's my pleasure uh, to present the final report of the Select Committee on Work and Care, yeah, yeah, yeah. together with the Hansard record of proceedings and accompanying documents uh, presented to the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. Over the past eight months, I've chaired this committee working with my colleagues, Deputy Chair Senator O'Neill, Senators White, Stewart, Askew, Bragg and Rustin. Together, we've looked at how Australians put together their jobs with the care of others. We've been ably assisted by the Senate's committee secretariat, led by Jane Thompson, and you all serve the Australian Senate and public so well. Thank you for your work. Particular thanks to the 125 organisations and individuals who wrote submissions and appeared at our 11 days of public hearings. It's been a fascinating privilege to hear directly about what is happening out there in the land of the working carer, from employers, workers, unions, community organisations and carers around the country. We offer the Senate a majority report. The great deal of agreement around the evidence of this inquiry reflects the power of what we have heard. It was consistent. It was convincing. I believe the level of agreement also reflects the fact that we committee members live the realities affected, affecting so many other Australians. We've done this work around the birth of Senator Stewart's baby, Ari, with grandchildren at our knees, our kids in the next room and amidst the usual raft of family crises. In short, normal juggling working life. In this way, we're part of a changed parliament that shares the changing work and care circumstances of other Australians, very different from the parliament of a century ago that set the terms of work for working carers last century. Things like the eight-hour day, the norm of full-time work. At that time, this parliament was entirely made up of men. That affected the shape of the labour laws that they wrote. The slow entry of women to this place explains why we did not get any Commonwealth childcare until 1973 and did not give working women a paid break after they had a baby until 2011, a hundred years after the ILO said it was a reasonable proposition. Today, around 6.5 million women hold jobs and half our workforce is female. Many of them are also carers. Women make, now make up 57 per cent of the Senate. This is a changed parliament in a changed world, and it's time for our working arrangements to reflect this. The powerful evidence we've heard explains our committee's agreement that we need to create better work and care arrangements that deliver greater fairness and equality. It's time for a new, comprehensive and integrated approach to our work and care challenges. Enough with the piecemeal. It's time for a coordinated national effort and for all levels of government to work together to deliver it. On any day of the week now, four in ten Australian workers have caring responsibilities while they are at work. Most of us, over the course of our lives, will care for somebody. We're living a 21st century juggle, but we are awaiting a 21st century support system as we deal with this new reality. Too many experience time poverty unpredictable hours, inflexible work. They feel the costs of this juggle in their household budgets, especially as inflation and the costs of care rise. We urgently need a new work and care regime, 
appropriate to the 21st century, one that does not rely on the individual adaptions of hyper-flexible, often overloaded workers who are also parents and carers, one that ensures secure, predictable hours and pay, one that makes the most of new technologies whilst not allowing workers um, to knock off when their hours are done, one that supports parents of babies to take adequate leave at birth at the international standard of 52 weeks and to access the quality, affordable early childhood education and care so essential to our kids and appropriate to a rich OECD nation. Care that should be free in the view of the Greens. A regime that does not run the labour market on the stress and sweat of a juggling worker or make the price of being both a worker and a carer a lifetime of low pay, insecurity, part-time work and poverty in retirement. Our report calls for more recognition of the work of carers at home. The unpaid care of Australians looking after older parents or friends or for disabled people amounts to $77 billion a year. Unpaid work, including that of parents, if you value it, adds up to half the value of Australia's GDP, yet many of these carers are living well below the poverty line. The effects of a work-life collision do not fall evenly. While they especially affect women, they also fall on so many young people, caring for family members as they try to get to school or to a job, immigrant workers who cannot get access to decent work or afford care and make up a large proportion of our low-paid care workforce. First Nations communities who need culturally appropriate childcare but can't find it. Low-income households who struggle to pay for care and disabled people and their families who'd like to see a transition away from low-paying disability enterprises into open employment. Yeah, yeah. The growing number of workers who are caring for an ageing parent but cannot find respite to take the pressure off. And it's time for a pay rise for care workers in childcare, aged care and disability care their work is undervalued and it doesn't reward their experience and their qualifications. We're seeing the very direct consequences of that today with news reports of shortfalls of thousands of aged care workers in a care workforce crisis. It's plain that we need to increase job security for many workers in our labour market. The most common strategy adopted by Australian working carers, part-time work, has left many women facing insecure jobs, insecure hours and pay, poor career paths and lack of access to training and, ironically, loss of key conditions for working carers like access to paid sick leave and paid holidays, long service leave, decent superannuation. At the other end of the hours spectrum, a sizeable pro proportion of men, a quarter, work long hours. So at one end, women on short hours, men on long hours. These arrangements cast long shadows. Too many senior jobs in areas like management have hours that are hostile to care and therefore off-limit to so many women. This also means that domestic work is off-limits to those men and loads up their partners, and all of this feeds into the gender pay gap. Amongst the biggest surprises to the committee, in my view, was evidence of widespread unpredictable rosters and working hours. And these conditions mean workers are too often at their employer's beck and call. Alongside this, new technologies that have brought welcome flexibility have also stretched the working day out alongside paid work, making it too hard for people to disconnect from their technologies at the end of the day. Our phones compete with our kids and then get in the way of our rest and recuperation. So it's time that workers had a right to disconnect from work. We know that without the care provided by workers and unpaid carers at home, we are all impoverished. Without it, there is no future labour supply and simply no economy. We heard powerful evidence about the importance of doing things better. If we can lift the employment participation of carers, mostly women, to reach the, reach the rate in countries that offer better paid parental leave and childcare, for example, we could increase our workforce participation rate on average by 4 per cent, and that would boost GDP, we heard evidence, by $100 billion. Now, some will point to the cost of doing these things, but they ignore that return on investment. And underinvestment in care means labour shortages, gender inequality and more stress for workers, especially women. 
We in the Greens believe this is a crisis that needs an urgent response. Our workforce and our community deserve it, and as a rich OECD country, we can afford it. We blow billions a year on super tax breaks that deliver very little for carers or workers in our care industries. The government is looking at giving a, trillion dollars in, uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars in stage three tax cuts to the very wealthy, and this could fund all that we recommend in this report and leave plenty of change. These are political choices. It does not have to be like this. What we do right now matters. Other countries do things differently, and we can too. The work arrangements of last, last century gave Australians a right to work. In the 21st century, it's time for a right to both work and care. I commend this report to the Senate. I hope it will create momentum for the change that so many Australians are looking for. And I thank my fellow senators for their hard work and their collegiality. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Askew. Thank you. I too rise to take note of the Select Committee on Work and Care final report. Firstly, I would like to thank the Work and Care Committee Secretariat, which has worked tirelessly over the past seven months to help the committee examine the impact that combining work and care responsibility has on the well-being of workers, carers and those they care for. We looked into the changing nature of work and how this aligned or didn't with caring commitments and the support systems and the policies Australia has in place, as well as overseas models. It has been a pleasure to work together with other members of this committee, particularly our Deputy Chair Senator O'Neill and, and Chair Senator Barbara Pahocock, and Senator White's here as well, I notice. Um, it's been a really conge uh, collegiate team working together across the seven months. The inquiry received more than 120 submissions from a variety of organisations and individuals. Committee members attended 11 hearings across the country between Albany, Western Australia and Melbourne in Victoria and many places in between to ensure that we had a, as full a picture as possible to assess the impact of concurrent working and caring. We appreciated the honest accounts expressed by witnesses in submissions and particularly during our hearings. Recommendations outlined in the Work and Care Final Report are aspirational and extensive, and unfortunately in some cases they do not take into account the significant implications such measures would have in the areas of education, social services and health, and workplace relations. The Australian labour market is diverse, which reflects the diversity within our population. We support all forms of work, full-time, part-time, casual, gig or a mix because it means Australian job seekers can find positions, arrangements and levels of work that fit around their needs. However, many recommendations in the report, often reflecting the Labor government's policies, demonise certain forms of work and limit the flexibility many employees seek when working in those industries. Forcing such changes and trying to create a one-size-fits-all approach will be detrimental and have unintended consequences for some employer-employee arrangements. The gig economy sustains thousands of independent contractors who make individual choices about where they want to sell their services and when. Consider the potential unintended consequences of over-regulation on the gig economy on your local plumber, electrician or preferred Uber driver. They could lose their freedom to work for more than one platform at the same time. The former coalition government introduced the first statutory definition of a casual employee, which benefited both employees and employers. <coughs> because it gave a clear determination of the nature of the employment arrangement at the outset. We also introduced the right for casual employees to convert to permanent employment after 12 months, should they wish to. Changes within our workplace relations system take time. Productivity, choice and options must all be considered to ensure conditions are improving for Australians, Australians not being made more difficult. Changes to leave entitlements, awards, rights and obligations should follow previous systems of workplace relations reform, which is appropriately done through our Fair Work Commission. For example, when the coalition government introduced paid family and domestic violence leave, the Fair Work Commission deliberated on how this would impact Australian employers and employees. Coalition committee members don't agree with moves to establish superannuation as a nat national employment standard. The Department of the Treasury Deputy Secretary Luke Yeoman confirmed that 80 per cent of the wages growth in the federal budget is consumed with the mandatory superannuation increases in response to a question by Senator Bragg in the November 22 budget estimates hearings. We believe the Australian government should be making workplaces more flexible, not less. 
Our social security system provides a strong safety net that is available to any Australian for as long as they need it, where they meet eligibility criteria. This system is funded by taxpayers and needs to be managed responsibly, a responsibility that extends to future generations. Coalition committee members continue to support the principle of mutual obligations within our welfare system. These critical requirements ensure job seekers are actively looking for work and participating in activities that will help them into employment. For example, the highly successful Parents Next program, which has helped thousands of parents return to the workforce through improving their work readiness, also includes mutual obligation requirements. We believe in a flexible workplace relations system that mutually benefits both employers and employees and oppose at the move to a one-size-fits-all approach. Coalition senators also support a strong employment services system, which is underpinned by the principle of mutual obligations and will oppose moves to abandon or water down these regulation requirements. The stable workplace relations framework and strong employment services system that was in place during the term of the coalition government was one of the reasons that unemployment was at a 50-year low when the coalition left office in May 2022. Multiple recommendations within the final report relate to early childhood education and care. While coalition members support recommendations to address childcare deserts, we do not believe the Australian government should be involved in creating the centres themselves. Instead, the government should work with communities to increase access to early childhood education through funding for community groups and councils to establish centres in greatest areas of greatest need. Family is the fielding block building block of society, and we want Australian families to continue to have choice and access to quality care that works for them. While we support regular reviews of early childhood education and care systems and the development of a framework for a flexible system, the ACCC Childcare Inquiry, the Productivity Commission's Early Childhood Education and Care Inquiry and the Australian Government's Early Years Strategy Inquiries are already looking at this. So recommendations from these inquiries should be considered before any action is taken. Victorian and New South Wales governments have extended the existing preschool reform agreement to three-year-old children through their own budgets. We recommend the Australian government incentivise and support other state and territory governments to roll out programs to extend the current agreements for four-year-old children past 2025. And mental health support is important for all Australians, particularly for both paid and unpaid carers as they deal with the pressures of their caring role and the support they provide to those relying on their care. The former coalition government led reform of the mental health system by committing almost $3 billion to our mental health and suicide prevention plan. This plan expanded Australia's Headspace network to 164 locations and established a national network of adult head-to-health centres and child mental health hubs to provide free, multidisciplinary mental health care. Additionally, the Coalition Government introduced a telehealth model of care during the COVID-19 pandemic, which included mental health care through GPs, psychologists and psychiatrists. Initiatives to establish a dedicated mental health service for health care workers, including those in the aged care sector and online mental health training for health practitioners and health workers, were also introduced. The Coalition recommends urgent reinstatement of the full 20 Medicare subsidised mental health sessions to support vulnerable Australians. In closing, I reiterate the Coalition members of the committee support proven and fiscally sensible measures, measures to support those who combine work and care responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else seeking the call? Take your pick. <laughs> Thanks, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And it is with uh, considerable pride that I rise to speak to the tabling of the final report of the Senate to Select Committee on Work and Care. This report is comprehensive, thorough and unwavering in its account of the current state of work and care in Australia. Both the formal and informal care economies in their present form present unreasonable challenges and cause unacceptable harm to far too many Australians. This report documents that reality and it offers a range of policy options for governments of all persuasions to undertake the modernisation and reform of this sector. It is a sector that has been so long neglected. There is no quick redress of the great, the great challenge that lies there before us. It's going to require fiscally as well as 
socially responsible change, incremental change, to ensure that Australia's formal and informal work and care industries are fit for purpose and fit for the 21st century. I would like to begin by thanking my fellow members of, of my Labor colleagues on the committee, Senator White and Senator Stewart, for their diligent work throughout the course of the inquiry. I'd also very much like to thank Senator Pocock, uh, first term here as a new Green Senator and her first inquiry. I want to acknowledge, in a way that is so often unacknowledged in the media, the collegial nature and the collaborative way in which this committee has proceeded to hear the real voice of Australia and to document, in it, a way, it, document it in a way that will help us name the current reality and, and actually shape the wicked policy problem that confronts us. She led the committee in a way that enabled us to do that, both in the writing and the review of the final report. I'd also like to thank um, the members of the opposition, in particular Senator Askew, who has just made a contribution, um, Senator Rustin and also uh, Senator Bragg, who uh, filled out the team. Again, that collaboration and spirit of goodwill throughout the course of the inquiry is important. Uh, I want to note that this committee report uh, lands with additional comments from all groups, so from Labor senators, from the Green senator who chaired, and also from Liberal senators. But they are not dissenting reports. They are additional comments, because we will necessarily have very, very different ways about uh, plans, uh, ways about thinking about what should happen next and the manner in which the timing might be undertaken. And of course, I want to uh, acknowledge how important fiscal responsibility in the current climate is to make this task um, achievable at the same time as ensuring the wealth and benefit to the nation of managing our economy with uh, care and rigour. One of the most consistent pieces of evidence heard throughout the course of the inquiry related to the gendered and uneven burden of care responsibilities and the way in which women in both formal and informal care economies are disadvantaged by current systems and practices. The report also explores the ways in which the socio-economic devaluation of care work, in particular care work which is predominantly still undertaken by women, has entrenched gender and other inequalities in our workplaces. Arising from the evidence received by the committee, the report considers the impact of these inequalities throughout people's lives, revealing a lifelong pattern whereby the cost of care is disproportionately borne by women on lower wages, insecure employment and with low retirement incomes. Given the almost categorical disadvantage inherent to the experience of women within the work and care sector, it was particularly poignant that the committee was itself comprised almost entirely of women, with the exception of Senator Bragg. And I note that Senator Bragg was balancing his own childcare responsibilities while participating in the, this inquiry. And that reflects the changing nature of Australia and care and the way in which we need to respond to that reality. Whilst each of the groups occupy different points on the political spectrum, the drive to ensure that the report accurately reflected the state of working care in Australia was one um, by which we stood very, very firmly. The outworking of that set of recommendations that we've delivered today will have real capacity over time to address the disadvantage of women in this sector. And there was universal agreement about that. I'd like to thank the, Secretary, the Secretariat, another team comprised almost entirely of women, for their diligent work throughout the course of the inquiry. They're deserving of, uh, deserving of singular praise for the quality that, of the report that's been produced. We heard evidence from a wide range of stakeholders, major retailers, unions, individual workers, early childhood educators, care advocacy groups, those within the formal care economy and beyond. Each one of these uh, insights that were offered from those groups provided valuable contribution to the committee and the recommendations of the report rise, arise directly from their evidence. The Shop, Distributive and Allied Employees Association argued in their submission to the committee that access to carers' leave should be extended to caring for anyone the worker provides care to, regardless of whether they form part of the person's household or immediate family. Because the reality is people are caring beyond those arbitrary boundaries and their care is intersecting with their work and not in a way that is sustainable, healthy or practical. Families are not singularly defined. People may have different family structures that don't fall into the traditional definition of immediate family. And the provision of care to the people they recognise as part of their family or community should be supported. Care is a reality 
and a need that extends beyond bureaucratic attempts to contain it. The committee responded to this evidence through recommending uh, that the definition of immediate family be broadened within the Fair Work Act to more accurately reflect close personal relationships in which many Australians uh, have where they provide care. This is just one example of the way in which the committee directly responded in its recommendations to the evidence gathered and delivered uh, to the committee inquiry. The report also recommends that consideration of a number of measures relating to paid parental leave and early childhood education and care be undertaken by the government, which will seek to form a pathway to bring Australia to the forefront of best practice when it leads to this industry, which relates to this industry. Now, Labor is deeply proud of its legacy uh, in the introduction of paid parental leave and the very important recent passage of legislation which will bring Australian carers to 26 weeks of paid parental leave within the coming years. But the reality of neglect in this area by the former government means that the path to what was declared as the international standard of 52 weeks is an enormous policy and fiscal challenge mm. that needs careful attention and strategic planning. The report also contains recommendations aimed at ensuring that Australian workers have access to flexible working environments and to roster justice, and that large companies cannot intentionally fail to collect data which would demonstrate the often inflexible and accommodation attitudes of management to those seeking altered hours and conditions. The SDA's 2021 survey report into, the work, uh, into work, family and care saw the collection of data from over 6,000 employees. It was submitted to the committee and it had 55 per cent of the participants say they provided care to another person on a regular basis. This is not a niche issue. This is happening in every community every family, every set of care relationships that's going on in our country. It's for that reason that employers must ensure that flexible working arrangements are, practical, are a practical reality for employees and that the process of requesting altered hours or conditions is not bogged down by bureaucracy or subject to the whims of individual managers. And we have made recommendations to that end. Um, we, we believe that mandated roster notice periods were very, very un uncertain and uh, the data poverty was like a black hole, basically. Uh, I was appalled that major providers of retail in Australia could absolutely tell us within 10 seconds of product leaving shelf seven, aisle three, but couldn't tell us about the workers and their shifts and rostering. That is no longer an acceptable reality in, the way, in this time when so much data is available to us. Evidence heard throughout the course of the inquiry also detailed increasing prevalence of gig platforms within the Australian economy and the way in which such platforms leave workers without normal working protections. It's also argued by some stakeholders that the algorithmic aspect of these platforms has the capacity to amplify existing bias and discrimination. For this reason, recommendation 26 of the report recommends that the principle of equal pay for equal work be applied to those in the gig economy and that the Australian government should remove incentives for gig platforms to avoid workplace regulations. This recommendation arose out of evidence provided to the community, the committee, particularly relating to the potential harm of gig platforms in relation to the formal care economy. The report provides a range of options for further policy work and offers the government the opportunity to consider the work of the committee as it plans a forward program. The government has already made substantial progress towards improving Australia's industrial relations framework as well as our formal and informal care economies. The centrepiece of the government's first budget were a major investment in affordable early childhood education, care and modernisation and expansion of paid parental leave. Sadly, this, reveals, this report reveals that there is so much more work to do. Thank you. Senator White. To speak to the tabling of the final report of the Senate uh, Select Committee on Work and Care. Can I first also join with my fellow senators to thank the Secretariat for the fantastic work that they performed in supporting us and marshalling a range of witnesses before us? Can I thank too uh, Senator Pocock, who before coming, Senator Barbara Pocock, who before coming here was in fact an expert in this area in her own right, and it was a privilege to serve uh, with her uh, on this inquiry. Uh, Deputy Chair, uh, uh, Senator O'Neill too uh, added um, 
her experience to, to the mix, and that I found invaluable, as was the contributions of Senator Askew, um, Ari Stewart, um, Senator Stewart's uh, new child, and also Senator Bragg and his, uh, uh, his contributions. Acting Deputy President, I'm no stranger to the complexity of problems which face people, mainly women, who have, have to struggle simultaneously with the responsibilities of work and care. My working life before I came to this place was characterised by fighting for the rights of working people to care alongside their right uh, to work, like fighting for the provision of paid parental leave at Qantas, or like fighting for the first EBA to include paid family and domestic violence leave, or filing and winning extra super in agreements at many, many private sector employers. Though even with my experience of progressing issues like this, this committee process for this report highlighted just how far behind the times Australia has fallen in providing a decent structure to assist our fellow Australians balance their working hours with their care and responsibilities. Unfortunately, Australia is an international outlier that demands working carers mould their lives around working conditions designed for workers and households of the last century. Paid parental leave is a great example. While the previous government stalled the world around us, moved towards more comprehensive models of paid parental leave. Just this week, we saw the Labor our Labor government begin to turn this tide around by legislating for 26 weeks, a full six months of paid parental leave by 2026. The changes have also increased flexibility arrangements and incentivised blokes taking on more caring uh, responsibilities by strengthening the use it or lose it provisions. This structure improves the way Australian families balance work and care by making it easy, easier for both parents to participate in the workforce and share care. It means having a baby isn't as much of an economic and professional setback as it once was. I would note that the kit committee heard, and this is reflected in the final report, that 52 weeks of paid parental leave is generally considered international best practice. Given that, I echo this, the sentiment of the report, which recommends the Australian government consider how to fund, fund and implement the, that best practice standard. We deserve no less. Another example is the adoption of part-time work as the default option for working carers. In other countries, full-time work for parents is much more common because of the support systems around them to make this possible. Where, this is, where there is part-time work, it has been structured to allow for flexibility and for security. In Australia, part-time work is, is looking more and more like casual work, but without the loading. That is, it's insecure and unpaid, underpaid. In Australia, we need to remedy this by thinking carefully about what a casual worker is, what a part-time worker is and what the important differences are between the two. We need to make sure that these different modes of work uh, are defined meaningfully and can't be used to undermine flexibility and pay. The evidence has also reminded me of just how much is lost for our domestic economy and for individuals when the structure is not fit for purpose. As it stands, our system does not adequately recognise that work and care are two sides of economy and labour in Australia. Both are productive and both take effort. We heard that women who have caring responsibilities for kids or the elderly or, or others don't want to be working part-time. They want full-time work and full-time hours, but the inflexible nature of the way we approach things like rostering, leave entitlements and childcare mean that for many women, full-time work just can't be juggled with everything else. And that is a shame for, this, for Australia because we actually lose a whole pool of workers who want to contribute more and who want to work more. It's also a shame for Australia because this same pool of workers is more likely to be the sort of professional carers we desperately need right now. They are the nurses, the disability support workers, the childcare workers and the aged care workers that are in shortage. It's also a shame for women. Without the proper, pro, proper policy ecosystem to support women to work the increased amount they wish to, we are never going to cut the gender pay gap and we are never going to cut the superannuation gap. While the implicit assumption of our industrial relations and employment policies is that women are expected to sacrifice their professional work to fulfil their caring responsibilities, women in already poorly paid industries will not be able to get ahead. It's also a shame for men who don't get the opportunity to care, care to you for their children and parents. We are failing pretty much everyone. Women and their families should be supported by governments, and the Labor government is starting to turn around a decade of that not being the case. Cheaper childcare um, absolutely pays for itself. 
Rostering practices need to improve to generally consider employee views about the impact of proposed roster changes and to provide f genuine flexibility for caring responsibilities. We heard all too often about often that a veneer of flexibility exists in rostering, with the reality of chopping and changing rosters with too little notice leaving women and those with caring responsibilities on the outer. We need to look closer at defining the meaning of casual, em uh, casual employees in a way that truly reflects the nature of casual work and is restricted to work that is genuinely intermittent, seasonal or unpredictable. Similarly, we need to ensure that part-time employment isn't just a form of casual employment without the loading, and this is important because, as the committee heard many times, limiting insecure forms of employment and creating a more predictable employer-employee relationship will, by extension, provide greater flexibility and scope for accommodating care responsibilities. One thing that is clear from the final report and from the evidence that the committee heard it is, is that there is no quick fix to the challenges Australia faces in rebalancing our system of work and care policies. At the moment, it's clear that our system doesn't provide the correct level of flexibility and support required to get the most out of the workforce and doesn't accurately re reflect caring responsibilities of a modern Australia. As important as it was in 1920, we can no longer rely on the harvested judgment to organise our, ide our ideas of the workforce and the family, because that decision no longer reflects the family's economy or labour market of 21st century Australia. We have to look to what other countries are doing on many fronts, childcare, parental leave, working hours, aged care and much more. Other countries have lowered the gender pay gap and have a better balance of work and care than we do. But there is no one silver bullet to improve the key indicators on which we want to be measured. We cannot continue to be an outlier in the world. I look forward to working as part of the government that is committed to tackling these challenges and that thinks critically and exchanges with, and exchanges with complex uh, issues rather than shirking their responsibilities, as has been the story uh, in the last decade. This report is important. It contributes vital contemporary knowledge to the debate about the state of work and care in Australia. It also provides great insight into the lived experience of workers who are also carers. These experiences are often neglected and fall by the wayside. I am pleased that the Senate has taken the time to listen and I look forward to the discussion the report encourages us to have. I also seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Um, we now, I beg your pardon. Oh, is leave granted? Yes, I'm sure it is. Uh, which now means we move to consideration of documents. So we're now considering documents listed on page six to eight of the notice paper. Any document to which no senator rises will be discharged from the notice paper. So just excuse me while I get to that page. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I take note and seek to continue my remarks on items for those playing at home two, three, four, eight and ten on page six of the notice paper, on items 15, 17, 24, 25 and 27 on page seven, and numbers 32 and 34 on page eight. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I take note of document number 35 on page 8 and seek leave to continue my remarks. And I also take note of document number 2 on page 6 and um, on the Defence and Veteran Suicide Royal Commission interim report. Um, just in relation to this award, I just want to make a few um, short statements. And I know that, um, sadly, we know that the latest report found that 1,600 ADF members and veterans with service after 1985 died by suicide between 1997 and 2020. That reveals an additional 327 deaths by suicide since the last year's report largely due to an expanded study period, which now includes an additional five years of data 
and does not reflect an increased rate of suicide overall. The 2022 report found the most common risk factors for permanent reserve and ex-serving uh, serving ADF members who died by suicide were experiencing a mood affective disorder such as depression and problems in spousal relationships. Um, one of the things that the Albanese Labor government is doing is that we are delivering on our commitments from the federal election, including a veterans employment strategy and expanding the network of veterans and family hubs right around the country. And I wanted to talk specifically about the Veterans Hub um, that we launched and I uh, assisted Ms. Uh, Minister Matt Keogh launch in Burnie on the 16th of January 2023. The uh, funding was $2.2 million to the Veteran Wel Welfare Board in Burnie to assist in developing that hub to provide uh, physical and mental health services, advocacy, well-being, housing assistance and employment for the whole North West Tasmania region. We have a lot of veterans in North West Tasmania that stretches right along the North West Coast down as far as Marawar in the far North West and, and also down the West Coast of Tasmania. And it's, a, it's a really broad area and quite often it's difficult for uh, um, some of those veterans to be able to travel even into Burnie. So I was really pleased to um, understand that part of the funding for the Veterans Hub in Burnie was in fact an outreach capacity and capability where they would have the capability to be able to go to the veterans rather than the veterans come to them in at the hub. So it's a really great program um, that um, has been implemented or will be implemented in Burnie. And I know the Veteran Welfare Board there uh, were very excited when the final uh, message came through employing in relation to the funding. The, um, the ability uh, it's run by particularly volunteers in Burnie, and they're a great bunch of uh, veterans from right across the northwest coast. Uh, and obviously, the RSL plays a very important role in that, um, in uh, not only in Tasmania but but right across the um, right across the country. I guess one of the um, one of the points that I wanted to make in talking about this uh, report was that. The uh, Australian government, uh, in implementing the government's response to the Royal Commission, uh, we have agreed to invest $233.9 million to engage 500 new frontline work, uh, staff at DVA to eliminate the compensation claims backlog. And I know that they've been in place for a period of time. Um, and that was really important to make sure that we cleared that backlog because that was some of the issues that uh, veterans were facing in terms of trying to get their case managed. Um, we also invested $9.5 million into develop developing a pathway for simplification and harmonisation of veterans legislation, which again has been a really important factor when I've spoken to veterans and veterans groups about the, 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 the the difficulty in navigating the various parts of the legislation. Also uh, investing $87 million to modernise the IT uh, systems in the Department of Veteran Affairs, and that again will include in, in help improve those claims processing. Um, we committed $24.3 million to provide increased support to veterans who are having their claims processed and to improve modelling capabilities needed to forecast and manage future demand for DVA services. So I guess in, um, in summarising, um, I just wanted to put on the record that um, the Albanese Labor government is, is accepted the, the position of the Royal Commission. The report, uh, we've put a lot of uh, funding in through the last budget, um, and I was very, very pleased to see that we supported the veterans hubs, which um, the previous government uh, commenced. And uh, we have continued to do that, and I was very excited to assist Manager, Minister Keogh in uh, opening and kicking off the one in Burnie um, right uh, along the northwest coast so that it can assist veterans in that area. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator jo uh, Steelejohn. Very much, Deputy Chair. I take note this evening of the government response to the uh, Joint Standing Committees. Oh, sorry, Sen Senator oh. Steele John. We are still on documents. So we are about to do committee reports and government responses. 
Nita Cadell actually did seek leave and, and continued her, his remark on the document I just spoke on, but I wanted to make sure that I um, sought leave to continue yes, my remarks. Yes, he did. Thank you. I, I'm unsure of the standing order as to whether you sitting down negates the earlier, but it probably does, so I'm glad you did. Senator Cadell. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I uh, seek leave to table a non-conforming petition previously circulate, circulated to WIPS relating to the listing of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organisation. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Cadell. Okay, does any other senator want to stand on documents? Okay, we will now move to committee reports and government responses and Auditor General's reports listed on pages eight and nine. Uh, and any report or response to which no senator rises will be discharged. And I call Senator Steele John. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. I take note of the government's uh, response to the Joint uh, Standing Committee uh, report called. into independent assessments. Uh, now, in case there's anybody uh, who hasn't heard of the term independent assessments. Let me just uh, contextualise it for you. Um, this was a program, a proposal, introduced to disabled people in Australia uh, by the former government uh, by, by which disabled people would be forced, before gaining access to the NDIS, um, to undertake a medical assessment by a medical practitioner, uh, which they did not know uh, nor knew them. Uh, the proposal by the government was to have this assessment undertaken, uh, often by medical practitioners who had no knowledge uh, of the disability uh, which the NDIS participant may have, and the result of that assessment would impact not only whether or not they could access the scheme, but ultimately also the funds they could receive under the scheme. It was, quite frankly, a terrible idea. And the disability community across the country joined together with the Greens in opposing that proposal every step of the way. And the inquiry undertaken by uh, the NDIS's oversight, uh, parliamentary oversight body was a critical mechanism uh, for giving effect to the disability community's opposition uh, to this proposal. Uh, the most disturbing aspect, and there were many disturbing aspects of the proposal, uh, but the most disturbing access, uh, aspect of the proposal at its core uh, was uh, the proposition um, that a stranger who the disabled person did not know uh, would be the individual who would undertake um, the assessment upon the individual. Um, and there was no opportunity uh, to have uh, somebody that you did know uh, partake in that process, somebody that you had built trust with, um, and that that person would then prepare reports that would ultimately determine uh, whether you got access. Now, uh, I do have concerns with the government's response uh, to this report, particularly in relation um, to Recommendation 3. Now, Recommendation 3 of the report clearly stated and that assessments should be carried out by healthcare professionals nominated by the participant and or their nominee where appropriate and available. Now, the government uh, has not supported that recommendation. They have simply noted that recommendation. Um, instead, uh, they have pushed, rather than simply fully report, uh, fully support this recommendation, they have pushed this quest, uh, question uh, of uh, the assessment off to yet another uh, review. Now, we heard clearly that the re primary responsibility uh, for developing uh, reports should be uh, that undertaken by medical professionals that the participant trusts. So let me say that again. One of the key pieces of evidence that our inquiry heard was that an assessment of an individual for the purposes of access or funding should be undertaken by somebody the person knows and trusts, because it is uh, the medical professionals uh, with whom a disabled person has built a level of trust and who knows that participant who is best placed 
to provide information concerning access and supports, and who is ultimately the person most appropriate to provide those supports. And yet the government has not endorsed that clear piece of evidence. Instead, they have kicked it off to yet another review. Another concern of mine uh, is the fact that they uh, have uh, not, not fully endorsed our recommendation in relation uh, to a definition around co-design, um, a critical element um, to actually getting the NDIS right. Now, there's a, a bunch of things that I need to cover in this response uh, a little bit more in depth, given the, the full breadth of the report. Um, so what I'll do at this point, I will seek leave uh, to continue my remarks um, and uh, expand on this in a future uh, session of the Senate. Thank you, Senator. Senator Green. To just make some brief remarks about the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee tabled um, report on human rights implications of recent violence in Iran, uh, which was tabled in the chamber on the 1st of February this year. Uh, as a member of the committee, I just want to thank the chair and the deputy chair and fellow members and the secretariat for their work delivering this comprehensive report. The committee received over 1,000 submissions into this inquiry, with a significant number of received as the name withheld. I want to thank those organisations and individuals who took the time to make those submissions. Since the death of Maharsha Amini in September of last year, Australians have been appalled by Iran's violence against its citizens, particularly women and girls. I want to acknowledge the women and girls in Iran who continue to remain steadfast in the face of violence and intimidation. I also want to extend my deepest sympathies to the families of the protesters who have been tragically executed since the start of this very dark chapter. Uh, finally, I want to speak directly to the Iranian dysphoria here in Australia. We see your distress. We are worried about your family and friends in Iran, your grief for those that you have lost and the urgency with which you are striving for action. From the beginning of this new wave of crackdowns, Australia has worked strategically to build pressure internationally on Iran. We have taken stronger action against Iran on human rights than any other previous Australian government. Australia was at the forefront of efforts to remove Iran from the Commission of the Status of Women. Australia co-sponsors and advocated for the successful Human Rights Council resolution establishing an independent inv investigation into human rights violations in Iran. And last year, the Albanese government imposed Minsky-style human rights sanctions on six individuals and two entities, including Iran's morality police over their involvement in the Iranian regime's abhorrent human rights violations. In February, the Albanese government announced additional style shank sanctions on 16 Iranian individuals and one Iranian entity. We have also joined international partners to impose targeted sanctions on multiple, multiple Iran individuals and entities involved in the production and supply of drones to Russia that have been used in illegal and immoral invasion in Ukraine. I have um, more to say um, in regards to this matter, but I just wanted to finish on these, these notes. Um, it is disappointing but not surprising that we've seen some who are using newfound interest in these matters for their own political purposes. Um, we know that the um, current government is working determinedly and successfully to get Iran removed from the um, Status of Women Commission. Um, this is um, clearly um, an opposition that specialises in calling for action it failed to take, and our government will continue to join the choruses of international partners calling for an end to the Iranian regime's violence. Senator Patterson. Chair, um, in the remaining time we have, I rise to briefly remark on the Australian Government response to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security report into the national security risks affecting the higher Australian higher education research sector. Um, I want to welcome the Government's response to this report and the fact that they have agreed to implement the vast majority of the recommendations of the committee, which were unanimous and bipartisan. Uh, the conduct of the inquiry, I think, was an important part of Australia hardening our systems and our defences against foreign interference uh, risks in particular, but also the theft of intellectual property that we've seen from our higher education sector 
in recent years. I want to pay tribute to the former Minister for Education, Dan Tehan, who introduced the university's Foreign Interference Task Force, which has helped contribute to a better culture in our universities addressing these issues. I also note uh, that the government, in responding to our recommendation about Confucius Institutes, has said that while they will not exercise their power at this stage to cancel those agreements under the Foreign Arrangements Act, that uh, the government does not wish to see any more of these established. Finally, uh, I want to note one development since this report was handed down, which is an exclusive report in The Australian by Natasha Beda on Tuesday this week, which revealed that Australian universities are teaching students in authoritarian regimes, including China, offensive cyber hacking tactics and techniques. Uh, and this is deeply disturbing because it includes uh, tactics and techniques to overwhelm civilian infrastructure. The cybersecurity challenges that our country faces are hard enough already without Australian universities, uh, perhaps inadvertently, assisting our potential adversaries to do more harm to our critical infrastructure. Um, this requires an urgent investigation from the Albanese government. I hope since the publication of this story on Tuesday that that investigation is already well underway, in particular by the university's Foreign Interference Task Force, and I look forward to them sharing with the public and the parliament the results of that inquiry as soon as possible, because we must get on top of this serious national security risk. Uh, Senator Cadell. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I uh, take note and seek leave to continue remarks on items 1 and 3 on page 8 and 6, 7, 8 on page 9. Thank you. Are there any ministerial statements? There are a table of documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning ASIC, Australian Carbon Credit Unions, Australia's credit rating and the sitting of the Senate on 15 December 2022. The President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. I call the Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Sorry, I was, I was muted. Sorry, I'll put that again. I was muted. The question is that the motion put by the minister be agreed to. Those that say aye, that agree say aye. Those who are against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment 2023 Measures Number no. 1, Bill 2023 for concurrence. I call the minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that this bill uh, now be read a first time. Those who agree say aye. Those who against say no. I believe the, no, the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to corporations, financial services, sustainability standards and taxation and for related purposes. I call the minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, in accordance with standing order 1153, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 26 May 2023. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Migration Amendment, Australia's Engagement in Pacific and Other Measures, Bill 2023, and Migration Visa Pre-Application Process Charge, Bill 2023. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. So the question is that these bills now be read a first time. Those who agree say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Migration Amendment, Australia's engagement in the Pacific and other measures, Bill 2023. Migration Visa Pre-Application Process Charge Bill 2023. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. In accordance with Standing Order 1153, 
Further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 13 June 2023. This notice of motion 175 in the name of Senator Rustin relating to the Albanese government. Senator Rustin. I move the motion. Um, For all their moral posturing uh, and their promises, Labor shows time and time again that their rhetoric in opposition is not matched by their actions in government, and it's costing Australian lives. Anthony Albanese promised cost of living relief during the election. But the reality is life is only getting harder for Australians under this government. Mortgages are rising, energy bills are skyrocketing, and the price at supermarkets and the doctors is only going up. To borrow a phrase from those opposite, everything is going up except your wages. Labor promised on 97 separate occasions that Australian electricity prices uh, would drop by $275, but instead they have delivered the most expensive average wholesale electric electricity prices on record. Labor said they wouldn't make any changes to superannuation, but one in ten Australians will be affected by the changes they have now announced, and it's clear this is just the groundwork for more taxes and changes to come. Labor promised cheaper medicines, but already they have removed life-changing drugs from the PBS, one of which is being relied on by 15,000 Australians who suffer from type 1 diabetes. <coughs> Labor promised to strengthen Medicare. But so far, they have only weakened it. They slashed Medicare mental health support in half, they have cut 70 telehealth items from Medicare, and bulk billing rates have plummeted after being at their highest levels when the coalition was in government. Labor said they would make it easy to see a GP, but they have ripped GPs out of rural, regional and remote Australia. But it is clear that their expedited requirement for 24-7 nurses in aged care homes is both undeliverable and damaging. And there have been more deaths in aged care under this government than was in the entire first two and a half years of the pandemic. So, despite all Labor's rhetoric on increasing access to health care for all Australians and protecting Medicare, they just don't understand the importance of affordable and adequate health, mental health supports for the most vulnerable of Australians. As part of our response to support Australians in tougher times, the former coalition government doubled the number of Medicare subsidised psychological sessions available through the Better Access initiative from 10 to 20. With significant pressures on Australians currently facing uh, cost of living pressures, uh, we recognise that mental health support could not be more important. But despite these pressures impacting Australians and our communities, the Labor government decided now apparently was the right time to slash Medicare access to psych uh, Medicare subsidised psychological um, sessions in half. They can say all they like that they are the party of Medicare, but make no mistake, this is a blatant cut to Medicare and is hurting the most vulnerable Australians right now. Again, strengthening Medicare, Labor promised that they would do that, but so far they have only weakened it. And the Strengthening Medicare Task Force they released is merely an aspirational report. It has no urgency, it has no details, it has no timelines, it has no budget. Aspirations are commendable but with no urgent action to follow them up. They're not going to assist Australians with the significant increases and pressures of cost of living rises that continue to go up. You know, $55 for a script, $60 out of pocket for a GP, and all at the same time while energy bills, mortgages and general cost of living pressures are skyrocketing. Bulk billing rates were at record highs under the previous government, but now they are plummeting because Labor has done actions have cause the sector to lose confidence in the system. And for all the rhetoric on Medicare, um, they've come into government and slashed Medicare health supports in half and, and cut 70 telehealth items. Um, Labor also um, went into, uh, into government with an election promise to prioritise access to health care and reduce the cost of medicines. But now they've decided to remove an innovative, life-changing form of insulin called FIASP from the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, sending prices soaring to all absolutely unaffordable levels. The former coalition government listed this very important diabetic uh, medicine um, in the PBS in 2019. We understood that FIAFS is an innovative mealtime insulin that improves sugar blood levels at a faster rate than other diabetes medications, resulting in improved quality of life for the people that take it. 
But Labor, in the middle of a cost of living crisis, has made the decision to remove affordable access to a life-changing drug that is being relied upon by more than 15,000 Australians with diabetes. They must be transparent with diabetes patients in Australia and admit whether they took this action because it was the com to support the commercial viability um, of FIASP remaining on the PS, whether they took this intervention because they were protecting their own budget bottom line. And we know that Minister Butler, as the Minister for Health, has the ability to intervene, but so far he has chosen not to. The coalition is absolutely proud of our record um, of affordable medicines. We listed almost 3,000 new and amended medicines while we were in government, but we know the previous Labor government had to stop listing medicines because they ran out of money. Let's hope that this is not a sign that this is about to repeat itself. Labor also promised they'd make it easy to see a doctor, but they're just making it harder. Serious workforce shortages putting pressure on our healthcare system right across the country, and unfortunately, rural, regional and remote Australia are being the hardest hit because they are the ones that were already facing challenges. And in the middle of this workforce crisis, the Albanese government decided to rip GPs out of country towns by changing the distribution pri priority areas for overseas trained uh, doctors. We know that the DPA changes in the classification system um, the, 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 the DPA classification system was designed as a crucial part of trying to ensure that we had access for GPs in rural communities. But the government's decision to extend, extend this priority access uh, to outer metropolitan areas means that they have basically rendered this advantage to rural and regional Australia to the dustbin. And to quote the Rural Doctors Association of Australia, this policy change will cost the lives of rural and remote patients who already suffer poorer health outcomes. And then on top of this, we have found out they have also relegated international doctors and nurses working in regional areas to the bottom of the visa pile, failing to prioritise 887 regional skilled migration visas, all at a time when the country needs more than ever to ensure that we have access to timely health care and access to GPs. And finally, Labor said they put the care back into aged care, but instead they have just put more pressure onto a sector already struggling under workforce pressures. As the sector deals with the challenges of these significant pressures, the government brought forward the deadline for 24-7 registered nurses in every aged care home by an entire year against the recommendations of the, age, uh, of the Royal Commission into Aged Care. Of course everybody wants to see older Australians getting the care they need and they deserve, but there is no point legislating for something that is impossible to deliver. And disappointingly, they now are ignoring calls to help from aged care homes around the country, and they have consistently refused to provide them with any information about what is going to happen to them, that despite their best intentions and every efforts, if they are unable to meet these mandated requirements, what will happen to these homes? These are homes of older Australians. And there are very serious concerns that aged care facilities will be forced to close because they can't access the required staff, which that means that people who live in these aged care homes will be kicked out of their homes and be forced to move hundreds of miles away from their own communities, from their families and for their loved ones. And the UTS Ageing Research Collaborative report released at the end of last year showed that less than 5 per cent of the surveyed homes currently had the required direct care workforce needed to fill the requirements that are being forced upon them. We have raised these concerns time and time and time again with the government, but they are refusing to consider the unique challenges faced by small, rural and regional providers. The aged care sector needs urgent and tangible support, but sadly they are getting absolutely none of this from this government. All they get is more rhetoric. And that's all we're getting from the Anthony Albanese Labor government. They're happy to make the big talking big headline promises to get themselves elected to government, but when it comes to delivering those promises, they're nowhere to be seen. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And, um, sometimes I, I find it hard to respond to some of the claims from those opposite, as if they uh, can disassociate themselves from the nine terrible long years in which they were in government and the construction of failure after failure that is really, really making life hard for Australians. It didn't happen overnight. It was on their watch 
under their construction that we ended up with systems that are so broken, so broken because they didn't invest carefully, they didn't invest wisely, they didn't invest for the benefit of Australians, they invested for the benefit of very, very few. And while they were making those decisions, they blew the budget right out of the water and stretched it out to a trillion dollars of debt for Australian taxpayers. So I want to thank you, uh, Deputy President, for this opportunity to speak to Senator Rustin's general business motion, because the contrast between this government and what we watched as a train wreck for nine years is absolutely daylight and darkness. Australians for nine long years of LNP government watched their wages go backwards and backwards and backwards. They, they saw energy generation go out of the system. The gap between rich and poor in Australia grew greater on their watch, nine years, and that's what they did. They grew the gap between Australians. We saw institutions of responsible government absolutely, totally trashed. We saw grant schemes rorted, using Australian taxpayer funds as if it was Liberal Party dollars to throw about for their own re-election. And of course, you know the old chestnut, jobs for the mates, that just became endemic. Now, since coming to government, Australians are telling me when I'm out and about that they are feeling like their government has stabilised the country, that they wake up every morning knowing that somebody is actually doing the job of government, being the adult in the room is the term that's been put to me many times, responsibly managing the nation and acting in the interest of the many. We promised a National Anti-Corruption Commission. We heard about it for five years. There was a lot of gum flapping going on on the other side, a lot of persuasion, a lot of column inches invested in confidence that the Liberal National Party government would deliver it, but they never did. They never did. We've done it. So this is a comparison between nine years and nine months. We did in nine months what they couldn't even bring up themselves, bring themselves up to do in nine years. And didn't we need an, an, an anti-corruption commission to get some of the, the, the rorting and the nonsense that was going on over there? We've delivered cheaper childcare. That'll kick in on the 1st of July. Cheaper medicines, saving Australians hundreds and in some cases thousands of dollars over the course of a year. We've reinvigorated the industrial relations system to make sure that wages rise that people can get enough money to live on. We're implementing the Jen Jenkins Committee recommendations. We're increasing the weeks of paid parental leave, funding increases for First Nations services. These things are happening. They are real changes, making a real difference to the bottom line for ordinary families. On the other side, at every turn, as we try to bring these cost of living measures to support Australians, we're faced by the noalition. They've got a record already in nine months of opposing anything, anything in this place that might benefit ordinary working families. They've opposed the Housing Australia Future Front. They've opposed the Housing Australia Future Fund. Senator Polly, I can't believe it either. You know, given the, given the, the rate of homelessness in Australia and the struggle that people are finding rental properties, they are opposing the Housing Australia Future Fund. They opposed a legislated emissions reduction target because, God knows, they think we don't need one. They opposed our industrial relations legislation, which is meant to get wages going. And they are opposing our national reconstruction fund because why would they support something that would create manufacturing jobs for Australians? The no alition. The no alition. That's what we see here day in and day out. They've gone instead. This is, this is when we saw them get excited. They finally decided that they'd go into bat for the top 0.5 per cent holders of superannuation. So forget the 99.5 per cent of Australians. 
and, and we talk about the average supervalence of about 140 k. They're out there fighting to their death for the ones who've got over three million dollars. Now, I think it's great if you have a successful um, life that you invest well and that you run businesses and you have great jobs and you grow your wealth. That's fantastic. But don't expect somebody on a low wage to be paying more tax than, than a wealthy retiree with three million dollars already in their superannuation fund. Now, those opposite dare to lecture us on power prices. On their watch, they delayed a key electricity pricing update until after the election. They had the facts, they had the documents, but like so much, they decided to do nothing about it. Oh, that's probably not a bit of a misrepresentation. Not, they did decide to do something about it. They decided to hide the report under the bed covers. Now, that is an obscene response. An obscene response to the reality facing Australia in terms of electricity pricing. That report that they didn't want Australians to see showed that prices had more than doubled under their watch from January to March 22, and the prices continued to climb right up until the election. So ashamed they were that they actually hid their work. They hid the facts, but Australians had seen enough by that stage and turfed them out as they absolutely deserved to. The rank incompetence of those opposite on energy policy was astounding. Despite having floated do over uh, dozens, actually, I think it might have been 22 or was it 23? It's hard to keep track. They never landed a single energy policy. And the fact is, with regard to how much power was in Australia's system, they left Australia with less power in the system than they generated in getting into it. Now, Maybe that's because they had an energy minister who was more committed to forging documents and patting himself on the back on Facebook than actually adding power to the grid. I, I almost forgot, though, they, they did have an extra energy minister, a secret one, in the form of PM Mr Morrison. But you know, sadly, he couldn't figure out what he wanted to do in this portfolio or any of the others. So they just did nothing of any use. The coalition, in fact, had two energy ministers but no energy policy. Global inflation, we know, is hurting nations around the world, and Russia's illegal and brutal attempted conquest has impacted supply chains and aftershocks of the COVID-19 pandemic. Inflation is coming down, and we are doing far better than many other nations around the world, because this is a global phenomenon. But let the facts speak for themselves. The worst quarter for inflation in this period of time was under the LNP Morrison government in 2022, prior to the election. Those opposite, frankly, have no integrity. There is no ground to be standing on for them when it comes to broken pro promises. Just off the top of my head, here, here are some. You know, in the soundtrack of my memories of nine years of watching this government, day in, day out, cuts to the ABC and SBS, cuts to health care, cuts to education funding. No National Integrity Commission, more expensive power, less energy generation into the system, destruction of Australian manufacturing, a decade of stagnation, and only, the only sorts of reforms were ones that they were dragged kicking and screaming into. Now, Labor will continue our plan to fight inflation and keep bringing down the cost of living. Those opposite had nine long years to deliver cheaper power prices, to make super more sustainable, to fix Medicare. Instead, all we got was a doubling of power bills, increasingly unaffordable super tax concessions and GP times, wait times longer than ever. Instead of moving stunt motions like these, those opposite should reflect on their record of failure and the reason they were turfed out at the last election. In opposition, they have a chance to participate in great public debate to lift the nation. But what do we see? No new policies from them, no new initiatives, no soul-searching, no introspection following their crushing defeat, and instead they choose to be the no alition. Many of the same characters from the Morrison government are still on the front bench, including Angus Taylor, whose litany of failures as a minister and endless stream of scandals, like one after the other after the other, has not prevented him from becoming shadow treasurer. 
Mr. Stuart Robert, the Shadow Assistant Treasurer, and the robo debt scandal. I mean, despite telling the Royal Commission that he saw it as his ministerial duty to openly promote falsehoods about the illegal robo debt scheme and stick with his mates over telling the truth to the Australian people. Whatever ever happened to ministerial accountability? It died under Mr Morrison. Susan Lee, the deputy leader of the opposition, returning to the front bench after being sacked as health minister after using taxpayer funds to visit the Gold Coast to shop for a new holiday unit. Now, Australians don't trust those who are on the opposition benches. They don't trust them on integrity and for very good reason. And that's why Australians voted to kick them out. The Albanese government is absolutely committed to improving regional and rural health. But you know, to fix what's broken and the compounding impact of so many bad decisions made by the previous government, simply it cannot be fixed overnight. This is a consequence of a government that governed by press release rather than properly doing the policy work and the necessary careful investment in building a great workforce in the healthcare sector and providing the services Australia need. Now, it's a long walk back to improving rural and regional health for Australians. We saw the scrapping of the National Health Partnership Agreement torn up in the first days of Mr Abbott's government. And with that, the destruction of the GP co-payment model saw hundreds of doctors leave primary care, leading to some of the worst wait times in history. I've had GPs tell me that they couldn't sell their practice. They couldn't even give it away for free. So ruined was the business of GPs by the LNP government. They actually broke the business model for GPs. And now they come in here bleating about how hard it is to see a doctor. They ruined the ecosystem. There's no small thing about what they did. It's huge. They actually broke Australians' access to GPs. And it's being felt most keenly in regional and rural parts of Australia. Mind you, it's pretty bad when you only get an hour and a half out of Sydney to the central coast where I live. You have to plan to be six, six weeks in advance. That's how denuded of proper workforce the Australian health system is. And when I travel to regional and rural New South Wales, I hear stories about you know, the inability to be able to have a child anywhere near where you live, having to leave home a month before your, your pregnancy completes and go and stay in a hotel in somewhere like Dubbo because there's nowhere you can get the health care you need in northwestern New South Wales. That doesn't happen overnight. It took a lot of effort from those opposite to so totally, totally break the connection that Australians rightly have with primary health care, and they expect it because Labor delivered Medicare. And they actually got the benefit of Labor's forward-thinking policy and investment in access to health. We're going to fix it. We're absolutely going to fix it, but it's going to be hard. I was told by mayors that the GP coverage in the Eyre Peninsula they described it as being as bad as in Afghanistan. But Labor is going to build 50 Medicare urgent care clinics to take the pressure off, including in Albury and on the Central Coast. Emergency departments simply can't cope. We need to ensure that Australians can get the care that they need in a timely way. The slashing of prices for hundreds of medical scripts and capping the maximum co-payment down by $12.50 um, to, down to $30. We've done more in the first nine months of our government than those opposite did in the entire nine years, and we're going to keep working to make sure that everyday Australians are getting their fair share. In retrospect, I'd love for the opposition to keep maybe moving motions like this so we can point out the differences of what can be achieved by a government with vision and integrity in nine months. Senator O'Neill, your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy. Uh, Acting Deputy President, <laughs> it's, I mean, I know it's the end of the week, and it's, it's been a long one, it really has. And I know we're here three out of four weeks this month, but there is clearly those opposite 
haven't quite adjusted to the fact that they're actually in government now. It's actually their responsibility. And they are so looking at every opportunity they can to, to quite frankly, I mean, I noticed Senator Polly's here suggesting that the coalition government had calm economic waters and they are now experiencing stormy economic waters. Um, I don't know, maybe TikTok was down when the COVID pandemic was happening, but uh, there was a global ac pandemic that affected economies around the world, including Australia, an unprecedented pandemic, a once in a lifetime, absolute uncertainty was thrown on the Australian people and around the world. Yet apparently the COVID pandemic, where we saw Victorians locked up for record times, global record times, where we saw lockdowns across the country, we saw borders closed between nations and within Australia, that somehow or other Senator Polly seems to think they were calm economic waters. So, I mean, the fantasy land that these people must be living in is breathtaking. Um, but when we're talking about pressures on the Australian electorate now and the cost of living pressures facing Australian families, they're happening now. And they're happening without a plan from this government to address them at all. And I just listened to uh, Senator O'Neill uh, through a diatribe of what uh, she alleges the coalition did in government, which is, again, hilarious in its absolute misrepresentations, in its biased view. Um, it, I mean, it's just extraordinary how you can actually stand up there and say these things. You must just have zero level of shame to be able to do that. But the reality is no amount of posturing, no amount of but it's hard. No amount of there's global factors that play now is going to help one Australian pay their mortgage, pay their power bills. Not one bit of whinging, whining, looking back, pointing a finger is going to make the bottom line in a family budget look any healthier. The difference is that the Australian electorate were promised 97 times before the election they were going to see a reduction of $275. $275, the number that shall not speak its name, if you are a member of the ALP. But 97 times Mr Albanese promised that Australians' power bills would be coming down. And what have they got to show for it? Increasing power bills and the fact that we've now seen, after all their bluff and bluster, everything they were carrying on about, bringing back the parliament at a huge expense to the Australian taxpayer. No cost of living relief, no energy price relief, but we're told today by the energy companies that we're about to see prices increase by 20 per cent. And I hope for some of these elderly Australians that everyone seems to be so concerned about when they talk about the nurses in aged care homes, oh, hang on, that's not actually going to happen anymore. Sorry. Maybe they don't care that much. Uh, but I hope it's not a cold winter because cold winters, when Australians, and particularly elderly Australians, can't afford to heat their houses, have dire consequences, absolutely dire consequences. But what we're getting from this Labor government is complete inaction, no plan. And the funny, you know, if it wasn't so serious, it'd be funny because listening to those opposite, they have no details about anything. They talk about their broken plans when it comes to superannuation, that it's a modest change. Clearly that was the uh, phrase most used in the focus group. Uh, but we've now had an admission from Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones today that there will be un unintended consequences to these superannuation changes, that they will now undertake a lengthy consultation process. Now, um, here's a tip, guys. When you're putting together policy, it's usually good to undertake some of that consultation process before you announce it, before you go out there and absolutely frighten Australians, particularly our farmers, when you're going to tax an unrealised asset, when you're going to potentially force people to sell the investments that they have worked so hard to build up because on paper they're over a particular price threshold and one that you're not planning to index. So when we see increases to property prices, when we see increases to land values over the years ahead, which does tend to happen. Think if you, how much house cost 20 years ago versus today. And we're talking about changes in superannuation. It's superannuation is when people retire. There'll be people starting their working lives now, won't be accessing it for 40 plus years. No indexation. How many people do you think are going to be impacted then? This is nothing but a blatant grab. 
by the industry super funds to try and smash self-managed super funds. We know what your agenda is. Your agenda is to do anything you can to support your Labor mates. And we know that the Labor mates in the unions pull the strings. So I welcome, in many regards, the National Corruption Commission being set up because I think we might start to get to the bottom of some very interesting deals that have been done and why every policy that this government has even managed to put forward is one that boosts union involvement, that gives a bit of a pat on the back to the union mates. Don't worry, guys, we've got you. We'll change industrial relations. We'll make sure we can get the bargaining across the industries to make sure life becomes better for you. Well, it's absolutely disgraceful. So it is time to remember that you're the government, that everything that you do has an impact on everyday Australians and how they're going to pay their bills for their family. And it's about time you man up, grow up, woman up, whatever you want to call it, because I don't know what we're all allowed to be nowadays, because we're too busy worried about, yeah, the Prime Minister's certainly too busy worried about the voice and crossing the Harbour Bridge at a Pride event. He's not doing any work on how he's going to make Australians' lives easier. I mean, Mr Albanese, before the election, told us we're going to have cheaper mortgages. I can absolutely tell you, since May last year, my mortgage is definitely not cheaper. In fact, I've had nothing but mortgage rate increases since then. It's a definitely not cheaper. Now, we did say that it wouldn't be easy under Albanese, and it's certainly getting harder for retirees. I don't know why you don't like retirees. I know you don't like self-managed ones, because they actually manage to work for themselves, to contribute to the Australian economy to provide most of the jobs that everyday Australians have are in small business. These are the backbone of our economy. But because they're not in a super fund with their union buddies, you're going to do anything you can to undermine them and destroy their retirement. Remember, we were going to have no franking credits. We weren't talking about that. We weren't changing that. That was something that the member for McMahon floated in the last election, the member for Maribyrnong, who holds dear ambitions to be the Prime Minister, may still do so may have to compete with Tanya, uh, member for my local member, member for Sydney, for that one. But remember, we're not touching frank franking credits. The Minister Bowen telling the electorate, if you don't like the policy, don't vote for us. So they didn't. So what did you do this time? You just didn't tell them. You just lied. Said, we're not going to touch franking credits. There'll be no changes to super. Not there'll be modest changes to super. There'll be no changes to super. Remember that there'll be no industry-wide bargaining. It's not part of our policy. Another lie. You know, we were going to do our bit, you guys. We're going to do our bit, you said, to assist real wage increases. What have we seen since you've come to government? Wages have continued to fall and, in fact, fall at faster rates. Remember the promise we're going to cut the cost of consultants and contractors? Yeah, that one didn't happen because they realised there's a few former chiefs of staff that now work with big advisory and consulting firms, so they all had to be looked after. These are just all broken promises. And you've been in nine months and you've managed to break almost every promise you made. And not only is it eroding the trust of the Australian electorate in the democracy and the political processes and everybody, it reflects badly on everybody when you blatantly lie in this manner. But the impacts of your decisions, the impacts of what you are doing is making a bad situation worse for every single family. Every single family. And if I hear once more that you were talking from the Labor government about boosting manufacturing, you, you, you talk out of both sides of your mouth. You want to boost manufacturing, but you want to safeguard me mechanism on industries that are the hardest to abate, because it would require some intellectual depth and some policy know-how to actually look at a broad range of industries and go, you know what? I saw a pharmaceutical company this week. They've made great strides in getting to net zero. They're actually going to be ahead of it. But they're an easier to abate industry than the cement industry. But they're going to kill off Australian jobs. They're going to kill off Australian manufacturing. Because if you look around this place, it's pretty full of cement, cements and everything we do. But the one company that might actually survive is the one who now sends its limestone over to China. So they have all the extra emissions from the transport of the limestone to China. They make the clinker in China, which is the most intensive emissions part of the cement process, where it's less regulated, less controls, less oversight. They then put the clinker back on a ship and bring it back to Australia, adding to the emissions again. But because those opposite have no understanding about transference of emissions, that 
They seem to think this is an Australian-only problem, that somehow Australia can somehow either fix the global emissions problem, global warming, climate change, can fix all of this by our own activities, our own willingness to cut off our nose to spite our face, to tie our arm behind our back, to absolutely kill our economy. But they do not understand emissions transference and what's happening and how the fact that these emissions that are now being created in China, probably more emissions, additional emissions from the transport, uh, that somehow companies, they don't, they're not going to meet the threshold to go to the safeguard mechanism anymore because their emissions are overseas. If the Greens are serious about this, start having a look at transference because this is what companies are going to do and they're going to start sending the jobs overseas. And they're going to go to countries that don't have regulations like we do. So not only are you going to have the increase in transport costs, you're also going to have emissions being created in much less technologically advanced ways. But again, this would require some understanding of policy development and intellectual depth to understand that. No one in the department could answer a question about a CBAM. No one. The safeguard mechanism is designed with an arbitrary number. If you're at 99, you're exempt. If you're at 101, you're in. It is an arbitrary number of the hardest to abate emitters that will destroy industry, that will destroy jobs, will destroy families, will destroy regions. I mean, maybe that's not, you know, maybe that's what you're going for, because the way you're going on your renewable energy targets and everything around that, we're not going to have the energy and the power resources to keep anything going. Rolling blackouts, that'll become the new norm in Australia. It's an absolute disgrace that somehow or other you are focused on taking this country so far backwards to destroying industries. We are a resource-rich nation. There is no excuse for this. We should be leading the way. But no, those opposite cannot get out of their own way. Maybe they're still a bit, I don't know, psychologically bruised from the 2019 campaign, so they're still sort of they're still rocking in the corner a little bit. I don't know. You know but pick yourself up, guys, and realise it's the decisions that you make that are going to impact Australian families and breaking the promises you made to them before the election. If they're all so great, if they're all so excellent and they're not coming into place after the next election, take them to the next election. Put them on the budget papers, show what the cost is going to be, explain it in detail whether or not an unrealised asset will have to be sold because the tax bill is so high. Take them to an election. Take them to the Australian electorate and say, Hey, we said no changes to franking credits, we said no changes to superannuation, but we're talking about modest ones now. On those franking credits, you can't pay a dividend if you're capital raising. Explain them to the Australian people, take them to the election, because you know what's going to happen, because they're bad policies, making bad situations for families, and you're attacking some of the people that have contributed the most to building up this country across the board and destroying families and their dreams for a better future. Senator Polly. Wow. <laughs> what was that? I mean, I've never heard anything so extraordinary, not even from this lot previously. And let's, you know, the fake crocodile tears that we've had all week in this place around superannuation and anyone who has three million plus dollars in their superannuation, they're going to go to the war for. They're going to fight for those people because. Yes, they have been successful, but they need the opposition to keep fighting day in, day out for them because they've got it so tough. Well, what about the majority of Australians who don't have $3 million plus in their superannuation? I'm all for people paying their fair share, but I do want to take the, uh, I was going to say good senator, but I'm probably exaggerating there, but the, the contribution that, uh, of the senator before us. You know, again, she's in here talking about poor, her poor performance when it comes to the Premier of Victoria, Dan Andrews. I can remember her crying from the rafters almost about how Mr Andrews was going to get voted out of parliament. His government was gone because he locked everyone up during COVID. That's a very good question, Senator. Very good question. He was re-elected with a bigger majority. Why? Why do we ask did he get re-elected? Because he did his job and he kept Victorians safe. On the other hand, 
the Prime Minister, what was his name? Um, Mr Morrison, Mr Scott Morrison, he was Prime Minister. He wasn't actually doing his job very well, but he thought, look, I can do more than being a hopeless, corrupt Prime Minister. I can also be a minister for everything. Senator so Polly, he took over. Senator Polly, I have a point of order on my left. Senator Scott. Of order, uh, ma uh, <laughs> Madam, I'm going to put you in. <laughs> really? uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, there was a, uh, a term which uh, Senator Polly used then in referring to a member of the lower house. And I think uh, I'm sure uh, now it's been brought to her attention uh, she will withdraw. Senator Polly, would you like to withdraw your comment? I'm happy to withdraw the comment, but I will keep talking about the former Prime Minister, who was in fact not satisfied with being able to demonstrate a complete lack of good management as a Prime Minister. He governed over a dysfunctional government. He was so concerned about his own ministers that, in fact, he decided that he should take on more responsibilities. Can I just have a point of? Can I just seek uh, clarification through you, Chair? I thought I had 15 minutes on the clock. We have a hard marker at 5:30. All right. Okay. Well, I better be quick then, because I want to get it back on the record of the stark contrast between the former prime minister, who was the leader of a dysfunctional, rorting. People may not like to accept that it was a corrupt government, but the reality is that's how it's going to be remembered. That's how it will be recorded in history. But I think we also have to just uh, put a few other things on the record. When the former senator was saying that we have no agenda, no agenda, and we've broken every election promise that we took to the election, which is quite honestly so untrue. It is the government of today that wants to actually invest $10 billion into a Australian Housing Future Fund. That fund will ensure that there is access to affordable housing in this country, which is so desperately needed. Needed for women and mothers with their children trying to leave and escape from domestic violence. We just don't talk about it. We've come into government and we're doing that. We've also legislated already for 10 days paid leave for people that have found themselves in those circumstances and need to flee. Because you can't leave a domestic violence situation without you have somewhere to go. So people can come into this chamber and champion, but the reality is you have to actually deliver. And that's what this government is doing. Now, we've highlighted over and over again the waste and mismanagement of the former government. But for nine years they had in government, and what did they do with it when it comes to energy policy? Well, they were very creative. They were, because they had 22 policies, 22 different policies in relation to energy. How many or what were actually implemented? Not one, not two, not ten, not even the 22, not even one. Not even one. There was zero. They did nothing. And so we have senators come in here and want to rewrite history and actually not tell the truth when it comes to what this government has already achieved. But I'd like to just run through just a few things to remind people about the reality of how bad that government, the opposition, were when they were in government. They were so bad at dealing with aged care and the aged care crisis in this country, they were that bad that they had to call a royal commission into their own failings. That's what they had to do. And we had the senator who again misled this chamber, and she repeatedly does to the Australian people, that we have a plan. We've already announced that we want to see 
nurses back into every residential aged care home in this country. Senator now, we Polly, know that that's not going to happen Senator overnight. Senator Polly, I'll just ask you not to reflect on members of this place, please. I'm sorry. I, what did, um, I'll ask you to withdraw. The, you, you said that the Senator lied to this place. I, I, I withdraw that. The reality is that senators come in here as the previous contribution that was made today accused us of not delivering on election commitment when it comes to aged care and nurses in residential homes. They were so bad, as I was saying, they were so bad after all the years that they've been in government. The crisis that was confronting us with the aged care, not only the quality of care, not only the abuse that was happening in the aged care residential homes, but the lack of recruitment and being able to retain staff because they were being paid some of the lowest wages in this country. Again, coincidentally, there happens to be predominantly women who work in aged care. Anyone who works in the caring uh, economy, we know that those opposite will not do anything to help them, just as they abandoned people who work in aged care and they abandoned the uh, senior citizens of this country. They have done exactly the same when it comes to uh, childcare and early education, failed over and over again. Well, what we see from this government, we've actually changed the way that we view aged care. We have put it, as the Prime Minister did during the election campaign, he made a commitment which he has already delivered on that. We've implemented and we are in the process of implementing all the recommendations out of the Royal Commission into aged care. We are leading the way in terms of restoring the confidence of the Australian people in their government, because after nine, almost ten years, the respect of the Australian people were no longer there, because they were sick and tired of having a government that was only interested in using the government benches to look after their mates. They were rotting and mismanaging the economy. They were not look after the people that they were supposed to be elected to represent. So we. We've implemented so many of the things that we want to do. And I heard the good senator again talking about manufacturing and making the allegation that we are not really interested in, in manufacturing. We were not in government when we saw company after company after company, industry after industry, leaving this country taking their goods and going offshore. And what have they done? Nothing. What did they do about skills? What did they do to keep people in TAFE so that we've got the skills of the future? We don't. They haven't done anything. All they did was rubbish TAFE. We're the ones that have invested the 180,000 places of free, free TAFE places to make sure that we have the skills of the future. This is what an adult government does. We show by leadership, and I will every single, the, every single day come into this place and put Mr Albanese's reputation up against P uh, Peter Dutton Senator or Scott Polly, Morrison any your time day. Has now expired. I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, President. I'm honoured to have spoken recently at the Australian Education Union Conference down in Melbourne, where I was able to hear from union delegates and teachers. As a state school teacher of 25 years, I've seen firsthand how the current system is failing our public school teachers and their students. I've seen firsthand the ever increasing pressures placed on teachers and the lack of funding to meet the challenges of more and more work with less and less time. While the government and coalition gleefully dish out a quarter of a trillion dollars in stage three tax cuts, largely to rich blokes, we force our public school teachers and students to fight over funding scraps. 
On average, public schools across Australia will be funded at only 87 per cent of the school resource standard this year. It's projected that, if we stay on the current trajectory until the end of the decade, private schools will be funded over 100 per cent of their SRS, while public schools won't even be funded to 91 per cent. When governments fail to reach this funding level, they fail the students of this country. Every Australian student deserves a world-class education and public money should be for public schools. The tight purse pockets of the government reverberates across the working conditions of teachers. On top of a workforce that's being overworked and ignored, pay and conditions continue to drop. The situation is particularly acute in New South Wales, with recent research from the University of Sydney showing teachers' pay continues to deteriorate significantly, with real earnings falling by 5.7 per cent between 2020 and 2022. While pay drops, conditions worsen. Teachers and classes are being crammed into more and more demandables that are overheating during the summer and freezing during the winter. Of course, teachers are fighting back. I'm proud to extend solidarity to AU members down in Tassie as they continue to fight tirelessly for the resourcing that they need for the Rock, from the Rockcliffe government. We've lost sight in this place of what public education actually means. It means no fees. It means an education accessible to all. It means that getting a note about having to buy a $50 school uniform or paying $200 for a school trip doesn't wreck your budget. It means that all kids, regardless of class, can receive a well-rounded education led by a supported and well-resourced workforce. Of course, not all schools are suffering. Australia has one of the most privatised education systems in the world. And it's a system that entrenches inequality and ensures generational disadvantage for millions of young people. Private schools funding across the forward estimates will now be $1.7 billion more than the Mount Scott Morrison or Prime, former Prime Minister Morrison committed in his final budget. That's $70 billion for private schools over the next four years, compared to only $45 billion for public schools. Despite the huge amount of money that governments provide to private schools, both in general funding and as capital works grants, the average independent school has raised their fees by 50 per cent over the last decade, and some of them have raised their fees by 80 per cent. Public school students and teachers have been waiting for over a decade for a fully funded education. Let's not make them wait any longer. Thank you, uh, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much, President. Uh, I rise to bring the House's attention to some statistics that should ring alarm bells among those opposite who have the power to act. And I'm joining the Australian Automobile Association in asking for urgent federal action on identifying the causes of bad crashes in light of shocking statistics that show high rates of death for regional drivers. The AAA report that drivers in regional Queensland are more than three times as likely to be killed behind the wheel than their metropolitan counterparts. But in New South Wales, regional drivers are nearly ten times more likely to die on the roads as city drivers. And in Western Australia, a shocking statistic, regional drivers are 20 times more likely to be killed while driving than metro drivers. Furthermore, for every 100 people killed in road crashes per month across Australia, 100 are hospitalised every day. As a resident of regional Australia, I am appalled at these statistics, which show metropolitan road deaths in Queensland in 2022 occurred at a rate of 3.05 per 100,000 people, while in regional areas it was 10.24 deaths per 100,000. In New South Wales, metro deaths were 1.62 per 100,000, while in the regions it is a staggering 9.32, and in Western Australia the metro death rate was 2.84 per 100,000 people and 18.7 in the regions. 
And in light of this information, you would think governments would instantly be able to identify the disparity between city and country road deaths, but this is not the case. The AAA reports that all Australian governments have committed to halving Australia's road toll through to 2030, yet deaths are currently increasing at 3.7 per cent per year and have increased in each of the past five years. The AAA is one of many road safety advocates calling for the Commonwealth to leverage funding it provides to the states to urgently facilitate the timely, consistent and open reporting of national road safety data. Specifically, the AAA's federal budget submission calls for all Commonwealth road funding to states to be made contingent on states and territories releasing data related to the safety assessment of road infrastructure. Casualty crash details, including crash type, location and conditions, vehicle details, road user details, including road user type, licence status and behavioural factors, as well as enforcement and compliance data. Now, in opposition, Labor called for this. So I ask, now that they are behind the wheel, so to speak, will they commit to this action? It is no good spending billions on roads if there is no way to calculate road conditions as a factor in road crashes. The RACQ's 2022 analysis in Queensland showed 17 regional roads, including seven in North Queensland, were considered high to medium risk of serious injury and death. The Bruce Highway as a whole received the most complaints from motorists, but particularly between Rockhampton and Innisfail with potholes, rough surfaces and limited overtaking lanes drawing the most criticism. When I see these figures, I have to ask why the Queensland Labor government has allowed its road maintenance program to fall behind by $6 billion behind schedule. The Palaszczuk government will throw billions of dollars at tunnels and bridges in Brisbane, it will find billions more to host the Olympics, and it will happily rip millions in speeding and other fines from motorists. But when it comes to ensuring that young people have, uh, that regional people have decent roads, the money just isn't forthcoming. Just this week, I have it on good authority that federal funding for the Flinders Highway between Huendon and Julia Creek is still waiting for matched funding from the Queensland Labor government. Now, anyone who's driven that road will tell you it's like a roller coaster ride, making it treacherous for all, but most especially the heavy vehicles taking cattle and minerals to Townsville and soon uh, equipment for the Copper String project. Roads in our regions must be upgraded and well maintained because, unlike the big cities, there is no other way to go if these roads have issues. Each year, towns in Cape York and the Gulf are cut off for weeks and sometimes months by flooded roads. And that means supplies have to be flown in at great expense because there is literally no way to drive anywhere. Add in substandard, uh, substandard roads and we can see why risks are higher. This is a critically important issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. I'm going to go to Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. Madam President, I rise in the chamber today to speak about the upcoming state election in New South Wales. And I'm proud, uh, as a Labor senator for New South Wales, to also be the Labor duty senator for Parks, Calair, Farrah, Riverina, Lyon and Hume. One of the greatest parts of my work is my travel to the rural and regional parts of our great state, which this past weekend took me to Dubbo, to Warren, Wellington and Kurrawatha Show, across three of my duty electorates. But I'm not the only person who spent this weekend working. I got paid, but the people who were standing for the election, they do it for absolutely nothing. And many Australians don't seem to understand that. Over this weekend and for the past few months, I've had the great privilege of meeting and doing my best to support, from a distance, candidates running for Labor in the upcoming state election in areas which overlap with my duty seats. While most people consider their ideal weekend to be spent relaxing and spending time with family or friends, these candidates have decided to devote themselves wholly to their communities, often travelling huge distances as rural New South Wales necessitates. I feel it's only right that I recognise them and their efforts in this place today. For people who um, aren't so clear, I just repeat, none of these citizens who are standing for election are putting themselves forward with any sense of recompense. They're doing it as a gift to our democracy. 
Josh Black, Labor's candidate for Dubbo, is a high school teacher and a counsellor in Dubbo. And I was privileged to join Josh on Saturday night and Sunday morning as he spent his weekend hosting politics in the pub and participating in Clean Up Australia Day with other volunteers. Michael Pilbrow, who spent his lifetime volunteering supporting his local community, is Labor's candidate in Goulburn. Last weekend, Michael met with local stakeholders. He held a stall at the Goulburn Show and travelled to Sydney for the official launch of the Labor for New South Wales campaign. Sally Quinnell, Labor's candidate for Camden, is a populous local school teacher. She spent her weekend out and about hosting street stalls, speaking to locals and consulting her community about what they want, they need, and to see from a, 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 a Minns Labor state government. Max Bulubasic is Labor's candidate for, the, for Murray, and he spent his weekend meeting locals and consulting with his team as he begins to get his campaign on the ground. Chris Darlitz, Labor's cam candidate for Cootamundra, lives in Narandra, but he spent his weekend travelling to the Kurawatha show to attend, attend the annual show and provide uh, service to local people. I was lucky enough to join him there and talk to locals about the issues which truly matter to their communities. Mark Vanstone is a community nurse and Labor's candidate for Mile Lakes. He was at the Blackhead Markets talking to members of the community. Karen Foley is a mother of three, a mediator and family counsellor, also Labor's candidate for Wagga Wagga. Karen spent her weekend at the Tumut Show talking to locals and ensuring that voices of all within her community were heard. Keith McMullen, a former high school teacher and our candidate for Port Macquarie, hosted a politics in the pub event and held a stall at the Sunrise Markets in his electorate. Heather Dunn, a remarkable young accountant and university student, is Labor's candidate in Orange. She spent last weekend running street stalls, talking to locals and engaging with federal MP Susan Templeman, talk, talking about the importance of arts and education. Robert, uh, Joshua Roberts Garnsey, Labor's candidate for Barwon, is a public school teacher in Narrabri. Josh spent his weekend travelling almost 500 kilometres between his home and Cobar and Broken Hill to host his campaign launch and consult with members of the community. He then travelled another 500 kilometres back home. Cameron Shaw, along with his wife and campaign manager, Kira, is the proud father of their six-month-old son, Ronan. He's also our candidate for Bathurst, and he spent the weekend travelling to Sydney to attend the official launch of Labor's New South Wales campaign. Marcus Rowland, Labor's candidate for Albury, is a local primary school teacher who was born and raised in the Albury community. He spent his weekend travelling through electorate to towns like Mulwala to make sure that he's consulting all the members of that vast and diverse electorate. And all of this was in addition to door knocking and letterboxing that also occupies these courageous candidates' free time. I'm extremely proud to support all candidates standing for Labor in the upcoming election. But as a former teacher and a university lecturer myself, I'm particularly proud that five of the 12 candidates running in these seats are current or former teachers. There will always be more work to be done, and we're continuing to strive to improve representation and participation of women, the First Nations Australians in politics, especially in the regions. Labor's strong, and it has an ever-growing presence thank in the you, region. Senator O'Neill, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Uh, good, thank you, um, President. I rise, rise today to talk about the extraordinary courage of the people of the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales. One year ago, they were hit by the most unimaginable challenge in the form of a major flooding that devastated large areas of their community and caused up to 10 deaths. Last week in Lismore, they came together to acknowledge what they had been through and what they still had to face. I was privileged to be invited there in my role as a special envoy for disaster recovery Others in this place were present too, the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt, and the former Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Mackenzie. Emergency management and disaster recovery must always be a bipartisan endeavour, so it was last Tuesday. It was a solemn day of affirmation and hope. Commemorations were held for the lives lost and the communities devastated in last year's floods. The commemoration of Lismore's Tinny Army was particularly moving. There were the Bodies who risked their own safety to rescue many of Lismore's residents from floodwaters. Amongst them were the Fijian migrant workers who gave their all in the disaster, cementing an enduring place in the community's history. 
During my visits to the Northern Rivers since the 2022 catastrophe, I have been struck by the strength of the communities and the optimism of who lost their homes, possessions and livelihoods. I thank all those who have shared their experience and welcomed me into their lives. Last week, I visited Cass and Julie at the home in Fingal Head near the Queensland border. Despite dealing with what they describe as a dog's breakfast after their home and business were substantially destroyed by the floods, Cass and Julie are overcoming challenge after challenge. Like many Australians affected by such events, they have faced a bureaucratic minefield trying to get timely assistance from insurance companies. Cass and Julie have often been at their wits' end dealing with their insurance claims and navigating multiple levels of government assistance and regulation. The Albanese government is working to unravel as many of these challenges as possible in conjunction with their state, our state counterparts. The recently announced review of Australia's disaster funding arrangements will be part of addressing this issue. As Cass told me, she said, I worked my butt off to get a home and I'm not going to give it up now. But they know that they are not alone. And Cass said, everyone is doing it tough, but the community is tougher. I met with the Tweed Residential Park Homeowners Association and park residents in Chindera, Sandy Gilbert, an advocate for these residents who said they feel they are the forgotten ones. Sandy's community are campaigning to ensure resident park residents are treated equally to other property owners. This includes being allowed to build back in a way that avoids a repeat of the catastrophe they endured. I heard from the representatives from Richmond Valley, Kyogle and Tweedshire councils about the challenges they are facing and their plans for the future. These plans include making resilience the cornerstone of any future infrastructure decisions. Now, I was pleased to discuss with them that the Albanese government's new Disaster Ready Fund had exactly that at its heart. While we can't stop all natural hazards, we can prepare and prevent the worst. In this regard, I was pleased to hear about the Living Lab's work in Lismore to support both the immediate recovery and the longer-term rebuilding of the region. The Albanese government is committed to strengthening Australia's disaster preparedness, response and recovery. This is why we created the National Emergency Management Agency and have rolled out the Disaster Ready Fund. I am pleased that this first tranche of projects funded un under our $150 million Rivers Resilience Initiative has been given the green light. $50 million worth of projects was announced last month and the remaining $100 million will be fully allocated within six months. All seven local government areas in the Northern Rivers region will benefit. We will continue to work with the Northern Rivers communities and all communities across the country to build resilience against natural hazards so they need not become humanitarian disasters. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday, the 20th of March at 10 a.m.